Midlife in Glimmerspell, Hot Flash Homicides, written by Addison Moore, narrated by Karen Krauss. One, two months earlier. I'm going to kill you. My voice echoes off the porch and sails down the street, where a small mob of neighbors has gathered to witness the spectacle. Considering the fact each one of them knows me to be mentally stable and of sound mind, I figure the audience can only aid in my insanity plea. Harold bucks as he claws away at my fingers, but my hands are securely wrapped around his neck. With the Herculean strength you read about typically utilized by people lifting cars off of their loved ones. Billy, he grunts as he gasps for air. Would you please stop? He manages to pluck my fingers loose and gulp a few breaths down, but I prove tenacious and wrap my hands right back where they belong, ten times tighter than before. I would have stopped if you would have stopped, I thunder. The day had started out so innocently. I dropped Harper off at school, then headed to the lake for a quick yet brisk walk around the groomed trail encompassing it, despite the fact it's the dead of winter. And to think, I walked in the damn snow to get a better body to impress this guy? Not that he was the sole reason for my sudden desire to lose a full twenty pounds. My ill-fitting jeans took first place in that department. But Harold is my husband, was my husband, up until five hot minutes ago. And aside from the fact my feelings have done an abrupt about face, I generally liked to look nice for him. Turns out, I decided freezing my lady parts off while waddling around Mulberry Lake wasn't the way I wanted to get rid of those pesky, yet impossible to lose twenty big ones. It's early January, a wonderful freaking start to a brand new crappy year, and the snow is piled up in every direction in our dismal corner of Maine. Just because I see a small army of insane people jogging around the lake each day, uphill both ways, in the snow, doesn't mean I needed to be one of them. But in a way, I'm glad I chose to take leave of my good senses and attempt the effort this morning. The more out of character, out of my mind, I behave, it's sure to reduce the prison time I'll be given come sentencing day. We've been married for 19 years, I howl. We have a 16-year-old daughter, I scream. I eschewed a perfectly good surname and made myself a boob for you. And how I hate that you've turned me into a boob in so many, many ways. It's true. The part about the ridiculous surname I've endured because of him for the better part of my life. Billy Boob, spelled B-O-O-B-E, -O -O has been my formal moniker for almost two decades. And not once has anyone been able to say that last name correctly or more to the point, with a straight face. According to Harold's family, their indelicate, yet oddly a source of pride, surname is pronounced Boube, something that sounds European in nature, ritzy even. But not a soul, no matter how literate, no matter how wrinkled their gray matter, no matter how many degrees they have stacked behind their name, None of the above have ever managed to stick the verbal landing. In fact, people just titter all that much more when I try to correct them. They read it like they see it. Boob. And once in a while, they'll even pronounce it the all-impressive booby. It doesn't get much better than that. Honestly, I'm not sure which is worse. Believe me, I knew what I was getting into when I signed up for it but I was young, dumb, and in love with a genuine boob. I hate you, I bellow as I give him another good shake, and his primal apex rocks back and forth as if Harry had suddenly morphed into a bobblehead doll. Enough. He pulls back and catches my hands at the wrist. 
arresting my ability to properly cut off his oxygen supply and thus smother his minuscule brain cells. Although one could argue his brain hasn't had a gulp of air in years. And after what I just witnessed, Harold Boob is brain dead indeed. I'm sorry, Billy, he pants as I pluck my hands loose. You shouldn't have seen that. His face is red as a beet, and his dirty blonde hair is greasy and must, mostly because he just rolled out of our bed with a woman who was not me. You shouldn't have seen that, I riot back, with a finger pointed within an inch of his face. From my peripheral vision, I note the crowd gathered across the street, and it seems to be comprised of the entire who's who of Mulberry Lake. Not a soul is missing. The entire gossip brigade has turned out in full force. Perfect. Just how I wanted to start my day. A burnt piece of avocado toast, followed by freezing my toes off at the lake, only to round out this craptastic morning by finding my husband in bed with his third cousin. How dare you sleep with another woman under our roof? In our bed, I thunder, loud enough to invoke a satisfying gasp from the women in the peanut gallery. You're the one that bought me that stupid DNA test. He thunders right back, and I gag on the river of words begging to stream from me. You said, take the test, Harold. He mocks me with his tone while his hands flail as if to enunciate my ineptness. We'll see if you're a Viking. You never know. You could be British royalty. A hard groan comes from me. Don't try to point the finger my way. You're no Viking, Harold, and you're sure as hell not British royalty. You're 100% idiot. You're a Neanderthal with only a half-formed brain. I knew the second that little hussy wanted to meet up with you for coffee, she was up to no good. I say coffee with air quotes because, honest to God, that seemingly innocent morning beverage actually sent up a red flag for me at the time. I told you not to go. It's true. A hot blonde third cousin who happened to be attending a local university found Harry on her DNA ancestral journey app and was, like, totally excited to meet him. I bet she was. Harold isn't bad looking. He's a six foot bear of a man. If that bear were 100 pounds overweight, balding, and happened to hail from Chernobyl, I'm sure there are a few atrophied muscles under that paunch. His face is meh. The only thing women have seen in him over the years is that whole man in power thing. He and his family own Harry's Hardware, right here in town. His mother and sisters are more or less silent partners in the deal. They went into the venture just a few years before Harold and I met, and I think because of that, I've never felt the hardware store was truly mine. I'm responsible for the accounting, the ordering, and getting verbally backhanded by customers while I try my best to offer up some service with a smile. The rest of his family? They sit back and collect a check at the end of the month. It's easy to see why I've always felt more grunt worker, less owner in this scenario. It's a wonder I spent four years, okay, five, if you want to get technical, at Dexter University to get a degree in communications. I'd like to think my degree has come in handy, but let's call an educational spade a spade. I could have pocketed my parents' money and lived a nice life in Hawaii for the aforementioned amount of trouble. Harold blows out an aggressive breath as he does a double take across the street. Jeez, let's get inside, Billy. The neighbors are watching. I'm not dressed and I'm freezing to death. I scoff at the thought as I glance down at his pale limbs. He managed to jump into his boxers after I alerted him of my presence by way of screaming my bloody head off. And once I ran out of the room, he followed me right onto the front porch. It's not my fault you're freezing to death, I hiss. 
You might prefer succumbing to the elements compared to what I have planned for you. I'll give you a hint. There's a scalpel involved, and you will never have to worry about erectile dysfunction again. Not that he had to worry about it a few minutes ago, or ever, but the visual was too good to pass up. And according to the snickering I hear, the peanut gallery approves of my depraved methods as well. He cringes a moment. Come on, Billy, enough is enough. We're adults. Let's get in the living room. His teeth chatter as he says it, and my chest thumps with a dry laugh. I don't think we should go inside, I snip. I think we should give the fine people of Mulberry Lake a glimpse of what they came for. The truth. I turn to the crowd. Harold has had an affair, I shout, and about three of my elderly neighbors stagger on their feet. A poodle named Pepper that lives down the street starts in on a barking spree. And by the way she's bearing those fangs, I'm pretty sure she's taken my side in the situation. Our sleepy cul-de-sac was blanketed in another layer of fresh snow last night. It looked so sweet and idyllic, I was stupid enough to tell my poor sweet daughter Harper that we lived in a fairy tale as I drove her to school. And now when I pick her up, I'll have to tell her we were living in her father's perverted porno after all. I turn back to the boob in question. I thought you loved me, Harold. I choke on the words. I mean, I knew your mother hated me, and a few of your sisters, but I thought you genuinely cared for me. Okay, so that's not entirely true. Harold has pretty much been a jerk all along, but I've long since chosen to overlook it. Nonetheless, that little proclamation makes him look bad, and I hope it makes him feel bad, too. Because from here on out, while I have breath in my lungs, whatever makes Harold feel bad makes me feel really, really good. But you know what, Harold? I think your mother hates you, too. Harry Boob? Really? What kind of a competent mother names her child Harry Boob? It's Harold. His voice hikes to match mine. He leans in with a menacing look on his face, the veins in his neck dancing like garden snakes. Nobody calls me Harry and you know it. Then why on earth did you name your business Harry's Hardware? Fran from across the street nods as if I had a point. And I do. Billy, Harold grunts as he swings us into the house in one quick move and shuts the door behind us. You and I both know Harry's hardware sounds better than Harold's hardware. And why the hell are we talking about that anyway? He rakes his fingers through what's left of his hair, which isn't much. Think halo and bad comb over. There's something I have to tell you. Oh, no, you don't. I hold up a finger. You do not get to leave me. I'm leaving you. There, I said it first. Let the record show I was not dumped by my dumb jackass of a husband who invited a flighty, vapid airhead into our home to spend the weekend when she has a perfectly good university in the next town over, where I'm sure the entire football team would have offered her a bed. In fact, I'm sure they already have. Don't tell me she fooled you with that hair-twirling routine. I was there the day you gave her a tour of the hardware store, and her eyes were spinning like a couple of slot machines. She sees you as nothing more than a potential sugar daddy, the first of many, I suspect. You're nothing but a trophy wife internship for her. Did you say daddy? The blonde bimbo herself comes down the stairs with bare legs and bare arms as she cinches the sash on my pink silk robe. I suck in a sharp breath at the abomination. My goodness, she didn't even have the decency to get dressed and jump out of the window. I don't care if it is a two-story fall. Either that was going to break her neck, or I was. And it looks as if it's up to me to do the dirty work. I can't believe you told her. Charlene Plowman bats her fake furry lashes our way. Her petite frame, 
her obnoxious level of dewy youth, that model-perfect face and big blue eyes have already danced on my very last nerve. I'm thinking a double homicide is a nice way to round out the day. If I'm headed to prison, I may as well go big. He didn't have to tell me. I saw it all with my own two eyes. I growl her way, but the baby fawn continues to trek her way across my living room, right into the hands of the beast I'm about to morph into. A killer beast, hungry to rip apart her flesh. Harry, she gives him a playful swat to the arm and giggles. I thought we were going to wait to tell Harper first. She blinks my way. No offense, Billy, but we didn't know how you'd take it. She grimaces. Harry says you can be a little unstable. I slice a glance that promises a painful death his way. Go on, I tell her, and Harold lets out a sickly moan, as if he didn't like what was about to come next. But after witnessing what I did, I have a feeling a confession to a much longer preferred dalliance is about to take place. It was a little over two months ago that Harold's DNA results came back. I had bought the test kit for his birthday back in October. By the time he spit into the tube and received his results, it was November. By Thanksgiving, Charlene here, ditzy third cousin extraordinaire, had firmly wormed her way into our lives. She's a sophomore at Dexter University over in Winchester County and was happy to find out she had family in this part of Maine. Her own clueless clan hails from Florida. She said she hates the weather here and apparently was looking for someone to bring the heat. Come to find out, my moron of a husband was happy to comply. There will be heat, all right when I roast him on a spit and take him for all he's worth. Charlene thrusts her left hand my way, and I spot my old engagement ring quivering like a hostage on her svelte finger. My jaw roots to the floor. What in the fresh hell? I take a daring step forward, and Harold is quick to form a barrier between the dits and me by way of his furry arm. That's my ring, I bellow. Now, just a second, Billy, he says in that tone he's invoked for years as a means to reprimand me. It's not like you ever wore it again after we were married, and technically it belonged to my grandmother first. I'm all about upcycling, Charlene gives a frantic nod. It's like really good for the environment. Anyway, he proposed last night. And of course I said yes. And now I guess we have a wedding to plan. Last night? My voice hikes to unsafe levels again as I look to the dingbat proudly wearing my ring, my robe, and let's face it, most likely my husband's bodily fluids. But I made you beef stroganoff from scratch. Harold and I watched that silly rom-com with you until midnight. She rolls her eyes. And believe me, we never thought you'd go to bed. But once you left, Harry didn't waste any time. He dropped to one knee, and I said yes. She waves me off. And don't think we didn't appreciate the stroganoff. It was so totally romantic, what with the candles on the table and everything. She presses a hand to her chest, as if reliving the romance and I'm suddenly moved to strangle everyone in the room, including myself. I guess we'll tell Harper the news once she gets home from school. No need in keeping it a secret, especially since she's about to be a big sister. A big what? My voice echoes around the room like a hurricane about to blow the roof off. That's right. Charlene wraps her arms around Harold's naked flesh. We weren't even trying. Can you believe it? I guess I must be super fertile. Super fertile. I shoot Harold a look. It took us three years to have Harper, and not a single baby soul followed suit. 
I was at war with my ovaries, my uterus, doing everything humanly possible to give Harper a sibling, and here Charlene jumps into bed with my husband and makes it a reality. How dare she? How dare he? How I hate these two idiots in front of me right now, and to think they've had the nerve to procreate. You need to go. I grit the words from my teeth. Both of you, you're not safe here. The Grim Reaper is peering through the window, and he's about to do what he does best, slaughter on sight. Oh, my God, Charlene wails as she does a little tap dance. Is there a killer on the loose? There's a killer on the loose, all right. I bite the air between us, and that killer is me. Now put your own damn clothes on and get the hell out of my house. She zips up the stairs before I can rip my robe right off her body. I would have done it, too, but I'm not in the mood for her thin, perky body to mock me. And you. I dig my finger into this virtual stranger's greasy chest. You have five minutes to collect all of your worldly belongings. I'm having the locks changed in an hour, and then I'm spending the rest of the afternoon retaining a top-notch divorce attorney. I'm putting the house up for sale and taking half of that stupid hardware store because it's mine. You can't take the store. That belongs to my family. The veins in his neck jump once again as if he means it. I was your family, you moron. There's not a judge in the land who won't agree with me on that one. His eyes bug out, and I can see the financial fear taking over. That's right, Harold, I seethe. Be afraid, because I'm about to make your life a living hell. You'll regret the day you ever laid eyes on that hussy, and I'll make sure you'll regret the day you laid eyes on me, too. And don't think for a minute I'm not trading your ridiculous last name for my old one. I spot Charlene poking her head our way from the landing and sniff. And if you were wise, you'd keep your last name, too, I howl at her. Although Plowman isn't all that much of an improvement. Actually, it's kind of prophetic when you think about it. But the two of you don't think, do you? Now go on, get... I stomp my foot in Harold's direction, and Charlene scuttles off once again, but my obnoxious idiot of a soon-to-be ex doesn't budge an inch. You won't have enough money to buy another place, he says. We're not selling the house. You and Harper will continue to live here. After you've defiled it, there isn't enough holy water or sage to cleanse this house of the sins you've committed. A fire couldn't cure the diseases you've bestowed upon it, You'll be homeless if you leave, he barks back. You're going to work at the hardware store and keep the house. I've already thought this through. Oh, I balk. I'll sleep in the bed you shared with little Miss Slut, and I'll work at the hardware store while she walks around like she owns the place, while her belly grows as big as yours? No, thank you. You're 45, Billy. You've never held down a real job and have no skills to offer the world. You can keep your position at the hardware store. You're going to need it. You'll thank me for it later. I suck in a sharp breath. I'm pretty sure I won't thank you for anything later. And maybe I have no skills to offer the world because I foolishly gave them all to you. Newsflash, Harold, I'm not keeping the house or the job. I'm starting over. Harper and I are moving out of Mulberry Lake as soon as possible. And where do you think you're going? His chest bucks as if I were spouting a pipe dream. And maybe I am. Look, I'm sorry it went down like this, Billy. His eyes soften as he looks my way. And for a fleeting moment, I feel a pang of grief for what we once were. But you said you weren't coming back until noon. We thought we had more time. So this is my fault? Get out, I riot as I slap him silly across the chest. You're not going anywhere, he doubles down on his lunacy. You can't make it in this world without me, Billy. You're staying in this house and you're working for me. He takes off upstairs while I head down the hall for the bathroom, lock myself inside, and sob for an hour straight. Harold is right. 
I have no marketable skills. I'll be jobless and homeless. My sweet nieces come to mind. And then it hits me. I won't be homeless at all. I know exactly where I'll go. Harper and I are moving to Glimmerspell. Two, March. In the span of almost two months, I've broken three vases, all of which suffered a noble demise as I attempted to throw them at Harold's ridiculously tiny pinhead. But seeing that he does, in fact, have the aforementioned pinhead, none of them actually reached their intended target. The house is still on the market, a sluggish market, according to our realtor a hot twenty-something that Harold had the nerve to ogle when we met to sign the paperwork. Clearly, there are no boundaries to the level in which he will stoop to cheat on me. Although I no longer consider his brazen, yet foolish, and might I add, lewd actions cheating, because Harold Boob and I have already divorced in my mind and heart, where it truly counts. But the real deal still needs a few pokes and prods, and an exorbitant exchange of some serious cash to our individual attorneys before we're officially torn asunder. I glance down at the center console, at one of the ten lists I've made for the day, and nod at number five. Move to Glimmerspell. I have to write everything down these days, or I risk forgetting all about my many errant trains of thought. Just last week, I put an orange into the toaster oven, the mail in the fridge, and stepped out of the shower only to find the water running two hours later. It's safe to say I might need more than a list to keep me on track. I might need a bona fide handler. Or a straitjacket. Both, maybe. Morgan, my one and only living niece, says I have a serious case of brain fog, which could be attributed to both the trauma in my life and the fact I'm perimenopausal. I blame both of those malfunctions on Harold because I've decided that from here on out, he'll be the scapegoat for all my future problems. It brings me a level of comfort to know any and everything that goes awry from now on will somehow be his fault. Regardless, our attorneys will be conferring shortly, followed by a formal meeting with the judge, and that's when the magic happens. The big D. The bonfire of the marital vanities, the apex of my time spent with Harold Boob, will finally come to a crashing conclusion. Our marriage license dropped into a vat of legal acid and dissolved for all to see, boiling alive to a certain death in the bubbling cauldron of my heart. The runaway train has left the station. Destination Splitsville, and Harper and I are moving onward and forward in our new lives. She took the news of the divorce as well as any 16-year-old could, a little crying, a little cussing, and a hell of a lot of self-righteous anger toward her boob of a father. Okay, Harper, I blow out of breath as I look at my beautiful daughter while gripping the steering wheel. Glimmer spell, here we come. It's as if all of Maine transforms into a magical land from some far-off fairy tale as we fast approach the covered bridge that leads into that fabled town. The bridge has a rustic covered wooden roof with a heaping pile of snow over it. The river that runs beneath it is frozen solid for the most part, but still manages to glisten even in this dull light. Glimmer Spell is infamous for its lackluster days and its seemingly eternal nights. The snow has a tendency to stick right through August some years, and starts up again as early as September. It's essentially a winter wonderland all year long. The storm clouds always seem to linger up above, and the sun is just a rumor in this part of the world. It's the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday, and the skies are purple and bruised, as another storm gets ready to dump more of that fluffy white stuff our way. And everywhere you look, the evergreens, the tiny cottage-like houses, the woods, and the riverbanks are all blanketed with a fresh dusting of powder. 
A large wooden sign sitting next to the covered bridge reads, Welcome to Glimmerspell, where there's a bit of magic just around every corner. And here we go, I say, as we tread slowly inside, and my tires hum and vibrate as the covered bridge steals the light. Hunk the horn, ma'am. It's good luck. Harper bounces in her seat while clutching her favorite stuffed animal, a purple bear that smells like berries and aptly named Barry. She might be 16 on the outside, but she's still all of six where it counts. Although Barry is a secret best kept between the two of us, lest I lose my life over it, per her incessant threats. I do as I'm told, and we laugh and honk our way through the bridge until we come out on the other side, and I pull over for a moment as we both exhale a collective sigh. Wow, she moans as she struggles to take in all the magic before us at once. It never gets old, I say, as we take a moment to soak in the beauty of this enchanting little town. Glimmerspell is set in mountainous terrain at an elevation higher than Mulberry Lake, but not by much. The neighboring towns are still easily accessible within twenty minutes, but Glimmerspell is by far the most secluded, some might say secretive, town in all of Maine. Maybe even the entire eastern seaboard. I love it, Harper shakes her head. It was totally worth tanking eleven years' worth of friendships and an almost boyfriend, she shrugs as she stares out the window. And in a weird way, I think I mean it. Harper is a head taller than me. We share the same dark hair, mine touching down at the shoulders and hers touching down just shy of her tush. She has dainty features, high full cheeks, bow tie lips, and we share the same lavender blue eyes. They're a common trait of the Buttonwood women. And as of yesterday, we are officially just that. To new beginnings. I say, just two buttonwood women looking to start all over again. Here's to being smart, sensible, and sassy together. And to swearing off romance forever, at least for me. I don't need men anymore. It's time to figure out who I am, who I'm going to be, who I've been all along. And here's to becoming vampires. She takes a sip of the latte we picked up on the way over and winks my way. Harper is as sassy and sarcastic as they come, as evidenced by the fact she threatens me with teen pregnancy every now and again. But she just likes to get me good and rattled, and those very threats are to blame for what Harper has dubbed the tinsel sprouting out of my head. It's safe to say she's well-rounded when it comes to keeping me on my proverbial toes. Ixnay on that whole vampire thing. I say as we turn back onto the road and head for Main Street. And if any boy promises you immortality by way of taking a bite out of your body, I officially give you permission to drive a stake through his heart. I wrinkle my nose at the windshield. On second thought, ixnay to taking a stake to the pervert's heart, too. You're not allowed to go to prison. You're one of my favorite people, and I'd like to keep you around. Don't worry, Mom. If anyone goes to prison, it'll be you. I'm shocked you're not already serving hard time in the pokey. I would have driven a stake through both of their tiny, wicked hearts. I plan on giving you know who the cold shoulder for the rest of my life, just the way you are. You know who would be Harold the Boob. And I never suggested she give him the cold shoulder. Harper came up with that butte all on her own although I've been known to ice him out a time or two in the past. Harper was obviously paying attention to how I reacted to things back then, and I'm guessing she's doing the very same thing now. To be honest, Harper is exactly why Harold and Charlene still have breath in their lungs. If I killed Harold, the odds of Harper killing her own cheating husband one day would go up magnificently. And as much as I love spending time with her, I'd hate to have her as a cellmate. It's sort of counterintuitive to that whole launching her into the world as a functioning member of society thing. And because of that, all of our mother-daughter homicidal dreams will have to go up on the shelf for now. Yeah, well, I shrug her away. 
I'm not giving him the cold shoulder, so you're out of luck. You can't use me as an excuse. I may not be too thrilled with what happened, but no matter how big a pile of manure that man steps in, it doesn't take away the fact he's your dad. Legally, you're still his charge. Just give it some time to get over the pain and anger, and soon you'll be playing basketball with him out on the driveway again. We don't have a driveway. Or at least we won't soon. And besides, Dad and I have never done that, and you know it. Don't worry about my relationship with him. I'm almost 18, and soon I'll legally be able to cut whoever I want out of my life. Her lips twitch with a smile. If I were you, I'd be on my best behavior, because you might be next. Thanks for the warning, I say as we hit Main Street, with all of its adorable old-world-inspired shops, and my heart warms just looking at them. The townies and the tourists alike are well bundled as they waddle up and down the cozy street in clusters, bustling to and fro while clutching their purchases. Harper was immediately on board with the idea of moving to Glimmerspell. I've always had a soft spot for this magical town, but I'm ashamed to admit we haven't been out this way in so long. My nieces, Mabel and Morgan, had always driven to Mulberry Lake for holidays and visits. My brother Daryl and his first wife, Millie, initially moved from Mulberry Lake to Glimmerspell about 25 years ago when their twin daughters were just two. Millie passed away when the twins were eight, I think, and then eventually Daryl went on to remarry. Unfortunately, Daryl and his second wife, Leanne, passed away a little over a year ago. They lost their brakes, and their car tumbled down a mountainside. And the tragedies don't end there. A chill rides through me as I think of my poor nieces. My sweet niece, Mabel, was murdered just last month out in Cider Cove, a small town right here in coastal Maine. The person responsible has already been arrested and is awaiting trial. As soon as I heard of the tragedy, I wanted to come out to Glimmerspell, but Morgan said not to, that she was still in Cider Cove taking care of things. After the suspect was caught, Morgan came out to Mulberry Lake, and we had a service for Mabel at my church upon my insistence. Since Morgan's parents passed, my mother and I had tried our best to be there for the girls. My father passed away nearly a decade ago, so there was just my mother, my sister, and me who could be there for them. Their mother's family had scattered across the country and lost all touch with the girls when they were young. But I've always made myself available to my nieces. At the time of Mabel's murder, my mother was at a technology-free resort in Hawaii, but I moved heaven, earth, and a few primitive communication methods to get her to come back for the service. I didn't have the heart to tell her of my impending divorce, but Harper did, and my mother was officially the first to say, I told you so. It's safe to say she's never been a fan of Harold's. Harper leans hard as she inspects the businesses that line the street. It's been almost three years since I've been to Glimmerspell, and almost twice that long for Harper. But now that I see how charming it is, it's clear I've deprived us both of a little magic our dull lives could have used. Would you look at that restaurant? Harper's voice hikes with enthusiasm. Rex's Steakhouse? Mom, they spelled steak, as in the weapon you just suggested I use on my future vampire boyfriend. This is like for real. She leans in to better ogle the establishment. Good to the last bite, blood bank bar inside. She belts out a laugh. You have got to be kidding me. They're not kidding, I say. From what I remember, this whole vampire thing is nothing more than a tourist trap. Poor Glimmerspell is all by its lonesome out here. The locals needed to find some way to drum up a little business. Wolfgang's Bistro, she reads as she looks to the establishment directly across the street. Both restaurants have an old-world feel to them, as does all of Main Street, with its cobblestone sidewalks and stone-covered buildings. Not a fly-by-night joint, she laughs at the tagline. 
That was a total dig at the vampires. I guess the vampires and the werewolves don't get along. Harper, don't fall for boys who claim to be part wolf either. They're going to see you as fresh meat and tell you anything you want to hear. It's all rumors and piecemealed lore to haul the walking wallets in by the busload. Mom, I read up on this town, and it's more than lore. Did you know it's a hot spot for paranormal enthusiasts? And that they hold conventions at the community center here every year? She sucks in a quick breath as she points to a stone-covered establishment with large blue metal butterflies attached to it every which way. Fake gardens! Mom, it's too cute! I vote we eat dinner there first. You're right, it is too cute. But I'm betting it's expensive, too. We need to mind our nickels and dimes until I can clear a few paychecks first. Lucky for me, Morgan happens to own and run the town's only bookstore, the Haunted Book Barn, right here at the end of Main Street, and she immediately offered me a position. She also let me know Harper and I were welcome to stay at her condo until I could secure a rental. I would have done it sooner, but there was so much madness happening at once, there was no time to drive out here to see what was available. Harold helped put all of our furniture in storage until I need it. And since we don't need it just yet, Harper and I have decided to start our new life with just a few suitcases each, until we can settle down in a place of our own. And there it is, Harper says, breathless, as we spot the bright red barn in the distance. The haunted book barn. And don't think I'm not ghost hunting for the rest of the afternoon. I like ghosts as much as I do reading. Good, I say. That means I might actually see your face a little more now that we're in Glimmerspell. Harper was notorious for hanging out at school with her friends, with her scholastic clubs, until all hours while we were in Mulberry. A part of me is afraid she'll go into social withdrawals. Please, she says, relaxing back in her seat. This is a one-horse town, Mom. Face it, you're going to get sick of me by the end of the week. Fat chance, kiddo. I'd need at least two weeks, I say, winking her way. We both know it'll never happen. I'm pretty much a barnacle stuck to the bottom of her boat, and she'd have better luck being bitten by a vampire than me ditching her under any circumstances. I can live a lifetime without Harold, but I couldn't last a nanosecond without Harper. A long private road, laden with snow leads the way to the oversized crimson barn with its white crisscross accents that give it a homey feel. There's a parking lot to the right, strewn with cars, and to the left there's a view of Glimmerspell Lake in the distance. The barn is a one-story wonder that used to be a part of a working dairy farm my grandfather once owned, and after he passed away my father let it sit and rot until my brother Daryl, God rest his soul, and his first wife, Millie, decided to turn it into a bookstore. It was Millie's love of books that inspired it. We park and hustle our way in through the double red doors, and as soon as we step inside, we're met with the sweet scent of paperbacks, of hardbacks, of all things literary. And just beneath that, the scent of freshly brewed coffee competes for our attention, and believe me, it has it. I inhale the intoxicating cocktail as I look around in wonder. Cheery 80s music strums from the speakers and mingles with the din of voices as the place hums with the sounds from the burgeoning crowd inside, at least 100 deep. Mom, look! Harper smacks me on the arm as she points to a rather ornate gilded mirror hanging to our left in the entry. Just above it are the words, Vampire checker, take a peek. Do you see your reflection, or are you a vampire? And both Harper and I have a good laugh as we wave to ourselves. In front of that sits a large sign on a brass pole that reads, Welcome to the Haunted Book Barn. Show your receipt at the cafe for a 10% discount. Murder, Mayhem, and Baking tapes every Saturday at 2. This is so freaking cool! Harper jumps a little as she says it, and soon she dissolves into the crowd. 
Surprisingly, there are more than enough bodies in here to make up a decent mob. It's mostly young people. The smattering of Dexter's sweatshirts lets me know which university the masses belong to, and just the sight of their youthful faces depresses me a little. Since when did college kids start looking as if they belonged in junior high? It feels as if I was a Dexter student myself just a handful of years ago, and I swear while I was there, nobody looked like they were just out of diapers. Each one of these baby-faced college kids is bopping about, chattering away while combing through the endless display tables laden with books. A trio of co-eds bumps past me, and I veer to the left to avoid a collision, ending up near the first of many rows of bookshelves. To my left, a couple stands about six feet away, whispering something to one another in a fury, and I can tell by their body language things are getting tense. The man is about my age, tall, wavy, dirty blonde hair slicked back, nice suit on, and the redhead is one of those newfangled college tweens with a tight Dexter sweatshirt to call her own and a miniskirt on, despite the Arctic temperatures hitting us outside. I'm not proud to say I've braved the elements a time or two in the name of fashion back in the day. I once had numb toes for a week, just because I had a cute pair of Hirachi sandals I wanted to show off in junior high. Not my finest moment, but on the upside, my toes lived to tell about it. The couple grows increasingly animated, with his wild gesticulating and her angry huffs. I'm not sure why, but I'm getting some serious Harold and Charlene vibes from the two of them, so I take a moment to glower their way. The woman pulls the man in by the tie and goes for a kiss, and I blink back at the brazen show of affection. Maybe I'm a prude, but I wouldn't have guessed a bookstore to be the hot spot to proposition a man old enough to be her professor, and I'm betting that's exactly who he is. He leans her way as his eyes enlarge, and he seems to be saying something to her rather sternly. How do you like that? A blatant rejection? An act that was clearly beneath Harold. Just think, given the right set of circumstances, that poor girl could have found herself in my bed with my husband. The redhead pulls the man in one more time, and now I can clearly see that she's pleading with him about something. The entire display makes my heart wrench, and I want to run over and tell her he's not worth it. No woman should ever have to beg a man to stay with her, or in her case, maybe finish her research paper. I take off deeper into the bookstore, glance past the bodies milling around, and soak in the establishment, with its cute twinkle lights set up over the walls and its rustic old metal chandeliers that string along the ceiling, giving this place just the right amount of ambient lighting. I wouldn't call it dim, but it's definitely not bright. The bookstore has an all-around rustic appeal, with its dark wood floors and a wooden reception counter outfitted with three registers to choose from. Sitting in front of the registers is the endless display of book tables that boast of new releases, vampires, werewolves, fae, cookbooks, true crime, thrillers, cozy mysteries, and an entire slew of other signs I can't read without my glasses. Just beyond the tables are rows and rows of bookshelves as far as the eye can see, leading all the way to the back. And last, but never least, the cafe sits to the right in all its rustic glory. The wall behind it is made of distressed blue and gray shiplap, running in long skinny strips, with a backlit menu that boasts of all of its offerings, there's a working kitchen with a stainless counter and refrigerated shelves showing off rows of cookies, muffins, cakes, and a few panini sandwiches as far as I can tell. About a dozen or so dark wrought iron bistro tables sit across the span of twenty feet, and there's a pony wall surrounding one side of the cafe, with greenery set along the edge to section off the area from the rest of the bookstore. This place is huge. A warehouse would be envious of its size, and yet somehow between the books, the cafe, and the luscious scent of coffee, 
it manages to feel as cozy as can be. An entire beehive of men and women with black sweatshirts that read, Film Crew, hustle this way and that, while getting their equipment ready for the true crime show my niece films here weekly. Yes, a show about murder. True crime was something just shy of a hobby for Morgan growing up. But about two years ago, she started filming Murder, Mayhem, and Baking right here in the cafe, where she spends an hour talking about whatever homicide case strikes her fancy while whipping up a sweet treat for her audience. Of course, she gives the recipe away as a bonus to her viewers at the end. She's not a monster. That would be Harold's department. I head over to the cafe because somewhere in that melee is my spicy little niece, Morgan is not only fantastically feisty and sarcastic, but she doesn't take bull from anyone, and those wonderful attributes had more than a little to do with why Mabel was killed. The poison that did her in was actually meant for Morgan instead. It was awful and tragic, and I'm still so very angry that it happened at all. How I hate the fact my niece is gone. Mabel was the innocent flower, to Morgan's wild child. Twin sisters who were as opposite as can be. Mabel was the goody two-shoes librarian type, and Morgan was essentially born with a party horn in her mouth. They decided to play the twin switcheroo that faded day, and it ended up costing Mabel her life. I try to push all of the death and horror that day brought out of my mind for a moment, it's dragged me to a dark place more than once, and I want to put on a happy face when I finally see my niece. Even though Morgan is young enough to be my daughter, with a 19-year age gap between us, I've always felt more of a sisterly bond between us, just the way I did with Mabel. To my left, I spot a black cat sitting lazily on the counter, and my heart melts at the sight of her. I'm not only a sucker for a good book, but I'm a sucker for a furry feline, too. A woman working one of the registers casts a scathing glance my way, and I do a double take in her direction. She has long chestnut-colored hair with matching glowing eyes, and she's practically glaring at me as if I stole her lunch money. It takes all of my effort to shift my gaze in the other direction. I'm sure she's not glowering at me. We don't even know each other. Unless, of course, she thinks I'm shoplifting. That would make total sense, with the exception I haven't picked up a single item. I do my best to thread my way through the bodies as I brush up against a table laden with paranormal books. A black, ornate hardback catches my eye that looks as if it's made of embossed leather. There's a picture of a single red rose on the cover bleeding its petals as they fall into a pool of sanguine liquid. Vampire Hunter's Companion, I whisper as I run my finger over the carved cover, and it bumps beneath my flesh as if it were coming to life. I'm sure the tourists are snapping up books just like this, right and left, and I can see why. It feels as if this sacred tome were casting a spell on me mesmerizing me with its comely grace before I ever crack the spine. A spark darts up my arm, and I pull my hand back as if yanking it from a fire. I take a sharp breath before spinning on my heels. So odd. It's as if innately I knew I had to step away or I'd fall inside of it. I swallow hard as I take another look around. To the right of the cafe sits an expansive magazine section with rows and rows of glossy reeds as a smattering of people lazily flip through them. The shelves are ten feet tall, white, backlit racks, making the entire area feel bright and airy, a luminary in an otherwise gloomy yet cozy environment. And seated precariously on top of the shelf nearest to me is a glassy, brassy hourglass that crowns the place with an ethereal glory. It stands about three feet tall, and the sand encapsulated in it glows a strange shade of lavender, with bits of glitter that sparkle and shine as they capture the light. If I didn't know better, it looks as if the sand is moving. 
The shimmering lights inside of it look as if they're stirring to life, as if they had magical properties of their own. It glistens and winks my way, as if beckoning me to adulate its beauty up close and personal, and my feet lead me that way to do just that. Time in a bottle, I muse as I stare up at it, unable to pull my eyes away from the enchanting wonder as it looms up above. No sooner do I take another step in that direction than I crash, face first, into a brick wall of a body. I'm so sorry, I say as I stumble to my right, only to look up at the palest green eyes I have ever seen. A jolt of electrocution bucks through me, and a breath hitches in my throat that I can't quite seem to fill my lungs with. My body is frozen solid. It's as if... All of time stops as our eyes lock. Something is happening. Those eyes. They seem to glow and pulsate supernaturally as they stare right back at me. There's a depth to them that I haven't seen in any other eyes before. A knowing. An entire treasure trove of secrets buried in each one. My fault says the tall, dark-haired stranger with the face of a deity, stubble-peppered cheeks, eyes that seem to have entranced me, and the curve of a smile on his face. He's about six-five, dark suit, dark wool coat on over that, slick silver tie that sets off the deliciousness in his face. And oh my word, I think I'm drooling. My stomach squeezes tightly at the sight of him, and holy hot tamale, if this is what they've been hiding out in Glimmerspell, then I've certainly picked the wrong time to eschew men. His chest bounces with a silent laugh as his eyes rake over my features. Pardon me. He steps aside, his eyes lingering a touch longer than they need to, before a group of young girls bombard him. A common occurrence, I'm guessing. I take another blind step to my right my eyes still glued to the handsome man in the dark coat, and he looks my way before doing a double take. Look out, he shouts while glancing just above me, and I look up in time to see that enormous hourglass toppling in my direction. My head explodes in a vat of pain, and just like that, the lights go out in my world. Three. Acorn! Someone shouts in the distance as my left cheek grows increasingly warm and wet. Acorn, come here! My eyelids struggle to open, and the first thing I see is the cute, furry face of a cinnamon-colored labradoodle who I'm all too familiar with. Acorn? His name croaks from my lips as he's quickly pulled back, and in his wake, Morgan's face pops up. That's right. Acorn is Morgan's dog. She brought him to Mabel's funeral a few weeks back. He's as sweet as can be. And then it all comes crashing back to me as my lids begin to flutter once again. That rock-hard body, those eyes, that ridiculously tall hourglass set precariously on a perch. Billy? Morgan shouts as she gives me a few quick slaps on the cheek, and my lids spring wide open once again. Her dark hair swings around her shoulders. She has the buttonwood-issued lavender eyes and is as pretty as can be. Oh, you scared me. I thought you were dead. I pat my hands over the ground in an effort to try to get up, and my fingers land in what looks to be purple glittering sand. Oh, no, don't do that, Morgan panics. She's clad in black with a pair of ripped jeans shredded at the knees as her pale skin glares out at me. There are shards all over the place. That stupid hourglass tipped over and bonked you right on the head. Stay put while I grab a broom. She takes off, and Acorn dashes off right along with her, while a sea of faces stares down at me. I do a quick scan of the crowd for Harper, but she's nowhere to be seen. To the left, I spot Morgan, tucked between a couple of girls, with her dark hair swept up, and a far more matronly outfit on than she was just wearing 
as she stares down at me timidly. And as soon as I spot her, she taps her fingers to her lips and backs into the crowd until she's gone once again. Odd. I could have sworn she ran in the opposite direction. The handsome man with the electrocuting eyes swoops down my way, with his lips flickering as if he was unsure of what he was about to do next. His wool coat flanks me on either side, and for a moment the two of us are encapsulated in the darkness. His eyes glow as they look into mine, as if they were backlit from the inside. The music, the bookstore, all of its patrons disappear for one brief moment in time, and it's just the two of us in the world once again. My heart gives a wild thump, as if kick-starting after a long hiatus, and a charge runs through me. The stubble over his cheeks contrasts with his pale skin, and there's something intoxicating about the darkness and the light as it mingles over his features. How many fingers am I holding up? He asks, lifting his index finger a notch. One, I say struggling to sit up, and he grabs me by the arm and gently helps me to my feet. My apologies again. He gives a curt nod, no smile, as if he were angry that he had to apologize about anything. I take full responsibility for this. Once I bumped into you, I must have sent you spinning like a top. Well, good. I like blaming things on other people. It's my favorite hobby as of late. Apology accepted. A quick smile blinks on my lips as I dust purple glitter off my jeans, but my eyes never leave those clear green peepers of his. Glad I could be of help in that department. He inches back a notch, a hint of amusement on his face. Our gaze lingers a little too long, and that spear of heat is right back to bisecting my stomach. In all my time on this planet, I have not seen a man with such cutting good looks. Thank God Almighty we didn't meet while I was still a boob, or I might have been the one cheating in the bedroom. Not that I would have. I was a loyal boob to the bitter end. Cheating? Really? What am I thinking? This man is certainly taken. They don't let hot property like this roam the earth unattended. His wife is probably here rolling her eyes at me right this minute. My goodness, that was probably her at the register glaring at me preemptively. I glance down to his ring finger and note it's bare, no tan line. Not that there would be a reason for a tan line in our frozen neck of the woods. And for the briefest moment, a glimmer of hope rides through me, right up until I remember that Harold hadn't worn his wedding ring for 18 out of the 19 years we were married. The missing ring means nothing. Not that I'm gunning for another jackass to rip my heart out. Not that someone drop-dead gorgeous like tall, dark, and brooding would be interested in me to begin with. In fact, let the record show Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding didn't even see me to begin with, hence the fact he attempted to walk right through me. I was essentially invisible to him, as I have been to men like him all my life. Not that I made it easy on him by not paying attention myself. But all of that is beside the point. I'm over men. I'm over relationships. I'm young, wild, and free now that I've ridden myself of Harold. Okay, young might be on a sliding scale at the age of 45. And the wildest thing I've done since I gave Harold the boot was paint my nails blue. But I'm free and I'll tell you right now that it feels as if I shed a 300-pound grown man-child right off my shoulders, and I did. A man pops up next to Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding, with dirty blonde hair and a face full of scruff. It's the same man that I saw having a tense conversation with the redhead in the miniskirt when I first walked in. Everything okay? The man with the dirty blonde hair sheds an easy grin. For a second there, I thought we might actually bear witness to a homicide. He chuckles. Griffin Barker. He offers me his hand, and I shake it. He, too, is in a suit, wool coat over that, and looks to be about the same age as tall, dark, and brooding. I'm guessing late forties, early fifties. 
Harold comes to mind. He happens to be in that age bracket himself, and I wonder if the aforementioned age bracket happens to be when something resets inside a man and makes him recalibrate the compass of his life, pointing the way to hunting down a woman in her early twenties. Hey, wait a minute. I straighten a moment as I give a quick glance around at the bevy of young, beautiful women. Maybe this is some kind of a speed dating session I've stumbled into? No wonder tall, dark, and brooding wasn't paying attention to where he was going. He was too amped up, trying to figure out which co-ed he was going home with. Griffin's smile expands, as if he were thinking the very same thing as far as it pertains to him. I teach investigative homicide at Dexter University, and a majority of these people are my students, he offers. We've come to watch the taping. It's extra credit for the class. Oh, I tip my head back as the picture comes into focus. So I was wrong about that whole speed dating thing. But I was right about the baby face influx of college students taking over the haunted book barn. I shoot tall, dark, and brooding a look. I bet he's still here for the co-eds. Pervert. Nice to meet you, Griffin. I force a smile to the scruffy blonde. I'm Morgan's aunt. She's the one that's doing the taping. I'm new in town, just pulled in with my daughter. In fact, she'll be applying to Dexter in a couple of years. Charlene, Harold's harlot, has already dropped out due to morning sickness. But I decide to leave that little affiliation with the school out of the conversation for now. I look up at the brooding entity among us and give a slight nod his way in hopes he'll do the honors as far as exchanging monikers is concerned. I'm not sure why I feel it's his duty to introduce himself first, but a stubborn part of me refuses to dip my toe into introductory waters. I bet he has 15 women a day introduce themselves to him, and I am not in the mood to play to his obvious ego. He glowers my way a moment, as if he heard my internal musings. Just as his lips part, an older woman with wiry gray curls and wide blue eyes all but accosts me. I'm guessing she's in her eighties. She's pretty fit for her age, dressed head to toe in pink. Pink sweater, pink jeans, pink heart-shaped earrings. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a pink streak in her hair on a lock tucked behind her ear. So you're Morgan's niece. Her mouth rounds out in a smile. I mean, nephew. She blinks to the ceiling. I mean, well, you know what I mean. You're her, the woman who'll be staying with me. I am? I glance over to the wreckage I left in my wake, just as Morgan sweeps up the last of the lavender glitter into a dustpan, and dumps it into a mini trash can next to her. She hands the mess to a woman with dark hair and hazel eyes, and it's the very same woman who was glaring at me from the counter. The very same woman who is still glaring at me. She's a touch younger than me, miles prettier. She's wearing a skin-tight sweater and jeans that make me uncomfortable just looking at them. I bet she's trying to impress one of the men I'm standing with although I have no idea why she'd be frowning at me. Lord knows I'm not offering up any competition. Morgan trots over once again, clad in black, and those torn jeans only seem to be confusing me this time. Why the quick change? Oh, heck, she's the star of the show. I bet she changes ten times before those cameras roll. Billy, this is Teddy, she says, nodding to the older woman. Don't let her scare you off. She's perfectly harmless. Theodora Roosevelt. Teddy thrusts her icy hard hand in mine and gives a quick up and down shake. Everyone calls me Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt? A tiny laugh bubbles in my throat. That's so great. Were you named after the president? Please, she rolls her eyes. Rumor has it he was named after me. She hitches her head toward the cafe. I'll go prep the good stuff you'll be whipping up. We're on in 15 minutes, kid. She reaches over and fluffs my hair out around my face. You're going to be a star, kiddo. Oh, I'm not in the show. 
I'm quick to correct. The heck you're not. Morgan nods to the woman. Pull out a red apron for her and make sure it doesn't have any wrinkles. Billy is about to make her big debut. She is single and ready to mingle and needs to put her best foot forward, cougar foot. She winks my way. You'll go younger this time. I've already lined up a couple of hot studs for you. Aye, aye, Captain. Teddy gives a mock salute and takes off for the cafe. No way, Morgan, I tell her, on all fronts. But I'm sure Harper would be more than happy to help. And for the record, no young hot studs for her either. Thank you very much in advance. Harper can help next time. Morgan bats those false lashes of hers my way, and for a second, I wonder how I would look with a pair of falsies on. She looks cute, youthful, and exuberant. All hardcore truths, regardless of the lashes. I'm guessing I'd be less cute, young, and exuberant, and more tired, old streetwalker. Not that I see some decrepit old lady staring back at me in the mirror. Okay, fine. On occasion, I do. But if I give her the finger enough, I'm convinced she's bound to go away eventually. Although I will confess to seeing glimpses of my grandmother every now and again when I catch my reflection. I'm hoping it has more to do with how much I miss her, and not the fact I'm slowly morphing into her ancient likeness. You should do it. The blonde, scruffy man, Griffin Barker, sheds another easy smile my way. She will, Morgan affirms as she looks at me. Just because your husband left you for some twenty-something skank with a hot bod and big knockers doesn't mean your life has come to an end. I can't help but frown as I shoot a quick glance to Mr. Tall, dark and brooding. I bet he showed up today in hopes of finding a young skank with a hot bod and big knockers. Our eyes meet for less than a second, and it feels as if I've scalded my corneas. Morgan pulls back and takes me in. And my God, when did you get so skinny? I wouldn't say skinny. But I did lose those 20 pounds I was trying so hard to shed for the last 16 years. I inadvertently went on the Harold Boob is an Idiot diet, and the pounds miraculously melted right off. Who knew a steady diet of anger and tears was low carb, and yet fuel efficient as far as giving me the energy to hate another day. Morgan shrugs. Well, you look good. We're making almond horns today, so we might just put a few of those pounds right back on you. Griffin gives a warm laugh, but Mr. Brooding only seems to grow that much more perturbed. And once you're through, we can share a cup of coffee and I'll tell you all about Glimmerspell, Griffin offers. And if you're really good... I might even give you a tour. He gives a slight wink, and I can't help but chuckle. Coffee sounds great, but I don't need a tour, mostly because I have a feeling his tour is going to end in his bedroom. But seeing that it was the first quasi-proposition I've had in nearly two decades, and that includes any from Harold, I'm flattered by the fact he had the cookies to dole it out to begin with. Excuse us? Tall, dark, and brooding grunts over at his suit-wearing counterpart. I need to speak with you. In a minute. Griffin doesn't take his eyes off of me. Coffee it is. And then we'll discuss dinner. A perky blonde with a navy sweater dress that hugs her every curve slips between the two men. Professor Barker? She says his name, but she's looking up at Mr. Brooding while running her tongue along her upper lip. Winner, winner, co-ed dinner. But come to think of it, he probably gets his pick of the crop, not the other way around. I can take attendance for you if you want. Sure thing, Jenny. Griffin nods to the crowd. I think most everyone is here by now. She takes off, and Mr. Brooding shoves his hand onto Griffin's arm. Let's talk before things get started. He navigates him off a few feet and things look as if they're getting instantly heated between the two of them. Griffin loses the smile and looks as if he's about to start a fist fight with the man. Don't worry, Morgan says, giving my sweater a quick pat over the shoulders. You're going to do great. 
All you have to do is add the ingredients to the bowl as I read them to you. I'll walk you through everything. She pulls me along until we're standing in front of a brunette with long, dark hair. Her foundation gives her skin that Oompa Loompa glow I'm sure no one is going for. And she's got on a leopard print top and yoga pants. She also looks as if she's about 16, but then again, she could be 30 for all I know. Billy, this is Vera Henley. She's going to mic you up. You look great, so I think we'll skip hair and makeup and get right to shooting. She takes off for the cafe, and the brunette quickly secures a small plastic box over the back of my jeans and buries a wire between my boobs. Nice to meet you, Billy. Vera shrugs, and I'm not entirely sure what that means. Just stay close to the kitchen island. That's where the camera will be. Don't leave the fun zone, as we like to call it, or the audience won't be able to see you. Fun zone, right. I glance to the tiny steel and wood kitchen, drowning with floodlights, and my stomach starts to claw at me. So how long have you been working with Morgan? Just a month. She had to fire her old production team. She said they were basically tainted. I'm on loan from the university. We all are. We're technically in film class, but our professors thought it would be good to glean some working knowledge of what goes into a production, so here we are, getting paid in cookies and extra credit. It sounds like I'm the only one not getting any extra credit today. She barks out a laugh. You're funny, but I can tell you're nervous. Now get over there and bake some cookies. Once this is all over, you'll get to stuff your face to your heart's content. There's something to look forward to. The next few minutes are a whirlwind as I find myself in the working end of the kitchen while Teddy Roosevelt straps a red, wrinkle-free apron to me. The cafe kitchen is as homey as it is cosmopolitan, with its creamy white marble slab over the island, its stainless refrigerated units that house all of the sweet treats one could want, and a rustic wood shelving unit that sits on the wall behind me. The crowd begins to hum as they congregate near the action, and I scan the faces for Harper, but can't seem to spot her. I see Morgan peering out at me from between a group of co-eds, her hair is pulled back once again, and she looks worried for me, as if she were having second thoughts, as she should. I could very well unravel this entire money-making murder scheme she's got going for her. In fact, she might want to rethink taking me on as an employee as well. I don't know why, but I have a creaky feeling in my bones that things are about to go very, very wrong. Billy? A female calls out from my right, and I blink back as I spot my niece. How did you get here so fast? I marvel. And your hair is down again. Fast? Her dark brows hike a notch. Her lips are a bright shade of fuchsia, and she's got metallic blue eyeshadow on that catches the light. It's clear one of us made time for hair and makeup. Yeah, I just saw you out in the crowd, and then poof, here you are. Her lips part as she looks to the crowd. Billy? She squints my way before shaking her head. Never mind. We'll talk after the show. I'm sure a dozen girls out there look just like me. She gives an unsure smile, as if she didn't believe that in the least. Don't sweat a thing. This will be over before you know it. Where have I heard that before? Harold uttered those words to me verbatim on our wedding night and that nightmare took 19 painful years to dissolve. We were never going to win any awards in the marital department. I just didn't think I'd end up with a booby prize either, pun intended. I glance back to the crowd and spot Vera, the girl who mic'd me up, off to the side, talking to Griffin. She pokes her finger to his chest before saying something to him in a rather aggressive manner, before taking off. Not a member of the Griffin Barker fan club, I take it. Before I know it, someone calls action, and the cheery 80s music streaming from the speakers cuts out, and it's all eyes and ears on Morgan. Welcome to another episode of Murder, Mayhem, and Baking. I'm Morgan Buttonwood, 
and this is my Aunt Billy, who I never call Aunt Billy because she's always felt like more of a sister to me. She was my dad's sister, and as those of you who tune in regularly already know, my father, along with my stepmother, passed away about a year ago. Since Dad and Billy were close siblings, I thought, in honor of having Billy here, we could also honor her brother, my father. My chest bucks with emotion as the crowd coos around us. I glance out and spot Harper hugging a hardback to my left as she presses her lips together as if she too were on the brink of tears. Teddy, Roosevelt, pulls a handkerchief from her bosom and proceeds to boo-hoo into it. And I'm this close to joining her. Now, Morgan takes a deep breath as she smiles into the camera. Today we'll be dissecting the infamous Marblehead murders that took place right here in Maine. Mr. Arnold Taylor and his wife, Carol, had been arguing for the last few weeks of their coupledom. Neighbors and friends said that the two had hit a rough patch. They had three little girls who they tried to protect from their disagreements and for whom they were determined to stick together. Or so it seemed. She gives a cheeky wink. But before we get to the nitty-gritty, I'd like to introduce you to our dessert for the day, my dad's favorite almond horn cookies. If marzipan is your thing, and you have a craving for all things dark chocolate, then these should be your go-to cookie. These are gluten-free because they happen to be flourless, and they're both chewy and crunchy. They're amazing, and as those gathered around us will soon discover, highly fragrant, too. She pushes a mixing bowl toward me, and I give the camera a nervous smile. Now, Morgan claps her hands. I've already made the almond paste for this cookie. It's just whole blanched almonds, confectioner's sugar, an egg white, and almond extract. Toss it into the food processor, and voila, you have almond paste. I'll have the recipe up on my site later for you. Right now, Billy is going to stir in half a cup of finely ground almond flour and a third cup granulated sugar. She nods, and I quickly do as I'm told nearly knocking the bowl over in the process. I'm not sure why, but my every move feels as if it's impossible to accomplish, sort of the way when you're the one holding the key to the front door and someone behind you is screaming while doing the potty dance. Suddenly you're unable to pull off a simple act you've done a dozen times before. Not that I've baked an almond horn in front of a live audience before, and for darn sure... Not that I'll ever do it again. An egg white? Morgan slides an egg my way. A pinch of salt and stir that up real good. We could use a stand mixer, but I thought we'd work some muscle on Billy today. She winks my way. So Mr. Taylor, a 34-year-old fitness instructor, claims he went to the gym the morning Carol went missing. He says he got a call from the school telling him his children needed to be picked up. And once he did that, they came home to find the house looking as if there had been a struggle. We're talking furniture knocked over, broken mirror in the hall, and an unusual scratch along the front door. Police investigated, found no foul play as far as breaking and entering. In the meantime, there's no sign of Carol anywhere. She missed a hair appointment at 1.30, and her hairdresser, also a friend, says she never skipped out on one in 11 years. Carol was missing for a total of 13 days. She nods my way. Let's get that bowl of slivered almonds front and center, she says, pulling a small bowl full of sliced almonds my way, along with a cookie sheet and a miniature ice cream scoop. Let's make as many balls from the dough as we can, roll them in the sliced almonds, and then form them into about six-inch rods before pulling them into a crescent shape and popping them on the cookie sheet. I get right to scooping, rolling, and forming them into rods, then crescents. I glance up, and that blonde that asked to take roll for Griffin earlier, Jenny, 
catches my eye as she whispers something directly into his ear, most likely a proposition. I'm not sure why I think everyone came here today well-equipped with lewd intent, sends Harper, Morgan, and me, and maybe Teddy Roosevelt, too. Griffin glares at the girl a moment, and my blood runs cold just watching. There's something sinister in his eyes, and I can't pinpoint what exactly. That's strange. I didn't get any weird vibes about him earlier while he was plying me with the promises of coffee and the proverbial tour of his bedroom. A dry laugh pumps from Jenny's chest as she says something that looks awfully snippy to him and causes him to glare at her that much harder as she stalks off. Good for her. Wait a minute. She was the one out of line in that scenario. Not sure why I was so quick to side with the hussy, but I'm still raw from my own rejection, and the men of the world are getting the brunt of my fury at the moment. Morgan goes on in detail about Carol Taylor's abduction while I finish getting the last of the crescents onto the cookie sheet. Go ahead and pop those into the oven, she instructs. We're about to get to the good part. I pick up the cookie sheet and glance to my left, where my eyes snag on Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding. His lids hood a notch, but he looks more annoyed by my presence than he does ready to give me a tour of his bedroom, and I frown over at him without meaning to. Those eyes, though. I can feel them watching me long after I look away. My entire body heats to unsafe levels as I take the cookie sheet past the fun zone deeper into the kitchen before landing them into their heated, albeit temporary, home. No sooner do I shut the oven door than my entire upper torso feels as if it's catching fire, and my face flushes in an instant. Wow. Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding might be as mean as he is lean but he sure has an effect on the ladies, me being at the front of the heated line. That bite of heat continues to escalate to unsafe levels, and I take a quick breath as I touch my hand to the stainless refrigerator just to cool myself for a moment. I'm half moved to kick off my boots, strip off my sweater, and run right out into the snow just to stop the heated madness that's currently taking over like wildfire. The floor beneath me gives a soft wobble, and my vision grows bleary, and suddenly it feels as if I'm falling, spinning through space and time, right out of the kitchen, and right out of my mind. What the— Before I can finish my sentence, an entirely new scene forms around me. The air grows increasingly chilled, and I find myself standing in a snowy field of some sort. I glance up at the dark sky and gasp. What the hell? My voice floats around me in an odd echo, as if I were lost in a fishbowl. Am I dead? I call out, but there's no response. I take a good look around at the somewhat blurry realm I seem to have landed in. Oh my goodness! I have a feeling I was hit on the head a lot harder than I thought. You don't ever tell me what I can and can't do. A voice comes from my left, and I spot two blurry figures that slowly come into focus. It's Griffin, and that redhead with the miniskirt is with him. I give a quick glance around, and by the looks of the environment, I think we're right outside of the haunted book barn. I can tell you anything I want, she snips. I own you. So be careful. I know what you've done. I'm going to make sure the world finds out about it sooner than later. Oh, my word, I hiss. What's he done? And why the hell am I here? I should be back in that bakery. I've got cookies to eat and Harper to raise and one serious grudge toward mankind in the literal gender-based sense that I haven't even begun to nurse properly. And why the heck am I talking to myself? The ground gives a soft bounce. That disorienting feeling comes over me once more, 
and I'm falling again, this time with much more vigor. In a blink, I'm right back in the kitchen, just as Morgan runs in with her sweet dog, Acorn, on her heels. What are you doing? She hisses. I told you to take the cookies out ten minutes ago. Geez, if I knew you had stage fright this bad, I would have had Harper help. She quickly pulls the cookies out of the oven, and they're burned to a crisp. I'm so sorry, I say, following her right back to the makeshift studio, where the audience gives a little titter at the horrific sight. Bad news, good news. Morgan tosses the cookies down with a bang. The cookies, much like Carol Taylor, met an ill-timed fate. But good news for those in my studio, because I just so happened to have whipped up six batches of these wonders last night. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Murder, Mayhem, and Baking. We'll see you next week when we discuss the butchering of a couple from Crystal Lake. And cut, someone shouts, and the room explodes with spontaneous applause. Teddy and I help Morgan distribute the cookies and they're snatched up furtively as if they were bars of gold. Well done. Griffin Barker is the first to take a cookie off my plate. There's a small bead of sweat along his upper lip, and his hair looks must at the temples. I guess those harsh studio lights weren't just melting me. They were melting the audience, too. Thank you, I say as he indulges in a bite, just as Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding steps up. I quickly move my plate in his direction and glower at him for inciting such a nuclear event in my body a few minutes ago. Technically, it's his fault the cookies are burned to a crisp. He looks as if he's about to reach for one when Griffin doubles over and slaps the entire plate right out of my hand. The plate breaks with a crash as it lands on the floor and all heads turn this way as Griffin staggers toward the brooding one among us before pivoting on his feet and latching his full weight onto me instead. Oh my goodness, I pant as I begin to fall backward, and tall, dark, and brooding catches me as he does his best to pluck his buddy off of me. Griffin's lips open as he looks up at the man, but not a single word escapes him. His face turns purple as the crowd begins to gasp. His body twitches, he foams at the mouth, and without warning, he falls to the floor. Mr. Brooding quickly swoops down and checks the man's pulse before looking up my way and shaking his head. It looks as if that coffee date is over before it began, and as it stands, I'm not getting a tour of his bedroom either. Griffin Barker is dead. 4. He's dead? My voice sails from my lips without my permission as the room breaks out into screams and cries of terror. Morgan's face goes white. I'll call for help. She takes off and Acorn jumps in a circle while giving a few quick barks. Come here, boy. I pat my knee until he's next to me, and I give his curly cinnamon-colored fur a quick scratch. You did this. The girl with the chestnut hair calls out as she steps this way, the exact girl who's been glowering at me ever since I stepped in. And now I know why. She has extremely keen klutz radar, and knew this broken glass fiasco was on the horizon. Oh, wait. I think she's accusing me of this deadly disaster instead. You killed him, didn't you? Thought so. No. I shake my head her way. I swear I didn't. But it's too late. Half the crowd is turning a shoulder up at me as if I've got the plague. As if I am the plague. And who knows? At this point, I just might be. Yes, the woman doubles down on her lunacy. I saw you slip him something, and the next thing I knew, he was twitching. That's not true, I bellow at the blooming crowd, all of whom are suddenly glaring at me. I didn't slip him anything. I mean, I slipped him a cookie, but, aha, uh -huh. 
The woman jabs a finger my way, and tall, dark, and brooding holds her back, as if staving off an attack. All right enough, Iona, he growls. I'll take it from here. He shoots her a look before flashing a badge my way. Elliot Greenlee, Winchester County Homicide Division. He steps in close, just enough for the scent of his cologne to warm me before facing the crowd. I need everyone to step back about ten feet. Put your phones away. I don't want to see a single picture taken. Professor Barker suffered an unfortunate event, and I want to make sure we give him the respect that's due to him. The blonde I met earlier, Jenny, teacher's pet, although I feel petty even thinking about that now, all things considered, winnows her way forward and clings to Detective Greenlee's side. I can call his wife, she offers. Wife? I shoot the corpse a dirty look without meaning to. No wonder Charlene was quick to glom onto that whole let's have coffee then hit the bedroom routine. It was taught as a part of the curriculum at that dicey university. The room quickly floods with sheriff's deputies, and Teddy Roosevelt waddles her way over to me like a hot pink storm on the horizon with that furry black cat tucked in her arms. Did you see that? She howls, as if I were hard of hearing. He's dead as a doornail, and it happened right here on your first day in town. What do you think it means? She glances to the cat, and for a moment, I'm not sure which one of us she's talking to. Harper runs up, breathless, with an open-mouthed smile. Good Lord, if Teddy's comment didn't spur the townspeople to tar and feather me as they run me out of town, Harper and her newfound glee will. Mom, she booms as she shakes me by the shoulders. There's a freaking dead person in the room. I knew something was wrong with this jacked-up town. Do you think a vampire did it? What? I shake my head just as her phone chirps. No, there are no vampires in Glimmerspell. An unusual hush falls over the room, and all eyes are on me for less than a nanosecond before everything stirs right back up again. I gotta go. Harper dances backward while immersed in her phone. I've already told everyone back in Mulberry, and they're like totally jealous. She zips off before I can stop her. Teddy gives a wistful tick of the head. The kid's gonna be a hit. Morgan pops up before I can contest the idea of Harper's newfound popularity, although I have an inkling Teddy might be onto something. Billy, Morgan frowns out at the swarm of bodies surrounding us. Help me get this crowd under control. You mean kick them out? Only the ones not willing to make a purchase. Dead man or not, I've got a living to make. She takes off in an effort to herd the crowd, and a woman standing in the kitchen catches my eye. That long dark hair, pale skin, and eyes that glow like twin amethysts. Oh, wow, Teddy, look. I motion toward the cafe. That woman standing behind the island looks exactly like Morgan. I saw her earlier, and I thought I was losing my mind. What woman? Teddy squints hard, just as the woman in question stalks off to the back of the kitchen and disappears out of sight. Never mind, I say. I'm starting to get the feeling I hit my head harder than I think. You wouldn't happen to know the name of a good shrink, would you? She shoves the furry little feline cutie my way. Meet Grizzy. She's not only a good listener, she's free. That's about all I can afford. I give my new shrink a scratch between the ears. Nice to meet you, Grizz. Teddy pulls her lips to the side as she inspects my forehead. I didn't want to say anything, but you got a real goose egg brewing. That would explain why I passed out. I glance in the direction of the cafe once again. I had this weird dream while I was out, too. I was in the snow, and there were people arguing. I don't dare tell her that one of those people was the very man that lies dead on the floor not ten feet away. The weird thing is, I could have sworn on my life I actually left the kitchen and appeared right there in the woods with those people. 
Teddy sucks in a quick breath. You know what that means, don't you? You're a time bandit. A time what? A time twister, a time glider, a time tamer. She snaps her fingers three times fast. Time traveler. I avert my eyes at the thought. Believe me, I bet what's happening in my brain is a lot less exciting. Think subdermal hematoma, the life-threatening variety. That's probably why I'm hallucinating the fact I see Morgan every which way, too. I'd probably best get my affairs in order. My chest heaves. Charlene the Ditz will become a second mother to Harper and undo all the good I've done over the years. They'll probably wear matching ripped jeans and buy way too many three-wick candles down at the Bath and Body Scents, at full price, no less. And believe me, both of those scenarios are completely unreasonable. Harold will be living his best life with his shiny new trophy wife, and all I'll have to keep me company is a cold, dark casket. Sorry, kid, Teddy says, as both she and Grizzy shake their heads. But from what little I've heard of Harold, you're not getting a cushy casket. You're getting the coffee can. Ugh. My entire body rattles with frustration. You're so right. Morgan cups her hands around her mouth and lets out an obnoxious yet highly effective whistle, and the thunder of voices around us quiets down once again. If you have any purchases to make, please form a single line. She motions toward the cafe, and about a dozen bodies sail that way. Grizzy yells as if she were shouting out instructions, too, and I offer a forlorn smile her way. Why couldn't I be a cat? Sleeping, eating, telling people what to do? And I'd get nine lives to boot. Not a bad deal, especially when you consider she works at a bookstore. Teddy grunts. I'd better help Iona at the register. She gets cranky any day of the week that ends in Y. Don't worry, slick Willy Billy. No one expects much out of you. Gee, thanks, I say, just as tall, dark, and brooding swoops over once again. Word of warning, Elliot. Teddy points a gnarled finger his way. Billy the Kid here has garnered the ability to break time zones like nobody's business. And sadly, she's about to be your second corpse of the day. The girl blacked out in the kitchen right before she burned your cookies. She turns my way. If you drop dead while I'm gone, just know Grizzy and I are gonna miss you. It's not every day a sassy, trashy little tramp like yourself saunters into town. Travels through time and space just to kill a man with a hard, cold look in her eyes. I aspire to be you. She takes off, and my mouth is left hanging open in her wake. A choking sound emits from me as I look in her direction. I don't know what to say to that. Elliot Greenlee steps in front of my line of vision. Detective Elliot Greenlee and my insides purr like a hypersexual kitten. How do you like that? Turns out I'm part cat after all. I suck in a quick breath at the newfound low I've sunk to. For Pete's sake, there's a corpse in the room. And Teddy is most likely right. I'm gunning for second place in the casket races. I've never wanted anything, and this wouldn't be the best time for my luck to change in that department. Elliot leans in and stares deep into my eyes, looking from one to another. No signs of a concussion, but we should probably get you checked out. No, I'm fine, really, and highly uninsured. His brows hike a notch. Aside from the fact you blacked out and garnered the ability to break time zones like nobody's business? His lips flicker with devious intent as he quotes Teddy. Very funny. I say, and a little bit true. I wince as Jenny, teacher's pet extraordinaire, crops up and suddenly I'm drowning in her sugary perfume as she swoons up at the ornery detective among us. Professor Greenlee. Her lips pout his way. Her chest does an odd little wiggle as if she were trying to seduce him, and I have no doubt she is. I guess he's dead. She bites down on a smile 
as if she weren't sorry at all. Does this mean you'll be taking over our perfect crime class? Professor? I marvel with a note of sarcasm, and I'm not sure why. And what's with that smile of hers? A man just lost his life, her professor no less, and yet there's nary a tear in her horny eyes. Elliot shoots me a quick look before nodding her away. I'm still on as a guest speaker for the next two weeks, but I'll have to check with the university to see what happens next. Don't worry, the school won't drop the class. If anything, you'll be assigned a new professor. Good. Her teeth graze over her lip as a lusty gleam takes over her entire countenance. I was just getting used to seeing your handsome face every day. I wouldn't want to miss it. She gives a playful shrug. Just know I'll be available to help you with whatever your needs might be. Her fingers walk up his tie, and it's about all I can take. Oh, for goodness sake, I groan at the sight. But man-hungry Jenny pays me no mind. Not shockingly, neither does Detective Greenlee. I'm guessing he's getting ready to investigate her motives under the sheets. You've got my number, she nods as she steps away. Don't be afraid to use it. She takes off, and I scoff in her wake. You're staring at the wrong body in the room, detective, I say, and the words come out a little snippier than intended. The corpse is that way. I point in the opposite direction, but he's not following my directive. His lips twitch as his eyes ride up and down my features. You would be right about the corpse, but I wasn't looking at her. I was looking at you. Me? My cheeks heat a notch. Of course he was looking at me. I had the nerve to practically tell the girl off. Suddenly, I moved to tell off all of the girls at Dexter University starting with Charlene and ending with Jenny. And Professor, really? I'm about to contest his questionable scholastic status. For all I know, Professor is a pet name she's called him many times before in the bedroom when a deputy pops up next to him. The man has dark hair, chiseled cheeks, and eyes the color of a clear blue lake. He's dressed in a tan uniform, black boots, big belt, and has an even bigger gun strapped to his waist. He's about my age, give or take half a decade, and I'm willing to bet he's older, just the way I like him. I give a quick blink. What am I saying? I don't even know what I like. I had Harold mouth-breathing next to me in bed for the last 19 years, so I suppose I prefer anything north of that. What do you think, detective? A murder right here in Glimmerspell? The deputy glowers at Elliot, and if I'm not mistaken, there was a distinct edge of sarcasm to his voice when he said the word detective. He glances my way, and I get the full frontal view of his face. Holy hotness, Batman. As if the tall, dark, and brooding professor slash homicide detective wasn't enough to put a hitch in my man-hating giddy-up, along comes his partner in crime-busting. Sheriff Cash Archer at your service. He thrusts a hand my way, and I give it a quick shake. Sheriff? I take a moment to marvel at his shiny, star-shaped prowess. Billy Buttonwood, did you say murder? I pull him in close, without meaning to, and note Elliot glaring at our conjoined hands. Sorry, I say, giving the hot sheriff a quick pat before letting go. You don't think that man was killed, do you? I mean, I fed him a cookie. He could have had a reaction to the almonds. A nut allergy can explain everything. You know what they say, don't go chasing zebras when you're in the middle of run-of-the-mill horses, or in this case, almonds. Elliot tips his head to the side. You're right. With the exception, he was sweating profusely and foaming at the mouth. That's an indicator of a severe toxin. He nods to his professional counterpart. We'll see what the coroner says. 
In the meantime, I'll see if Morgan had any cameras pointed at the crowd. Good thinking. Sheriff Archer nods my way as his eyes do that broken elevator thing. We'll meet again soon. I'll make sure of it. Elliot glowers at the man as he takes off, and for some reason this offends me. Come to think about it, just about everything he does offends me. Meet again soon? Ha, huh, I balk. That must be code for I'm married. It seems I'm irresistible to those of the matrimonially bound variety. Elliot inches back and eyes me. I'll make a note of that. Why would you make a note of that? Because I'm making a note of all the suspects in the room. He has the cookies to say while he scans the crowd. Starting with you. Full name and number. He poises his phone my way, ready to tap the information into it, and I quickly give him the intel he's looking for. A part of me is hoping he'll use that number for far more nefarious circumstances. Then the reality hits, and I'm right back to being offended. Did you really just call me a suspect? My voice hikes a notch. Listen, buddy, I'm a lot of things, but a killer I am not. Even if I have suddenly garnered the ability to twist time to my advantage, which I haven't, I wouldn't evict a single soul from its body, as evidenced by the fact my ex is still walking around on the right side of the soil. His brows furrow as he studies me a moment. I wouldn't worry about it. You already have a good defense working in your favor. Temporary insanity by the way of a thump to the head. One I wouldn't have gotten if you would have watched where you were going. Fair enough. If I'm called to the witness stand at your trial, I'll be sure to bring it up. I don't think you're funny. I narrow my eyes over his drop-dead gorgeous peepers, and I'm annoyed by his presence all the more. I've got a kid I'd like to spare from living with her father and his trophy tramp. I don't have time for three government-issued hots and a cot. Besides, I've already done your homework for you, detective. There are four bona fide suspects right here in this room who could have done away with my potential coffee date. Married as he were. Okay, I'll bite. His chest expands to unreasonable wits. Don't withhold your thoughts from me now. If there are four viable suspects in this room, please, by all means, point them out. Fine. I nod to the buxom blonde. There's ready-to-jump-your-bones Jenny. I saw her whisper sweet nothings into the deceased's ear while we were taping, and whatever he whispered back didn't make her all that happy. Let's just say there were heated words exchanged before she stalked off. She wasn't thrilled. In fact, she looked darn right murderous. His lids put a notch, as if he took umbrage with my words. Don't worry, detective. Don't let the fact you're playing second fiddle to a dead guy prick your ego. She's still pretty hot to trot for you, too. I don't have an ego. A smile curves on his lips, as if maybe he does. Next suspect, please. I have an investigation to tend to. Okay. I crane my neck into the crowd and spot my mark. Her. I point toward the cafe. The girl who mic'd me up. Vera? He frowns her way, and I'm betting he's struck out with her a time or two. Vera Henley, I say with a nod. I saw her walk right up to the victim with an angry look, and she was saying something that looked equally as angry right before she poked him in the chest, just like this. I butt my forefinger into his upper torso, and it's like hitting sheetrock. Jeez, what do you have going on under there? A Kevlar vest? I give a few more pokes as he encapsulates my finger with his hand and removes me from his person. His hand warms mine, and our eyes lock for a moment too long as another one of those jolts of electrocution runs through me once again. I pull my hand back to my side. She was angry, I say, a touch more tempered than I already was. Angry people are capable of anything. Number three, he growls, as if my presence were irritating him on an extraordinary level. 
and believe me, right about now the feeling is mutual. A redhead, I shrug as I look to the crowd. I don't see her, but she was the first thing I did see when I stepped into this place. The two of them were having a private conversation, or more to the point, a private argument. She was tugging at his tie as if she were going to strangle him with it, and that's all I saw. Redhead, he grunts my way. I'll make a note of it. And the last suspect on your list, Detective Buttonwood? His lips flex into a short-lived smile, as if he were entertaining a child. And wow, how I hate being patronized like that. I take a moment to glower at him. The fourth suspect on my list would be you, detective. I give his chest a final poke, as if to prove my point. Don't think that little rough -em up session you took it upon yourself to give him went unnoticed. I saw the whole thing. I flash a short-lived grin right back at him. And there you have it, Detective Greenlee. Four suspects, one of which whose shoes you're standing in. I wonder which one you'll investigate first, which one will end up between your sheets for further analysis, and which one you'll disregard altogether. His chest thumps with a silent laugh. Why ask the questions? You seem to have all the answers. Finally, a man who sees things my way. He starts to walk away, and I pull him back by the sleeve. I do have a question you can answer, I tell him. He tips his head back a notch, the look of irritation still rife on his face. Shoot. He's right back to glowering at me. Sheriff Archer, is he married? I'm still open to having coffee with someone as a way to initiate my stay here in Glimmerspell. No, he's not. Detective Elliot Greenlee's face hardens to stone as he takes a moment to examine me. But I wouldn't go asking to share a cup of coffee with him any time soon. Why not? Because you'll be having it with me. He stalks off, and my mouth falls open in his wake. Tall dark, brooding, and obnoxious. And the cherry on top? He just might be a killer. Five. And then what did he say? Teddy asks as we stand in front of a two-story home with white siding and rows of colorful Christmas lights strung up over the roof line. Despite the fact we're firmly embedded in March, it's dark as pitch out, just a little after six in the evening, but after the day we've had, it feels more like midnight. Teddy is holding Grizzy in one hand as the two of them look up at me with anticipation. The house is lit up with all the enthusiasm of a high school football game on a Friday night, but with the snow blanketing it from every angle, it adds a softness to its frame, and I'm getting the warm fuzzies just looking at it. There's a wraparound porch with snow piled over the railings, and everything about this oversized, slightly crooked house looks as if it's giving me a hug. Right about now, I'll take some action from just about anyone who wants to give it to me. He didn't say anything. I shrug as Harper and I follow Teddy up the porch each with two suitcases in hand. I guess our coffee clatch is yet to be determined. Teddy threads her arm through mine. Well, let's get inside and continue this conversation once you meet Sunshine, Sadie Jean, and of course you've already met Grizzy. A pickup truck comes careening down the street, stopping abruptly in front of the house. Morgan races out of it, and Acorn bounds his way over by her side. Wait for me, Morgan shouts, and soon she's right there with us on the porch. The entire lot of us spent the last four hours at the haunted book barn, helping the patrons check out at the register, then cleaning up once the sheriff's department and the coroner left. Morgan said she wanted every square inch of that place scrubbed down with disinfectant, and I couldn't blame her for that. We scrubbed, mopped, and scoured that old barn from floor to ceiling until you could eat off the exact spot that corpse was lying on this afternoon. Not that you would want to, 
but seeing that my ex is prone to bad decision-making, he might be one to consider it, if there was a juicy steak or an even juicier co-ed involved. Come on. Morgan threads her arm through Harper's as Teddy unlocks the bright red door with a glowing wreath twinkling over it. Harper nudges me with her elbow as she leans in close. Someone forget to take down their Christmas decorations? Nope, Teddy is quick to correct her. The Christmas spirit is alive and well around here. I've got the tree up, too, she announces as she opens the door wide, and we quickly stream inside, where it's perfectly toasty and the scent of vanilla permeates our senses. I don't believe in putting an end to something so beautiful and festive, Teddy says, taking off her coat. That's what's wrong with this world today. It's too eager to kill a good time. True to her word, a tall Christmas tree, strung with white lights and ornaments, sits in the corner. I quickly take in the rest of the place with just as much wonder. The wooden floors are dull. There's a large, fluffy white rug in the middle of the living room, and a flat-screen TV sits just above the tall stone fireplace. A couple of maroon velvet sofas that look comfy enough to swallow you whole take up the living room, along with a couple of matching wingback chairs. And next to that, the dining room and the kitchen all amble into one another. Every bit of furniture in here holds a charming and rustic appeal. Grizzy stretches and gives a lethargic yawn before hopping out of Teddy's arms and swatting the air playfully in front of Acorn. The curly-haired dog dances in a circle around the finicky feline, and Harper coos as she quickly scoops up Grizzy. I can't believe I finally get to have a cat and a dog in my life, Harper says, while burying a kiss into the sweet kitty's forehead. Grizzy's fur is jet black, with smoky gray tips, and her eyes are a searing shade of amber. Harold said he was allergic to animals, and I always suspected he was lying. He never sneezed once when he was around a furry critter, and that alone should have tipped me off. Teddy gives Grizzy a pat. Harper, meet Grizabella. Grizabella? I marvel. Are you a T.S. Eliot fan, Teddy? I ask as I give the sweet cat a scratch myself. That I am, and that's my baby, Teddy announces as she heads for the fireplace. Grizabella and Acorn are best of furry friends, so you don't have to worry about the spunky pooch gobbling up Grizzy for breakfast. Ha! Huh. Morgan laughs, stripping off her coat as well. If anything, Grizzy would gobble up Acorn. That cat knows how to hold her own. Acorn gives a friendly bark as if to agree with her. Harper and I set down our suitcases at the foot of the stairs and peel our coats off as the house embraces us with its warmth. Just behind the cozy living room, the kitchen opens up, and it looks spacious, with its creamy white cabinets and pale stone slab over the island. The appliances are stainless and look restaurant-grade, which makes me anxious to whip something up. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to upgrade our appliances back in Mulberry Lake, but Harold always found more pressing places to park our money, such as his endless collection of toys. Think boats, jet skis, metal detectors, fishing reels, weaponry of every kind, and let's not forget the endless parade of new tires for the fleet of trucks he owns. He always made my desires seem foolish and frivolous, while his were practical and provisionary. I'm sure he thought Charlene was practical and provisionary, too, for that little head of his, and I do mean little. It's Christmas all year round at my house. Teddy says as she waves us over to the sofas. If the rest of this town can embrace the vamps, the werewolves, and the fairies every day of the year, I can embrace a fat man in a red suit who likes to point out I'm on the naughty list after he breaks into my house. Harper snorts, and I shoot her the side eye as we step deeper inside. It's light and bright, and come to think of it, that heavenly scent taking over our senses smells exactly like fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies. 
Hey, Morgan. Harper leans her away while giving Acorn a quick scratch between his ears. Why aren't we staying at your place again? Because you'll cramp my style. She stretches her cranberry-stained lips my way as she says it. Besides, as soon as Teddy heard you were sticking around, she insisted. And I've got the room, Teddy says while starting a fire. And have I mentioned the enchiladas? She sticks both of her pinkies into her mouth and lets out an obnoxious whistle. Sonny and Sadie Jean, come on down. Our new roomies are here, and I want you to meet them. The sound of wild horses trampling over the ceiling ignites, just as two blondes trot down the stairs, whooping and hollering, until they're standing right in front of us with breathless smiles. Sunshine Kelly, nice to meet you. You can call me Sunny, the older of the two chimes. She looks about my age, platinum hair amidst a smattering of gray, and she has that twinkle of mischief in her navy blue eyes. Blue eyeshadow sparkles over her lids, and if I'm not mistaken, there seems to be a dusting of it over her features as well, giving her an iridescent glow with a rather alien-like appeal. It might have been an accident, or it might be the latest cosmetics craze I have no idea about. Either way, her makeup is impeccable, as if she were ready for a night on the town, and judging by that leather number she squeezed herself into, I just may be right. She grabs a hold of the younger girl next to her. And this is my daughter, Sadie Jean Kelly, 16 knocked up and due on the 4th of July, like the all-American princess she is. She points to the younger version of herself, and it takes everything in me not to gasp once I spot her burgeoning belly. Granted, she's not that big, but she's big enough to notice. You don't have to call me Sadie Jean, the girl shrugs our way as her arms remain firmly wrapped around her body. Just Sadie is fine. Nice to meet you, she says as she looks from me to Harper. Her hair is in a whippet of a ponytail. She looks cozy in a pair of purple sweats. She's got a half-eaten chocolate chip cookie in her hand, and her skin shimmers with a glint of iridescence to it, just like her mama's. I bet the lack of sunshine in this part of the world has something to do with their great skin and unnerving blue undertones. I'm a junior at GHS. Harper's mouth falls open. So am I. I'll be there on Monday. No way. Sadie grabs Harper by the hand. I have to tell you everything. The guys are going to go nuts when they see you. Before we know it, the two of them have disappeared upstairs as Teddy navigates us all to the sofas before she takes off for the kitchen. So what's the lowdown? Sunny asks as she plops down next to me with her eyes set wide over mine. I heard all about the body. You're not the killer, are you? No. I'm quick to tell her, just as Acorn hops on one side of me on the sofa and Grizabella on the other. But I'm not saying homicide isn't in my wheelhouse, either, I say, pulling the furry cute cat onto my lap. I'll do the honors, Morgan says. Her husband dumped her for some bimbo he knocked up. She gave him the finger, sold her house, and hightailed it to Glimmerspell. She'll be working for me at the bookstore and staying here at the house until she gets on her feet. Get on your feet all you want, kid. You're not going anywhere. Teddy shakes her head as she sets down a plate of what looks to be those fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies that have been accosting my senses in the very best way ever since we set foot inside. We're gonna have so much fun, you'll never want to leave the Roosevelt Inn. She gives a sly wink my way as she takes a cookie from the plate, and the rest of us do the same. I don't doubt it for a minute, I say, indulging in a bite of the warm, ooey-gooey goodness. My word, this might just be the best chocolate chip cookie I've ever had. What are you charging for rent? I ask Teddy. No reason not to get right to the financial brass tacks. A part of me is afraid Harold is right. I'll never make it in this world without him. I charge in cookies, Teddy says, holding up the last bite of deliciousness in her hand. But you could toss in a savory dish now and again, too. Forget about the cookies, Morgan says, as she nods to Sunshine. 
You'll never guess who asked Billy out for a cup of coffee. I'll give you a hint. He wields a weapon that every girl in Glimmerspell has been looking to get her hands on for as far back as I can remember. Sunny sucks in a quick breath. Elliot Greenlee asked you out on a date? Her eyes bulge all the more. Oh, it wasn't a date. I shake my head before this gets way out of hand. It was more of a threat, after I accused him of murder. Sunny's shoulders hike to her ears. A date and murder? Does Iona know about this? Who's Iona? I ask as Teddy rolls her eyes. The name sounds vaguely familiar, but let's face it, there was no hope of me remembering anyone's name after that poor man took his dying breath while his arms were practically wrapped around my body. Iona Slade, Teddy says with a nod. Elliot's ex. You met her. Hot to trot, chestnut hair, fawn-like features, perpetual glowing tan, hint of darkness in her soul. Just a hint? Morgan teases before she looks my way. Iona and Elliot have a kid together, a son named Royce. He's a year older than Sadie, so I guess a year older than Harper, too. Iona Slade? I gag on her name as I recall Elliot saying it earlier. That was the woman working the register who kept giving me the evil eye, then promptly accused me of murder. Teddy and Sonny break out into titters. Don't feel too bad about the evil eye she was doling out, Teddy says. Iona's got good radar. You're about to steal her man and she knows it. Sonny quirks a brow. And Iona is never wrong about anything. She's as cold, hard, and mean as they come. But if you can get on her good side, you'll have a friend for life. Except for you, of course. She's been trying to land Elliot Greenlee as her official plus one for as long as I can remember, as in marriage. Even though they share Royce, they've never been hitched. Heck, I don't think they were all that serious either. Elliot is more or less your perpetual playboy. Can't hold a man like that down if you tried. He's not only a playboy, he's rich. Teddy spits that last word out like the four-letter word it is. He comes from old money. His mother, Mosselin, owns the Greenlee Dairy at the edge of town. Morgan scoffs. They are not rich. She shakes her head my way. They're hard workers. His mother is sort of eccentric, that's all. The dairy delivers straight to the bookstore, and once in a while she makes the delivery herself, in a full formal gown. But his brother Rex is totally down to earth. Sonny gives a quick nod. I should know. I've been working at Rex's steakhouse now for the last 20 years. I'm headed that way now to drop off a couple of packages to Iona. That's her go-to hangout place after work. Poor thing still lives in the past. She's desperate to get into the Greenlee clan one way or another. She's good friends with their sister, Alora, too. You should come with me. I'll buy you dinner. I get a 15% employee discount, and I'm not afraid to use it. That's very generous of you, I tell her. But I really shouldn't. I think I'm on overload. I hit my head, and, and you're not going to sue me, Morgan finishes before looking to Sunny. That hourglass Marceline gave me toppled over and shattered in a million glittery pieces. Marceline? I muse. Elliot's mother? So I was right. It was his fault, in a roundabout way. Teddy nods. Just don't tell her it bonked you on the head. She might want to have a word with you. She said that hourglass had been in her family for generations. I gasp. What was it doing at the bookstore? Morgan shrugs. She gave it to me after Mabel died. She said she wanted me to think of all the good times we had whenever I looked at it. A groan evicts from my throat. I feel terrible. Don't, Morgan says. I secretly thought it was gaudy. You did me a favor. Come on, I'll buy you dinner at Rex's. You guys go ahead, I tell them. It's Harper's first night in a strange town. I probably shouldn't leave her. Besides, I all but blacked out. I think my body needs a reset. Blacked out? Sunny blinks my way. That's right. Teddy slaps her knee as if it were the best thing in the world. A fire ripped through her and she traveled through time, space, and beyond, 
only to come back and see the ghost of you-know-who. I saw a ghost? I blink back, trying to rewind the day. Honest to God, I could have seen an entire pack of poltergeists. This afternoon was laced with that many delusions. Morgan and Sonny exchange a sober look, but don't say a word. Sonny taps me on the hand. You had a hot flash is what you had. I'm hitting 50 in a few months and I get them all the time. Why do you think I wear clothes that are easy to take off? No sooner does one of those demon breezes hit than I want to dive into the snow naked. Morgan grunts. We all know why all of your clothes have easy exits. Now let's get to Rex's so you can find your mark for the night. But just as I'm set to protest, Harper and Sadie bolt down the stairs, rambling something about taking a bite out of the night by way of a grand tour before dashing out the door. Sonny squints over at me. Are you going to sit here all night with an ice pack on your noggin while those two squirts have all the fun? Or are you going to Rex's with us for a bite to eat? My stomach growls as if answering for me. I guess I'm up for the grand tour too, I say. And in less than ten minutes, we sail out the door and pile into Sonny's minivan to take a bite out of the night ourselves. Here's hoping it doesn't bite back. Six. Downtown Glimmerspell, Main Street to be exact, looks like a powdered sugar dream. Sunny parks in front of the establishment in which we chose to fill our bellies, and we all file out to look up at the large neon sign that reads, Rex's Steakhouse, good to the last bite, blood bank bar inside. Next to the words blood bank, there's a caricature of a vampire with pointed, and might I add, bloodied canines. I realize it's the same sign Harper and I were looking at earlier this afternoon when I laughed off the notion of the vampire lore this place seems to exude. But in the dead of night, with that picture of the vampire, it all adds to the drama and the sinister flare Glimmer Spell effortlessly seems to evoke. What if they were real? The fae, the werewolves, and the vampires? A shiver runs up my spine at the errant thought. I clear my throat. You guys don't really believe in vampires around here, do you? Morgan and Sonny exchange a quick glance before bursting out with laughter. I don't know. There are plenty of people who wish they were, Sonny says as she momentarily sets the oversized shopping bag she's holding down on the snow. It's loaded to the hilt with boxes, which I'm assuming are the packages she mentioned she needed to drop off to Iona. Teddy huffs as she cinches the belt on her coat. Don't listen to these girls. They just don't want you to know the truth. I bet they think it'll scare you off. It's all true. Every last rumor, every last urban legend is true as gospel. I'd lay my beating heart right over a stack of Bibles to prove it. I've got a penchant for werewolves myself. There's just something about a tall, dark, and hairy man that makes me want to howl. And let me tell you, there's not a full moon you won't find me howling at, if you know what I mean. Well, that's something, I say. A part of me finds that last part about the moon completely plausible. If you think that's something, just wait until you see me in wolf form. She wiggles her shoulders and her boobs give a bounce, down by her belly. The dogs of this world find me irresistible. You and me both, honey, I say, as I stare up at the stone-covered building. With its rounded windows and rustic entry, that looks as if someone ripped the doors right off some haunted castle and landed them here. Morgan takes me by the hand. Don't listen to her, Billy. She's just trying to indoctrinate you into her paranormal conspiracy cult. She gives Teddy a wink. I think Billy has had enough to deal with for one day. She swings the door open, and the four of us hustle inside, where it's just warm enough, the rock music blaring through the speakers is a touch too loud, and the scent of fresh grilled steak enlivens our senses. 
A waitress dressed in what amounts to a red and black French maid's uniform nods for us to follow her, and we head straight into the dimly lit establishment. Tables and booths line the periphery to the right. To the left sits the blood bank, a.k.a. the bar, with a flashing sign on the black granite that reads, Fresh AB Positive Pints Available. Lovely, I mutter to myself. The wood floors are stained black, the furniture matches, and the booths are made from tufted red leather. They've done a great job of vamping up the place, but that doesn't seem to have scared the customers away. It's wall-to-wall -wall bodies in here. The tables and booths are nearly filled to capacity. The bar is standing room only, and there's a smattering of people moving and grooving on a small dance floor near what looks to be an empty stage. We're dropped off at a table near the back and take a seat as the waitress passes out laminated menus. Personally, I'm shocked they're not in the shape of a coffin. Sunny leans in. There's Iona. She gives a wild wave and a hoot that pierces over the music until the feisty brunette at the bar glances our way before heading over. Sunny lands the bag of boxes next to Iona and gives it a kick as if enunciating the fact she can't wait to be rid of them. What's in the bag, Sonny? I ask as I casually peruse the menu. Aside from the to-die-for Bloody Marys and the recommended rare steak grilled to bloody perfection, nothing to see here that would turn this place into a B-rated theme restaurant. In fact, everything sounds exceptionally delicious. And judging by the scent coming off the grill... This place knows how to handle their meat. The prices seem pretty decent, too. I guess they'd have to be down to earth to pack in the locals like this. Here she comes, Morgan whispers my way. I'd lay low if I were you. Well, well, well. Iona appears with her hair glowing like a chestnut flame, her eyes dancing with a touch of malice as she looks my way. What are the odds, Morgan? Your aunt cruises into town, and the next thing we know, Professor Barker is toes up in the bookstore. She smirks my way. You didn't happen to know the deceased, did you? I choke in lieu of a response. No, I didn't know the deceased. I mean, I met him this afternoon, but that was about it. Teddy scoffs as she looks to Iona. She was set to have coffee with the man, right before he gave her a detailed tour of his mattress. Bedroom, I correct. But heck, she's probably right. Iona glares my way. I have no doubt the men of Glimmerspell are lining up as we speak to give you a tour of their mattresses. Thanks for my stuff, she grunts to Sunny, who is quick to slide the giant stack of boxes in her direction. I'm a certified coddled chef distributor. Sonny says as she looks over at me. But you'll more than benefit by living at Teddy's. I've outfitted the entire kitchen with the goodies I get for free with all the parties I host. Hey, you want to host a party? You can get a few freebies out of the deal, too. I love the coddled chef's stuff, I'm quick to confess. My neighbor just hosted an event last fall. She made the best cinnamon rolls as quick as anything, right before our eyes. And a pizza that was perfection. I bought the pizza stone, but I lost the metal rack with the handles that went with it. I think my ex threw it out. He had a nasty habit of tossing things out that weren't his if they annoyed him. And oddly enough, almost everything I owned annoyed him. Come to think of it, he sort of tossed me out, too, in a not-so-obvious manner. I shake all thoughts of Harold and his trollop out of my mind for now. Sunny ticks her head to the side. Sorry to tell you, but that was an old model. Our new pizza stones all come with built-in handles now. Apparently, your ex wasn't the first husband to chuck the wire rack. For a second there, I thought she meant that Harold was the old model. And ironic, considering the fact he's my unofficial ex, he sort of is. Morgan pats the spot next to her, and Iona reluctantly takes a seat. What did you buy? Morgan asks Iona as the waitress comes by and lands a glass of water in front of each of us. Iona takes a moment to cast another searing glance my way. 
There's something cat-like about her. She's definitely skittish, wary of me of all people. Believe me, I've never been a threat to anyone, least of all not to a cutthroat, beautiful woman like her. I'm guessing she's about my age, or a touch younger. A heck of a lot meaner, that's for sure. I got the quick chopper and the chopper masher. She blinks a smile my way. So, Billy, how do you like glimmer spell so far? Her eyes widen a notch, and her features harden, as if the answer I've yet to give has already offended her on some level. It's beautiful, I say. I've visited before, but it's been a while. My daughter and I are both thrilled to be here. We're looking forward to building a new life here. Sunny gives a quick nod. Harper is 16, just like Sadie Jean. Those two little minxes have already hit the party scene. Red alert to all the boys. Harper Buttonwood is a looker. I think Sadie has finally got some competition on the scene. My mouth opens as I look at her. I would think, since Sadie is about to have a baby, she wouldn't be too interested in any female competition at the moment. And Harper is definitely not a little minx. I'd correct her, but I have a feeling it's a moot point. Another little minx to contend with? Iona looks amused as she pulls her lips into a contrived smile. I'll be sure to warn Royce. Thankfully, he still listens to his mother when it comes to these things. Warn Royce about what? I give a quick blink. Until it registers, she might just be warning Royce about my sweet little Harper, and a breath hitches in my throat at the thought. Iona leans over her elbows, her wavy hair tumbling over her shoulders, thick and full of life. There's a dangerous energy about her that's unmistakable. Why do I get the feeling I've inadvertently stepped on the toes of the Queen of Mean? If you and I are going to get along, I only have two rules, she hisses. Your daughter stays away from Royce, and you stay away from Elliot. Elliot? I blink back my surprise. As in Detective Greenlee? Yeah, you know, Teddy starts. The one you've got an impending coffee date with? Consider it canceled. Iona doesn't miss a beat. Both Elliot and Royce are off limits. I'd best be going. She rises from her seat and snatches up her bag of coddled chef treasures. I guess I'll see you at the haunted book barn, Billy, she snarls, as if it were the worst news of the night. And I'm getting the feeling it just might be. Morgan, Teddy, she nods. Thanks, Sonny. I'll be putting in an order for the butcher knife set you were telling me about. Her eyes slit my way. I've got a sudden craving to slice and dice. She takes off, and Sunny rubs her hands together. Cha-ching! See what I mean? She nudges me with her elbow. These products practically sell themselves. Her lips twitch. Sorry you had to see the ugly side of Iona on night one. I was sort of hoping she'd hold out for a week at least. I hope she didn't scare you. Believe me, it takes a lot more than that to scare me. I glance over at the woman in question as she stops to chat with a few people on her way out. But I guess she's not over her ex, I muse as Iona dissolves into the crowd. Sonny grunts. With a face like his, it'd be hard to move on. A woman on the dance floor catches my attention and I squint over at her. She has long dark hair and a far too familiar face with full lips and large eyes and I'd recognize her anywhere. That's her, I hiss as I point in the woman's direction. That's the woman that looks just like you, Morgan, the one I saw at the bookstore today. Morgan, Teddy, and Sonny exchange a quick look, and the table grows strangely quiet. Sonny glances to the bar. I think I see a hot hunk of a man who owes me a drink. Teddy, order the usual for me, would you? I'll be back before my dinner hits the table. She takes off, and Morgan and Teddy seem to be having a standoff with their eyes. And if Teddy widens her lids another notch, her eyeballs are going to roll right onto the table. I'm so hungry, I might just snap them up and eat them. What's going on? I ask, 
before sucking in a quick breath. You know about that look-alike, don't you? Oh my goodness, Sunny does too. That's why she did the strange disappearing act. So who is she? I narrow my eyes over at my suddenly far too quiet for her own good niece. You weren't secretly a triplet, were you? I suck in another, far more searing lungful. That's not Mabel, is it? My body flinches because I can't believe I just said that out loud. I'm sorry, Morgan. I don't mean to inflict any more pain on you. Of course that's not Mabel. I bet that woman doesn't even look anything like you up close. It's probably an optical illusion because of the distance. Or it's time for me to submit to my optometrist's wishes and finally get those bifocals he keeps threatening me with. I decide to leave the dim lighting at the bookstore out of it for now. I'm just tired, and I hit my head. I think I'll drown in this glass of water now. I'm about to pick up my glass and do just that when I spot a familiar blonde in a hip-hugging navy dress and boots that I'd die for, or at least consider losing an eyeball over, as she saunters into the place and heads directly for the bar. In fact, if you'll both excuse me, I think I'll go pick up something for the three of us from the blood bank. Ooh, Morgan's eyes light up. A vampire kiss apple teeny for me. Teddy tugs her lips to the side. Make mine a corpse reviver. This place is flooded with hotties tonight, and I'm feeling lucky. Okay, I say, a little unsure of the perverted portal I'm inadvertently about to open for her. I'll be right back. I thread my way through bodies as the rock music blaring from the speakers does its best to assault my eardrums. And there she is, the teacher's pet. The very same teacher's pet who whispered something to the good professor just minutes before he bit the big one and fell into oblivion while foaming at the mouth. Whatever it was she whispered his way was met with a big fat no, and Blondie here didn't look as if she took it so well. Her ego was bruised. Sure, on the surface, it's a weak motive for murder, vain at best, but people have died for lesser offenses, Hey there, I say a little too jovial, just as she takes a seat at the end of the bar, and I slide in right next to her. Judging by that scowl on her face, I'm not the company she was hoping to keep. I met you earlier at the haunted book barn. How are you doing? Terrible, she grunts at the bartender, yet another tall, dark, and brooding man with familiar-looking green eyes and jet-black hair. His lips curve with perverse intent as he looks our way, and I don't need to read the name Rex pinned to his black dress shirt to let me know he was a blood relative of that other brooding detective I met up with earlier. The very brooding stud who was recently taken off the singles table by Glimmerspell's resident wicked witch. A glass of Merlot, Jenny flicks a finger his way. Her hair looks freshly coiled, her lip gloss has been refreshed, and that sickly sweet perfume of hers has threatened to give spring pollen a run for my allergies' money. And you? Rex cocks a brow my way, a slight smile crawling up the side of his face. What's it gonna be, sweet stuff? This is probably the part where I should get my feminist panties in a wad and inform him that I have a proper moniker, although let's be honest, no one has called me Wilhelmina since I was born. And just hearing him say the patronizing put-down made me feel a touch slap-happy and giddy all at the same time. So I let the sexy bartender live to verbally slay another day. A vampire kiss apple teeny and a corpse reviver. His eyes widen a touch, and I wave him off. It's been a long day. I sigh as I land next to the blonde I'm here to question. He takes off, and I turn to my very first shiny, wet-behind-the-ears suspect. I guess you knew Professor Barker pretty well, huh? You could say that, she huffs, while looking down at the counter, as if it were the understatement of the year. We were pretty close, she whispers. You know, professor-student stuff? Her nose turns bright red, and her eyes flood with tears, 
but that angry look on her face suggests something far more nefarious than grief. You dated, I shrug. It's not a big deal. I dated my professor back at Dexter, too. God's honest truth. He taught econ, and I always seemed to have a question to ask him as soon as class ended. One day we were walking and talking, and the next thing I knew we were having dinner. Really? She gives a weak giggle, as if she found some comfort in the fact. Really? I slouch as I recall that time in my life. The semester ended and so did we, but not before things got a little too hot and heavy between the two of us. You know, he seemed okay after it ended, but I wasn't. I thought maybe we had something real, but I guess it was all one-sided. Funny thing is, a friend of mine took his class in the spring, and guess who he was having dinner with next? You're kidding. Her lids hood a notch. Nope. And you know what? He broke her heart, too. I tick my head to the side as I reflect on it. I should have warned her, but I was too angry to see straight. At the time, I actually thought she had stolen my man. Speaking of which, I heard the good professor you were seeing was married. I shake my head at her, as if I were doling out a reprimand. She gives a quick blink to the ceiling. Separated. Besides, his soon-to-be ex has already moved on. She is a research assistant on some anti-whaling ship in Antarctica. She's dating the captain. Believe me, I've stalked her Instapictures account enough to verify this intel. Rex drops off our drinks. It's on the house. He winks my way as he takes off. Ooh, Ginny wiggles her shoulders. Me thinks Rexy likes what he sees. And by likes, I mean he sees you as fresh meat. Her features go flat once again, and suddenly it feels as if Jenny here is an old friend of mine. I saw a little terse exchange between Professor Barker and you while we were taping. I wince. I take it things weren't going so well between the two of you? She scoffs as she blinks up at me with those big doe eyes. It's like you know everything. Okay, so things were rocky, but all he had to do was hear me out, and things could have been great. We could have had a real future together. My heart wrenches just listening to this younger version of myself. I'm sorry, Jenny, I whisper. But if it's any consolation, I sat at a bar much like this one and said those exact same words. Only I wasn't having Merlot. I settled for beer at the time and a bowl full of pretzels. It helped me mull over my delusions. I leave out the fact I wasn't of legal drinking age at the time, and that a poorly constructed fake ID played into my story as well. The irony is, when I couldn't drink, I did. And now that I can, I don't. Turns out I'm a lightweight, who doesn't get a thrill out of getting buzzed or having a hangover the next morning. A silent laugh bounces through her. I guess maybe I'm delusional too, but then again, I'm stubborn enough to believe my delusions. I mean, he said he loved me. I donated to his cause. She blinks back tears as she tosses a hand to the ceiling. I gave him everything. I was ready and willing to give him the rest of my life. All he had to do was go along the path destiny had already given us. What path was that? She glares at the glass of wine in front of her. Never mind. It's a path that obviously I'll still be taking. Odd, since he's no longer here to take it with her. So what do you think happened? I ask. I mean, he could have had a heart attack, but that grumpy homicide detective mentions something sinister may have taken place. Oh, it did. She takes a swig of her drink and lets it sit in her mouth a moment before swallowing it. He was foaming at the mouth and twitching. He either ingested something poisonous or it was injected. We just studied viral toxins a couple of weeks ago. A sinister smile twitches on her lips before she glances my way, and it glides right off her face once again. 
That's right. Someone mentioned he taught that class, The Perfect Crime. It sounds as if the teacher's pet might just prove to be a viper. Did you do this, Jenny? I wince her way as the words leave my lips. Did you implement the techniques he taught you and administer it to the professor himself? Not a line of questioning I'd even think to ask a person, but I've got a goose egg on my forehead that proves I'm not in my right mind, so I go with it. What? Her chest bucks as she shoots back the rest of her wine. I don't think you're feeling too well. I saw you get a decent smack on the head. You should go home and get some rest. She grits it through her teeth as she rises from her seat, and I quickly block her path. Okay, so you didn't do this. And you're right, I got knocked on the noggin pretty good. Did any of your other classmates, or anyone that you know of, have a beef with Professor Barker? She glances past me a moment and sighs. There was Vera. She's a part of the stage crew. You may have met her. Brunette, orange cast to her skin. I frown as the words fly from my lips. I'm not one to put down another woman's choice of cosmetics, but in my defense, Jenny here is about to bolt, and brevity is key. That's her, she swallows down a laugh. You know your friend, the one that dated that professor after you did? That's who I was to Vera. Her entire body sags a moment. She was seeing him first. She wasn't all that thrilled with me, but she hated him in the end. She shudders, as if maybe she did too. And for whatever it's worth, she always took copious notes during class. Her lips pull back with a sardonic smile. I bet if you asked Vera if she did it, she'd have an entirely different answer for you. Her eyes brighten as she looks past my shoulder once again. Detective Greenlee. She bats her lashes his way, and I turn to find the good detective back to his old, tall, dark, and brooding tricks. And by the looks of that scowl on his face... We've bypassed brooding tonight and have gone straight to irate. I'd stick around and answer any questions you might have, but I'm all questioned out. She winks my way. It was really nice talking to you. I wish we met a heck of a lot sooner. You could have saved me a heartache or two. She takes off in a huff, and Elliot Greenley, angry detective extraordinaire, glares at me in her wake. There is something larger than life about Elliot, something unfairly handsome, although that last part is more than obvious, as evidenced by the trail of women ogling in his wake. His eyes meet with mine, and that spark of electrocution jolts through me once again. Holy smokes. Hormones are fun when you're a teenager, but completely useless when you're barreling toward midlife and ready to ax everyone who happens to have a spare appendage dangling from their legs out of your prospective future. What was that about? He gruffs as he sits down in her place, and I join him. His hair is slicked back to perfection. That scruff on his cheeks only seems to have grown scruffier from our last meet and greet. And those eyes? Wow. And to think I haven't even gotten to that body pieced together on Mount Olympus. Too bad the broodmeister was absent the day they were passing out pleasant dispositions. I tilt my head his way. Do you ever smile? No. Rex crops up and answers for him. Is this ornery oaf bothering you? As the owner of this fine establishment, I'd be more than happy to give him the boot. Leave, Elliot says, without so much as looking in his brother's direction because he's too busy glowering at me to do so. Rex pumps out a short-lived laugh. You're lucky I'm busy. He nods my way. You need my help? Just slap him. I'll be right over to finish him off. A laugh bubbles from me as he takes off, but the brooding detective only seems to sharpen his displeasure with me. Why were you speaking to Jenny McAllister? Were you asking her about Professor Barker? He looks more than mildly affronted by the thought. 
Please tell me you weren't asking her questions about what happened earlier. McAllister, I snapped my fingers. I knew there was a question I forgot to ask. Well, then. A groan works its way from him as he expands his chest. He's still dressed in his suit and same dark wool coat, cloaking him like a nefarious shroud. It looks as if we're moving up our coffee clutch. No can do, I say. I was told that under no circumstances was I to cavort with you. I believe the words your ex used were off limits right after she canceled that coffee clatch you were holding out for. My shoulders bounce as I pick up Morgan's apple teeny. For the record, Teddy was the moderator of that wayward conversation. Oddly, it all makes sense. He glances past me a moment, and for a second I wonder if he's in fear of Iona himself. She does have an overall ball buster look about her, so this wouldn't surprise me too much. Can I ask what Jenny and you were discussing? An old ex of mine from when I was a student at Dexter. I thought it was love. He thought it was an even exchange for an A. The louse gave me a B minus. And don't think for a minute, I didn't take that as a personal assault on my performance. The one outside of the classroom. Okay, so on occasion in the classroom, too. What can I say? I was pretty adventuresome during my college years. But nevertheless, we parted ways, and I went on to find another man who would make that hard lesson the professor taught me look like child's play. And speaking of which, have I mentioned my ex as having a child with a co-ed from Dexter? Ex-co-ed, but I've spewed enough details for now. His brows hike a notch. Sounds rough. My ex found her arousing. He frowns a moment before the hint of a smile creeps up one side of his cheek. And something in that simple action sends a heat wave pulsing through me. I don't want to talk about your ex, he rumbles. And I get the feeling you don't either. He leans in a notch. Did Jenny mention anything about Professor Barker? Maybe. I lift the apple teeny in my hand as if I were toasting him. But if I gave you all the answers, that would be cheating. I think maybe you should answer a few of my questions first. You're not the investigator here. My case, my rules. Ha, huh. then it's my prerogative to keep those little morsels Jenny just spilled my way to myself. Something tells me she won't be opening up to you the way she did me. I cringe a moment. On second thought... I have a feeling she'd be more willing to open up to you in ways she wouldn't for me. A warm rush pulsates through me once again, and this time it has nothing to do with the handsome brute before me. A wave of lava-like heat runs up my chest and fills my head with enough pressure to make me wish it would explode. The floor beneath my feet begins to pulsate, and I spill Morgan's apple teeny as I do my best to land it on the counter. It's happening again, I whisper in a panic. Excuse me, I pant as I land hard on my feet and stagger into the crowd. I have to get out of here, I hear myself say, and my voice sounds as if it was lost in a cavern. The room begins to spin, and in a moment, I'm not standing in a crowded theme restaurant that caters to vampires. I'm right back at the haunted book barn. 80s music hums from the speakers, and a smattering of customers is milling about. I spot a woman who looks suspiciously like me standing in the cafe, and she turns my way only to gasp and let out a little yelp before running off to the left out of my view. The haunted book barn isn't nearly as congested as it was this morning before the taping. And how did all of these people get in here anyway? I closed the place down with Morgan. Oh, my word. My entire body shivers at the travesty overtaking my newly warped mind. Acorn gives a friendly bark as he spots me and runs right my way. Oh, Acorn, I don't think I'm in my right mind anymore, I say giving him a quick scratch over his curly little head. Miss Buttonwood, a deep voice rumbles from behind, 
and I turned to find Elliot Greenlee standing there, wearing a dark suit, same dark coat, and same spiced cologne that sends my hormones right back to high school. I spoke to Jenny this afternoon. He frowns as if it were my fault. She says that if I have any questions, I should defer to you. She says she spilled everything she knows the other night at the bar. One of you is about to be interrogated. Care to guess which one? What? I shake my head at him. We just, we were at Rex's, but the bookstore is closed. And did you say the other night at the bar? A thought hits me, and I suck in a never-ending breath. What day is it? He takes a moment to scowl at me. Monday. Crap on a crap cracker, I say, looking around until I spot Teddy Roosevelt giving me the side eye from the counter, and I speed her away. You know something, don't you? I all but attack the not-so-innocent gray-haired granny as she does her best to tiptoe out of my reach. No offense, Billy, but I don't think this is where you belong at the moment. We'll talk later. I can't get involved in this. She runs off for the kitchen before I can stop her. I don't belong here at the moment? Of course not. I belong at Rex's Steakhouse. I should be at that bar, throwing a drink in that obnoxious detective's face, and then maybe doing the same to myself. Rex's Steakhouse, I whisper, as the floor bounces beneath me once again. The room spins, and a snowy night appears around me as I find myself right outside of that questionable establishment where this entire nightmare began. A woman with an all-too-familiar face comes my way, and I sigh with relief. Oh, Morgan, thank God. This night has been pure insanity. You will never believe what just happened. I think I will, Billy. She gives a forlorn smile. I'm sorry to say your insane night's not over yet. She closes her eyes a moment too long, and when they open again, they're glowing a magical shade of lavender. I'm not Morgan. I'm Mabel. 7. A ghost? The words stumble from me as Morgan grips me by the shoulders. Sonny drove us straight back to Teddy's place as soon as I got Morgan on the horn and initiated the world's biggest freakout. Mabel, or her ghost as it were, did a disappearing act as soon as I began to howl like a loon. Don't worry. Morgan shakes her head like maybe I should. You're not alone. I can see my sister too. What? I glance past her at Teddy and Sonny, who were looking at me wild-eyed as if I were a feral cat they were unsure of. We can't see her, Sonny shakes her head. Teddy and I aren't transmundane like Morgan, but if we hold her hand, she acts like a spiritual conduit of some sort, and we can listen in on whatever Mabel has to say. Transmundane? I give my niece a questioning look. She gives a quick nod. Apparently that's what I am. It's what they call people with special supernatural abilities. Our ability to see the dead falls under the subcategory of supersensual. And Busy, the woman I met in Cider Cove when Mabel was murdered, she's telesensual, which means she can read minds. There's an entire slew of abilities that fall under the transmundane umbrella, and I'm guessing you have a few abilities that fall under there, too. From what I hear, these abilities can run in families. Oh, sweet Lord, what about Harper? I wail. No offense to Mabel, but I don't think teenagers should be talking to the dead and having them talk right back. If she so much as whispers the fact she's garnered the ability to communicate with the other side, it might cost her a few friends, not to mention secure her a 72-hour unwanted vacation in a locked psychiatric unit. She may not be transmundane, Morgan shrugs, but let's focus on you right now. You said you saw Mabel outside of Rex's place right after you went to the bookstore. She gives a slow nod as if trying to connect the pieces. That's right, I say. 
On the way back to the house, I told them all about my little jaunt in time, and all three of them agreed that I have some serious issues with my noggin. Sonny suggested a CAT scan. Teddy suggested I get every nook and cranny checked out pronto, and right about now, I don't think that's a bad idea. I clear my throat. I was talking to Elliot, and boy did he get me good and steamed. Then, well, I think a genuine hot flash hit me. And the next thing I knew, the floor was giving way, the room was spinning, and I was standing in the haunted book barn. Elliot was there, too, and we exchanged a few words. I asked him what day it was, and he said Monday. That's when I saw you, Teddy, and you basically told me that you couldn't get involved. The three of them exchange a glance before Sonny shakes her head. Morgan? Sonny swats her on the arm. You'd better take her to that woman you met inside her cove and see if she can figure this out. Morgan nods my way. She's right. Get some good rest tonight, Billy. I should be done with what I have to do at the bookstore by noon, and then you and I are headed to Cider Cove to the Country Cottage Inn to speak with Busy Baker Wilder. She'll know exactly why you're getting your days and nights mixed up. Infants get their days and nights mixed up, I'm quick to point out. I'm getting my time continuums confused in the worst way possible. A horrible thought comes to me. Morgan, if I disappear for good one day, you'll have to promise me you'll take care of Harper as if she were your own daughter. Lord help her if Harold and his hussy are all she's got left in this world. You don't even have to ask. She pulls me close, and I wrap my arms around her. But you won't disappear. The only place you'll be going anytime soon is to Cider Cove tomorrow afternoon. Sonny gives a mournful smile. I'd go with you, but I have to work crazy hours tomorrow. Rex says I'm the eye candy that keeps his customers coming back for more, and he's not wrong about that. Teddy steps in close. And just try to keep me away. Don't worry about a thing, Billy the Kid. I'm heading to Cider Cove with you. We ride at noon, she cheers. We ride at noon, I echo, without nearly as much enthusiasm. It's hard to get excited when you have so much to worry about, like getting lost in the Mesozoic era. And I think my hair is unruly now. Just wait until I'm stuck in a cave with a pterodactyl for a decade or two. This is going to be way worse than the time I caught my hand in a car door. Far worse than my quasi-natural delivery with Harper. And only a little better than catching Harold plowing a co-ed in our bedroom. Just when I thought things were going to turn around for the better, things took a turn for the worse. Seeing ghosts? Time travel? And Harold said I had no skills to speak of. At least I get the satisfaction of proving him wrong. Although this one time, I wouldn't have minded him being right. I'm stumped. Busy Baker Wilder the woman who Morgan and I were hoping would have the answers to everything, says as we sit out on the back patio of the Country Cottage Cafe, sipping hot cider while staring out at the majestic Atlantic. It turns out Busy, a cute twenty-something brunette, is the owner of the Country Cottage Inn. The inn is a large blue stone building covered in ivy with a smattering of cottages spread over the property, which belonged to Busy as well. There's a blue cobblestone path that snakes around the main arteries that surround the inn, and the back of the place butts up to a sandy cove, where currently Acorn is running loose with Busy's dog, Sherlock Bones, a cute little red and white freckled mutt, and her cat named Fish, a black and white tabby. But the biggest surprise is the cinnamon-colored labradoodle, a doppelganger to Acorn, who just so happens to be a pup from the very same litter. Acorn's sister is aptly named Cinnamon, and the four of them are running to the shoreline and back, having the time of their little furry lives. Apparently, Busy can not only read the human mind, she can read the animal mind as well, and they seem to understand her too. Why couldn't I have that superpower? 
I would have been happy to spend each day having a perfectly sweet conversation with Acorn. Lord knows I'm an expert at speaking to dogs. I was married to one for nineteen years. Busy chuckles. Sorry, Billy. She wrinkles her nose. But I inadvertently just listened in on your private musings. Trust me, my abilities aren't all they're cracked up to be. I don't always like what I'm hearing. And not only that, I feel terrible invading people's privacy like that. I think time travel sounds amazing. She grimaces a bit when she says it. I mean, as long as you're staying close to home and are just moving a few days in and out of the present. So far, so good in that department, I say. But I have no control over where I go next, or if I go at all. Georgie Connors, the woman who Busy introduced as her good friend, is here with Morgan, Teddy, and me. Georgie has shoulder-length gray hair that rivals Einstein's in its fullness and rather possessed body. She's about 80-something and is wearing a fun pink and green tie-dyed kaftan. Teddy is seated next to her and is clad in hot pink from her coat to her boots. I'm starting to suspect a theme here. Georgie has been nothing but a hoot from the moment we met her. And believe me, had we met under other circumstances, I'd be slapping my knee at every word that's come out of her mouth, much the way Morgan and Teddy have been doing. Georgie isn't transmundane, but she's aware that Busy and Morgan are, and has promised to keep my secret as well. Busy was present the day Mabel was murdered, right here in the cafe behind us. Apparently stumbling upon dead bodies is something Busy does on the regular, and she uses her telesensual abilities to track down the killers as well. Georgie has detailed out a few of their cases, and they're all as equally grisly. Busy told me all about the day that Mabel was killed, and it broke my heart hearing her detail the story to me, but I had asked her to, because I genuinely wanted to know. I can only imagine it's hard to hear. Busy looks pained just saying the words, but I guess you can find comfort in the fact that you can see her again. It will comfort you, Morgan adds quickly, just like it has me. And Mabel wanted to apologize for scaring you right out of your skin last night, but she said she was worried for you when she saw that you appeared from out of nowhere. I guess she was in the right place at the right time. Busy leans in, and you said that day-hopping dilemma happened along with a hot flash. Georgie waves off the idea. That was no hot flash. That was a power surge. You're a phenom, Billy. She nudges Busy with her elbow. We're in the presence of greatness. She nods my way. You're a time traveler. But here's the thing. You're not any good at it. I can attest to that. I don't mind at all debasing myself, because it happens to be true. And I don't want to get good at it either. Georgie wags a finger my way. You take that back, Missy. God chose you for the job. This is your calling. Just like Busy here was called to snoop around in other people's minds, you were called to hopscotch in and out of yesterday and tomorrow. Busy winces at me. She's sort of right. Well, okay then. It's hard to digest that my higher calling has to do with running around in time continuums. But then who am I to question the man upstairs? Teddy grunts my way. Word to the wise. You'd better take good care of yourself, or your little harper might end up with front row seats to the cheating chauvinist show. If I were you, I'd get checked out under the hood from head to toe. You're basically the kid's only parent at this point. You may as well strive to arrive at a ripe old age in prime condition. Good thinking. I'll make every doctor's appointment known to man. Who knows what they'll find wrong with me. But I guess I can't fix what I don't know is broken. Hey, a thought comes to me as I look to Morgan. Do you think it's any coincidence that I started drifting in and out of time on the very same day I got hit in the head with an hourglass? Morgan and Busy exchange a look. I don't know, Morgan says but I do know that I don't believe in coincidences anymore. Busy nods. Something is definitely up. For sure, I say as I take a deep breath, 
and soak in the surging Atlantic. Let's hope whatever it is, it's a temporary situation. I look to my niece. Who did you say gave you that hourglass again? Mercilyn Greenlee, Morgan says, while cutting a glance in Teddy's direction. Elliot's mother, I nod. The one with the dairy farm. Well then, it's strange how the good detective has wiggled his hot self into this predicament, even if it is in a roundabout way. Busy's brows jump. Interested in the hot detective, are we? Teddy claps her hands and hoots. Knew it! She smacks Morgan on the arm. You owe me ten bucks. It was five, Morgan flatlines, and we were betting on the same side. She takes a moment to frown my way. Iona won't like it, but I say to heck with Iona. Let's get you some of that good greenly lovin'. I'll take a hard pass. I shoot Busy a look without meaning to. I'm not interested in Elliot that way. He's a man, and I'm angry at his kind. Besides, I'm just getting used to not having to share the remote or being criticized at every turn for every little thing. And I'm especially getting used to not finding a naked co-ed in my bed with a man I pledged to spend the rest of my life with. Teddy nods. And don't forget the fact he gave her your engagement ring. Georgie grunts upon hearing it. The man was a dog's anus. It's a gift from the universe that you're rid of him now. She lifts her hot cider. Amen to that, I say, lifting my hot cider as well. And soon we're all toasting to the fact I'm down one dog's anus in life. Let's hope I don't go on to become a collector of such offensive body parts. And the only way to do that is to put a moratorium on men until kingdom come. I sigh at the thought of spending an eternity alone. So I've been meaning to ask. Busy bites down on her lip as she looks to Morgan and Teddy. What's going on over in Glimmerspell? I took Georgie, my sister and mother, out that way last month, and we couldn't believe how enchanting the town was. But all that lore. Georgie leans in. Vampires and werewolves and fairies, oh my. She fans herself with her fingers as she sings the words. But boy, you haven't been kissed until you've been ravished by a werewolf beneath a full moon. Teddy moans and fans herself in the very same fashion. Tell me about it, sister. Busy shakes her head. It's not just lore, is it? Of course it is. I look to Morgan with a look that says, don't you dare rock my world with another paranormal terror. I don't think my mind could take much more. Morgan goes rigid a moment, as if assessing her position on it. Let's just say there's a kernel of truth to just about any lore. She offers Busy a peaceable smile before her eyes flit back to mine. A kernel of truth. Why does that sound an awful lot like baby steps to a much harder truth? Vampires and werewolves and fairies, oh my, is right. I'm still stuck on ghosts and time travel. Someone out there has the answers I seek. And I have a feeling that someone is Marceline Greenlee. But considering the fact she's Elliot's mother, I'm not all that anxious to run in her direction. It's probably best I stay away from anything or anyone that has to do with that obnoxious man. Griffin Barker's dead body comes to mind. Last night... Jenny suggested that Vera Henley might have had something to do with it. Vera would be my contemporary counterpart in that twisted, perverted professor scenario. Maybe I'll track down Vera and have a word with her. That sounds like the perfect way to get my mind off Elliot Greenlee. And ghosts. And time travel. And vampires, werewolves, and fairies. Oh my, indeed. Something tells me I'd better schedule those doctor's appointments ASAP. And I just might have to add a shrink to that list, too. 8.
Bright and early Monday morning, I drop both Harper and Sadie off in front of Glimmerspell High. Last night I told Sonny not to worry about driving Sadie to school and to sleep in, since I was headed in that direction anyway. But she just laughed it off and said she hasn't given Sadie a lift in years. One of Sadie's boyfriends always does the trick. I wasn't laughing. Considering the fact Sadie is due to pop out a bundle of joy on the 4th of July, I have a feeling I know what other tricks her boyfriends, yes, plural, are up to as well. And once the drop-off was complete, I hightailed it right to the haunted book barn. I was up half the night, wondering how this day might play out. It's the day I traveled to last Saturday night at the bar, and I ruminated over every detail of that short jaunt through time and space. All I know is that I walked in, saw my present self run and hide, which I totally plan on doing. Then Elliot snuck up behind me and mentioned that he spoke to Jenny, right before he said he was going to interrogate me. I asked him what day it was, skedaddled my way to Teddy, then poof, I was gone. There is a very morbid part of me, anxious to see myself do a supernatural disappearing act. The haunted book barn is brightly lit inside, compared to the dank winter wonderland just outside its door. I'm not sure how Morgan does it, but it's nice and toasty in here, despite the cavernous size of the structure. The scent of fresh brewed coffee competes with the heady scent of paperbacks, and something about that intoxicating combination gets my blood pumping more than Harold could ever hope to do. Morgan got here at the crack of dawn to get the cafe up and running, and I spot her behind the counter as she gives a friendly wave. Are you nervous? Her eyes widen a notch with mischievous glee as I head in her direction. I won't lie, Billy. I wish I had the ability to do what you do. I won't lie either. I wish it was you, too. I stuff my purse and my coat in the back office, and by the time I get back, Morgan is standing in the kitchen in duplicate. Judas Priest! A wail of a scream jumps from me, just as unexpected as the poltergeist before me. Sorry, Mabel winces as she glides my way, without her feet ever touching the floor. Her dark hair floats like tendrils behind her, as if she were underwater, and there's an overall eerie glow that surrounds her entire being. I just thought maybe you would be ready to see me now. I don't know if I'll ever be ready, I say, lunging for her and pulling her in for a warm embrace. Oh my goodness, I can feel you. Yep, she bounces with a laugh as she backs up a notch. I'm not sure why, but I can feel as solid as I like whenever I want. But look at this. She pokes her arm right through my stomach, and I gasp. I don't feel a thing. The laugh of a mad woman escapes me, and then a thought hits me, and I stop on a dime. You haven't been around Harper lately, have you? Nope. I thought we might cross that celestial bridge together. She removes her arm and floats right back to her doppelganger. Girls! I coo at the sight of them. I'm so glad you're back together. I can't imagine the pain of a separation like yours. You've been best friends since utero. And I've missed you so much, Mabel. I sniff hard as hot tears roll down my cheeks. Hey, you wouldn't happen to know anything about my newfound time-traveling quirk, would you? Mabel wrinkles her nose. I don't, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. Come to find out, this town is loaded with people who know things. Morgan cuts her off. Oh, look, a crowd just walked in, and wouldn't you know, Iona and Teddy are both late. I'd better tend to the register. Mabel, please finish getting the stuff together for the accountant. I have an appointment with him later this week. My mouth falls open. Mabel, are you still working for the haunted book barn? That's right. I sort of put the haunt in haunted. She gives a little wink my way before glowering at her sister. We'll talk. She floats right through the island, through the counter, and about a dozen tables laden with books. Just witnessing the supernatural sight makes me feel a little queasy. 
Don't go green on me. Morgan gives me a quick embrace. You've got this, Billy. You're going to be okay, just like Mabel turned out okay. She takes off, and I don't have the heart to point out. Mabel turned out dead. Maybe that's what's wrong with me. I bit the big one as soon as I saw Harold take a bite out of Charlene. It makes total sense. Not only am I not good at time travel, I'm not good at dying either. Figures. As if on cue, my phone pings, and it's a text from the co-ed muncher himself. Spoke to the realtor. The house is getting some serious action. This is your last chance. You can still move back into it. Let me know and we'll pull the cord. Harper deserves to be with her friends. Don't be selfish. Don't be selfish? I practically gag on the words. He's got a lot of nerve. A female voice chirps from behind, and I jump, only to find Teddy peering over my shoulder. She's clad in turquoise from head to toe, and it's a good look on her. Tell him it takes a selfish jackass to no one. I would, but that equation makes me a jackass, too. That's why I hate the new math. She shakes her head as we head to the front of the cafe and help flush out a few customers. So, have you seen yourself yet? She hitches her head to the door. Nope. I think you getting behind that register has something to do with it. Why didn't you say so? I'll boot scoot over right away. She starts to take off, and I catch her by the elbow. Teddy, I saw Mabel this morning. She said something about Glimmer Spell being loaded with something before Morgan cut her off. Is there anything you think I should know? She squints over at me. I think you know what I know. Just don't overthink things. That's probably why you're hopping all over next week. You've blown a gasket in your noggin. Teddy, what things do you think I know? Would you look at that? Her body jerks toward the nearly empty entry. I've got to help with the rush. She takes off, and I pull out my phone and do a quick search on Glimmer Spell. But all that comes up are a few advertisements on the shops down the street, including one for the haunted book barn. I have to scroll three full pages before I can find anything on that paranormal lore, and even that's pretty scant, and exclusively related to the restaurants that are propagating the rumors to begin with. Once I serve up a few more customers, I head over to the tables in front of the registers to the very table laden with books on the supernatural. There's a smattering of books on werewolves, more than twice that on the fae, with their sparkling covers that look as if they were sprinkled with pixie dust, and a handful on the bloodsuckers of the bunch. Vampire Hunter's Companion The ornately carved black leather-bound book with a picture of a red rose catches my attention once again, just the way it did the other day, and I pull it forward. The scent of warm musk takes over, and I look up to find Iona glaring at me. Her lips curve a notch. Careful, you read that and they might come after you. So they're real? I whisper, suddenly interested to carry out a conversation with the woman who brazenly threatened me the other night. Her expression goes from glowering to mildly amused as she hitches that thick, dark hair of hers behind one ear. She's donned a pink and black tweed blazer over dark velvet pants and makes me feel like a slacker for my choice of accoutrements, my go-to sweater and jeans. I've always been a no-fanfare kind of gal, and Harold never seemed to mind. On second thought, he may have minded. What do you think? Iona is quick to lob the question right back at me. Rumor has it bloodthirsty beasts have been hunting humans in this area for ages. Some think a serial killer is on the loose, looking to ride on the coattails of those rumors. There's been an uptick in corpses as of late. I'd watch my back. You never know who the killer will pick off next. It might just be you. She bleeds a dark smile before heading back to her post at the registers. Something tells me I should be marking off these threats with tally marks. 
I give the tome in my hand a quick once-over before setting it on a stack of books that make a small tower in the middle of the table. There was nothing new it had to offer. Want to fight off a vampire? Invest in a crucifix and holy water. A wooden stake works well in a pinch, and that whole garlic thing was wishful thinking on some poor unsuspecting human's part. Another crowd moves over to the cafe, and I quickly outfit them all with their choice of pricey lattes, and once they get settled, I pull out my phone and look up the murder ratio in this part of Maine. Silent Glen, Moonlit Falls, Mulberry Lake, Cider Cove, Edison, Winchester County, and Glimmerspell seem to be a hot zone as far as homicides are concerned. Cider Cove is where Busy lives. She mentioned she's been hunting down killers now for a while, and that she uses her telesensual abilities to help bring down the criminals. So I'm not all that shocked to see Cider Cove on the list. Psst, Billy the Kid, Teddy hisses from the register. I look up in time to see the Saturday night version of myself walking into the bookshop. Oh, my word, I wail, and no sooner do the words leave my lips than that wayward version of me locks eyes with mine. The two of us freeze solid for a moment before I hightail it to the kitchen and peer out from behind the wall. Elliot walks in on her heels, follows her over to the book table, and I can see him watching me, her. His eyes ride up and down the back of my body, as if he were eyeing me like a snack. Okay, so that might be wishful thinking. His ex is ten times hotter than any woman I know, and I'm pretty sure the only thing he wants from me is answers, per his exact words. The Saturday night version of me jerks before walking over to Teddy, and Teddy quickly tells her to get back where she belongs in not so many words. Teddy and I watch as the old version of me quickly blinks out of sight as the air around her grows blurry. Snickerdoodle, I yelp. I gave up expletives when Harper was born and have been casting creative curses ever since. Snickerdoodle is a long-time favorite, and it happens to be one of my favorite cookies, too. I look back at Elliot who seems to have missed the whole show because he's preoccupied looking at the vampire hunter's guide that I set on the Tower of Books earlier. To think, if I didn't do that, he might have seen me doing my impersonation of thin air. Holy smokes. I hustle off in his direction. Detective Greenlee. I force a smile as he shoots me a look. I see you've changed your mind. My chin juts out. Oh, right, that whole Jenny interrogation thing. I make a face at the book in his hands. Some light reading for you? No. He lands it back in its proper position where I found it this morning. I'm not interested in things that go bump in the night. I'm interested in tracking down a killer. What do you know about Jenny? She was having an affair with the perverted professor, and things were going south but that's old news. She says Vera Henley is the original woman scorned. She's the next suspect on my list. On your list? His brows hike a notch, and I greedily take in the far too handsome man before me. There should be rules about ladening one human with so many comely features. It's not fair that no matter how much my mind demands to dislike him, my hormones make my heart go pitter-patter. Fine. A few other parts of me are jumping as well. That's right, my list. In fact, I was just about to track her down and see if we could have a quick word. And much like Jenny, I don't think I'll have a problem getting Vera to open up to me. Do you want to know why? Because I'm a woman. Women trust other women. Even though, sadly, there's another woman at the other end of the dumpster fire that took down my life... But that's neither here nor Harold, I say, as I try to head for the kitchen, but he quickly blocks my path. Billy, you can't go off questioning suspects. Eventually, you might wind up questioning the killer, and if he or she gets wind of the fact you're on to them, you might be the next person they jab with a needle full of poison. 
Oh, what kind of poison? I'm guessing we're talking something far more caustic than your run-of-the-mill nightshade, something that works quickly, something that attacks the nervous system and stops the heart on a dime. I shrug. I've been doing a little light reading myself. It's true. I was up all night researching what toxin could cause someone to drop dead on the spot and foam at the mouth. Detective Greenlee is right back to glowering at me. Ricin, he says, loosening up a bit. He tips his head back, as if he were tossing out a dare on some level. Ricin? Jeez, I hiss. That's one toxin you don't mess with. Now you're catching on. And the killer is someone you don't want to mess with either, Billy. I bet they've got more where that came from. And believe me when I tell you it's a painful way to die. Now, he straightens. How about you tell me everything you know about Jenny and Vera? And I'm looking for far more details than you laid out. Then you can get back to the cafe. My eyes lock over his as I examine this sexy beast. I mean sexist beast. Good grief. He's not only hijacked my hormones, he's taken my brain hostage as well. No. I bite the air between us. Vera is mine. Go find your own shiny little suspect to play with. And before you go throwing any of that obstructing justice malarkey my way, Vera and I are just a couple of friends looking to catch up. Morgan walks this way, and I lift a finger in her direction. Morgan, any idea where I can find Vera, the gal that mic'd me up the other day? She squints past me. And for a fleeting moment, I'm afraid I just posed the question to thin air, as far as Elliot Greenlee was concerned. But thankfully, it's not Mabel's ghost I'm talking to, it's Morgan. Note to self, double and triple check next time in an effort to avoid looking like a lunatic. Let me see. Morgan whips out her phone, and her thumbs dance across the screen. No less than six seconds go by, then she glances back my way. Stage crew is hosting a birthday lunch for one of its members at Wolfgang's Bistro today. What a coincidence, I say, quickly working off my apron and crumpling it into a bowl. It just so happens to be my lunch hour. Morgan opens her lips as if to say something, but decides to shoot Elliot a dirty look instead. Fine, I'll have Teddy cover the cafe. Take your time. She takes the apron from me, as I manufacture a smile for the morose man before me. I guess I'm going out for lunch. I shrug his way. I hear Wolfgang makes a mean sandwich. That's funny, he says, no smile. I was heading in the exact same direction. 9. Wolfgang's Bistro is a dank, dark cave with moody music pulsing from the speakers. There's an abandoned stage to the left and a bustling bar to the right. Between the two is a sea of tables with a decent number of patrons, most of which are buzzing with conversation but it's the sharp scent of a fresh grilled burger that has my appetite on full alert. It looks as if we beat the party to the punch, I say, as a blonde with a set of French braids that run down to her shoulders licks her lips as she looks to Elliot. This special is a roast beef sandwich with au jus. Her lips extend when she says that last word, until it looks as if she's blowing him a kiss and I have no doubt she is. Sounds good, I tell her. Same here, Elliot says, as he casts his monstrous bad mood in my direction. And for a brief moment, I wonder what he looks like under that dark coat, under that padded jacket that gives him the body of a linebacker. The blonde with the braid skips off, and it's just the two of us again. I didn't drive down with him, not that he offered. I would have walked if the snow wasn't piled five feet in every direction, but I've never been a fan of hiking through frozen tundra. What did Jenny say? He cuts right to the chase. She was into the naughty professor. Apparently he was seeing Vera first, 
and soon both Jenny and your buddy Griffin ended up on Vera's bad side. I'm guessing it made her edgy, but edgy enough to kill? You tell me. You're a woman who's been scorned. Are you edgy enough to kill? That horrific scene that took place in my old bedroom bounces through my mind, and a growl expels from me. Darn right I am. I shrug. Or at least I was in the moment. But I had the good sense not to do it. I bite down on my lip. Okay, so I may have wrapped my hands around my soon-to-be ex-husband's neck, but despite the fact he's still kicking, I glower at the floor because a part of me wishes I could kick Harold a few more times. Elliot's brows swoop low as he considers this. I'm sorry you went through something so terrible that you're still going through it. How are things going with that? Something in me softens when he asks the question. As well as can be expected, the house I thought I'd live in forever is on the market. My ex and his trollop are engaged. Have I mentioned she's wearing my old engagement ring? Oh, that's right. I keep bringing it up, don't I? I tease because I distinctly remember telling him about it at Rex's the other night. And of course they're expanding their family. He gives a long blink. I can't imagine how you must feel. Well, that's honest of you. And you know what? I don't think I've figured out how I feel yet either. Harper is so upset she hasn't said two words to him in months. At least, not any I can repeat. His lips twitch side to side. What about your family? His eyes bore into mine, and there's something about the way he looks at me that sears me from the inside. And just like that, I'm right back to envisioning how he looks sans the suit and the attitude. In my mind's eye, he's dropping his jacket, unbuttoning his shirt, and dropping his... I have a mother! I sit up with a start and clear my throat. She loves to travel. The waitress lands a couple of ice waters onto the table, and I take a few gulping sips. I have a sister, too. She's pretty much lost in space. She worked as a management consultant, and once she was laid off, she sold all her belongings and became a beach bum in South America. I think she weaves baskets for tourists in exchange for cold, hard cash. She takes a bartending job when she can get it. She says she's living her best life. Never married, no kids. I used to think she was wasting her life. And now I'm starting to envy her. The idea of a smile stretches across his face. I'm starting to envy her, too. What about you? Morgan mentioned she gets the milk for the cafe straight from your mother's dairy farm. You don't strike me as a dairy farmer yourself. Any siblings other than Rex? More than I care to count. And you're right. The dairy business isn't my calling, but my mother understands that. Before he could go on, a scruffy-looking man with curly dark hair, a short beard, and a wily gleam in his amber eyes comes over and takes a seat next to Elliot, forcing him to scoot over a notch. Gentry James. He holds out a hand and I shake it. I'm the owner here. Pleasure to have your company. What the heck are you doing wasting your time with this guy? He shakes his head with a touch of disappointment, as if he meant it. My mouth opens, and I'm about to say something when the man wraps his knuckles over the table. I've got a steak on the grill I'm about to burn. Come by more often, without him if you can. He jumps from his seat and shoots Elliot with his fingers. You owe me money from that game last week. He takes off, and a laugh gets caught in my throat. What's this? I tease. The good detective betting on a game? It's all in fun, he scowls until you lose. Our food arrives, but neither of us dives in. Elliot, I lean in. Can I call you that? What else would you call me? His lips flicker with a hint of a smile. What can I do for you, Billy? A spear of heat spikes through me when he says my name, and my lips part, but nary a sound comes out. 
I clear my throat. I did a little research, and this part of Maine has had its fair share of homicides, not to mention disappearances. His lips purse. I'm aware. But if safety is your concern, I wouldn't worry about it. What happened the other day at the book barn isn't representative of Glimmerspell. Both you and your daughter can breathe easy. He reaches over and rests his hand over mine. I want you to feel safe here. An electrical spark jumps from him to me and travels straight up to my lips. And now they're somehow convinced they should be in on the action. A breath hitches in my throat as I glance down at our conjoined hands, and he quickly pulls away. And I also want you to rest assured that the sheriff's department is more than well equipped to bring Griffin Barker's killer to justice. He nods as he says it, as if trying to convince me. I realize you're here to speak to Vera, but I'm imploring you not to do it. And if I do? I shake my head at him. And if you do, I might be moved to arrest you. On what grounds? My voice hikes a notch while looking at this brute who wields a badge. On obstruction of justice, he flatlines, as if he doesn't believe it himself. Look, as much as I appreciate the fact you've taken an oath to serve and protect, I've spent the last 19 years listening to a man tell me what to do, and I don't think I'm at the place in my life where I can take your suggestion to heart. Besides, Vera and I are practically old friends. She stuck her hand down my blouse when she miked me and touched me in places I haven't been touched in months. I cringe once the words leave my mouth. That didn't come out right. Elliot starts in on some diatribe about how following the rules isn't just for my safety, but for the safety of others, when a rush of heat floods from my chest to my head in the space of a nanosecond, and suddenly I'd give anything to rip off my sweater right here in this booth. I reach out for my ice water, but the seat beneath me begins to bounce, and the room begins to spin. Oh no, I whisper as I look up, and Elliot's face seems to be rocking back and forth. I can't let him see me up and disappear into thin air, not when he's sitting here hoisting his authority around. If he's threatening to cuff me over a simple hello to an old questionable friend, then who knows what lies in store for me for dissipating into the atmosphere. Hold that thought, I say. I think I lost an earring. I slip from my seat down under the table, and before I can fold myself in half to crawl to the ground, the scenery changes, and I'm standing in the haunted book barn once again. Music gently flows from the speakers, and the store is crowded to the hilt with a bunch of twenty-somethings running around in Dexter sweatshirts. The haunted book barn is bustling much the way it was the first day Harper and I arrived in town. This is so freaking cool, a familiar voice says from behind, and I turn to see Harper and me stepping into the store with our eyes full of wonder. It's the day of the murder. This is perfect. I can solve the crime simply by keeping an eye on Professor Barker. Hey, maybe this is my calling. I'm a lean, mean, time-traveling, crime-fighting machine? Okay, so maybe not lean, per se, but I'm definitely mean when I have to be. I quickly jump behind a small crowd as Harper stalks off toward the back and I spot the old me watching Griffin Barker and the petite redhead having what looks to be a verbal tussle as the woman tugs at his tie. The old me takes a moment to frown at the two of them before taking off for the book table, but I'm not interested in the old me. Instead, I tiptoe my way over to where Griffin and the redhead are still going at it. But no sooner do I get close enough to listen in then the redhead gives him a firm shove and takes off deep into the crowd. No sign of her coming at him with a needle, not that I think he was given the lethal injection at this point in time. There you are, a woman chimes, and I turn to see Vera Henley stalking on over, 
with her orange glowing skin and her hair parting in greasy chunks. She bypasses me, and I take a step toward the wall of books behind me and quickly pluck one off the shelf, pretending to be interested as I do my best to keep an eye on them. You're not avoiding me, are you? Her tone is curt as she looks to Griffin, and there's a definite tension brewing between the two of them. Griffin pulls his chin back, his features suddenly stone cold. I'm not doing this with you here, and I ask that you not utter a word regarding the things you've learned about my life. This is for me to handle, Vera. I don't want our past to complicate my future. Her chest bucks as she holds back a laugh. You don't have a future, Griffin. In fact, she takes a moment to glance back at the crowd. Life as you know it ends today. Her hand presses to her stomach before she stalks off like a woman on a mission. A woman on a deadly mission. A breath hitches in my throat as the book I'm holding bounces out of my hands. Griffin turns my way, and our eyes lock for a moment. A seductive smile creeps up his lips as he gives an affable nod my way before taking off into the crowd himself. At least he's consistent. I'm about to take off and find a place to hunker down and watch the murderous show when my body floods with heat. The ground begins to bounce and the room begins to spin. So much for getting to the killer nitty-gritty, I pant. Here we go again. The scenery changes, and I find myself on all fours, underneath a booth with far too many legs underneath it for my comfort. The caustic scent of a steak left on the grill a moment too long alerts me to the fact I'm right back in Wolfgang's bistro, right back on the floor. I'm guessing right day and time, wrong table. I attempt to crawl out, and whack my head on the table as I struggle to get up, and much to my horror, four perfect strangers stare back at me. What the hell? One of the men barks out. Oh my goodness, I bet she's a thief. An older brunette quickly grabs her purse and does a quick inventory of its contents. No, no, I say as I stumble backward. I was just looking for an earring. I glance to my left, and there's no sign of Elliot, but I see my purse unattended, so I trot over and quickly snap it up. As I turn to leave, I see the exact greasy-haired, orange-faced, surprisingly jovial woman knocking back shots at the bar, so I head on over. Vera! I try my hardest to match her enthusiasm as I scoot in next to her. We met the other day. You're a friend of Morgan's? You mic'd me up before her show? Oh, right, she says, plucking at her blouse as if she were cooling herself off. And judging by the sweat beating at her temples, I have no doubt she hopes to do just that. How's business down there? She winces. I feel bad for you guys. It's one thing to film a show about a murder and another to have one happen on the grounds. So far, so good regarding business. I knock on the granite counter as if it made a difference. How are you holding up? She flinches. Fine, I guess. I've only had Professor Barker for one semester. Nice try. But Griffin mentioned he knew you well. I don't mind one bit manufacturing the lie. He did? She blinks back as the bartender slides another drink her way. I nod as I double down on the lie. I just so happened to be standing next to the two of you while you were greeting him. That is, if you could call it that. Greeting him? She surveys the ceiling a moment, as if reliving the conversation between them, and takes a quick breath. Don't worry, I say, glancing over my shoulder. I won't say a word, although let's be honest, that exchange between the two of you looked a little abrasive as were her words. But if she's the killer, and I suspect she is, then she might be moved to bolt before an arrest can be made. Oh, she tips her head back. That whole conversation isn't what it looked like. 
She blows out a hard breath. Any hint of jubilation has long since left her face. Griffin had a secret. He thought it had the power to destroy him, she shrugs. He might have been right. What was it? I lean in a notch, suddenly very interested in what this secret might have been. She shakes her head. It's not my secret to tell. She closes her eyes a moment too long. If you really want to know what that conversation was about, you'll talk to a woman by the name of Sylvia Arden. She was there that day, surprisingly. She shakes her head as if she were still in disbelief. She's a redhead on the shorter side. If it looks as if she's holding a grudge, it's because she is. She shrugs as she cradles the shot before her. The redhead? I saw her there that day. She was having a rather intense conversation with Griffin, as were a lot of people, evidently. She nods. Yep, they certainly had things to get heated about. And how about the two of you? I may have heard a rumor that you knew him a little better than you're letting on. A choking sound croaks from her. Okay, so we did. So what? We were over a long time ago. She glares at the amber bottles that line the bar in front of us. Vera, I lean in. Years ago, when I was in college, there was a professor. A tall, dark, and brooding shadow enters our midst. Not that shadows can brood, although I'm fairly certain his is perfectly capable. And here you are, Elliot says with a note of exasperation in his voice. How the heck did you get out from under that table? He glances to Vera, and his eyes widen a notch. Never mind. He glowers my way. Can I speak with you a moment? Not if there's a pair of shiny silver bracelets involved in that conversation. Vera moans. Oh, honey, if you know what's good for you, take the cuffs. Do you mind? Elliot says tersely my way. Yes, I mind. I say with a note of frustration. I was just having a perfectly good conversation with Vera here. About? His brows rise a notch, and I can practically see the handcuffs spinning in his eyes. About the coddled chef's winter line, I say. Sonny is doing so well with it, I thought I'd give it a go myself. And you've ruined what would have been a perfectly good sales pitch. Oh. Vera pulls her purse strap over her shoulder as she rises from her seat. I'm actually in a dorm that doesn't even allow a hot plate. Tell Morgan I'll see her soon. If you'll excuse me, there's a party starting without me. She darts past me, and I rock back on my heels as I look to Elliot. Well, detective, I think we're getting closer to our killer. My killer, he says without hesitation. A spiced breeze blows our way as that comely yet woman-hungry man I met the other day pops up. Sheriff Cash Archer, I say, as a smile expands over my face. I can't help it. The last time we met, Sheriff Archer seemed to have the ability to infuriate the big oaf before me, and whoever infuriates Elliot inadvertently pleases me. Besides, what's not to smile about? Sheriff Archer is a hot commodity, and I'm willing to bet those bedroom eyes he's giving me have escorted quite the harem of ladies to his private chambers. Well, well. He looks from Elliot to me. Is this a thing? No, Elliot and I answer in unison, and that frustrates me all the more. Good. Sheriff Archer sheds a greedy grin, his eyes never leaving mine. I can't get over how much alike Elliot and Cash look. With the exception of their eye color, they could be mistaken for twins. Brothers, in the least. His dark hair is slicked back, he has dark stubble taking over his face, and his blue eyes shine like beacons. Horny beacons, but I don't see any women complaining. In fact, there's an entire cluster of co-eds and waitresses combined, panting in this direction at the two of them. Elliot is just as scrumptious to look at, but to know him is to get lost in a fury with him. 
You'll have dinner with me tomorrow night. Sheriff Archer picks up my hand and kisses the back of it. Does that work for you? I give a sly glance to Elliot, and he looks fit to kill. Oh, that works beautifully for me. I can hardly wait. Perfect. Then it's a date. The first of many, I'm sure. Fay Gardens at seven? I can hardly wait. He nods my way before darting out the door. I guess I have a date. A tiny laugh bubbles from me at the thought as I look up at Elliot. Who knows? Maybe Sheriff Archer will be the one who finally spills the secrets this town is holding so close to the vest. And I don't doubt Glimmerspell has them. And you can bet your shiny little pistol we will be discussing Griffin Barker's murder. I can't wait to share my suspects with him and all that I've gleaned thus far in my investigation. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to the haunted book barn. I start to take off, and Elliot blocks my path a moment. Billy. His brows swoop low, and his lips form a perfect knot. Our eyes lock, and those electrical impulses he has the power to invoke are doing things to me that should never be done in public. Oh, who the hell cares? It's happening, and it feels like nothing I've ever felt before. It feels as if I'm alive, in that enchanted state of falling out of my mind. It feels like magic. He lifts his chin a notch. Have a good rest of the day. He stalks off in a fury, and I take a much-needed breath. Of all the people in the world, I wish I had never met Elliot Greenley. I don't appreciate the way he makes me feel out of control, and that's one thing I'm determined to harness now that Harold is out of my life. Control. One thing is for sure, after Griffin Barker's killer is behind bars, I never want anything to do with Elliot Greenley again. A shock of heat rips through my body, as if maybe I do. Good thing I'm headed to see every doctor known to man tomorrow. It's about time my body starts to align with my mind. I'm taking control of everything, and those hostile hot flashes that have the power to banish me to eras unknown will be the first thing I'm going to lay dominance over. I hope... 10. There's nothing we can do. Dr. Goldman, the general practitioner I've seen for years, breaks the news to me as I sit helpless, and evidently hopeless, in a paper gown. They're hot flashes, Billy, he says as he rolls my way on a stool with his white wreath of hair and genteel smile. It's your time, but don't worry, they won't last forever. He grimaces a moment. Speaking of not lasting forever, Harold came in to see me last week. So what do you think? What do I think about what? You know, his head bobs back and forth. What we discussed. What exactly did you discuss? I tip my ear his way. If there's something wrong with Harold, I sure as heck want to know about it. I'm his... I stop myself before saying the word wife. Sorry, Billy. You'll have to ask him yourself. It's against doctor-patient confidentiality for me to tell you. I've already said too much. He taps his finger to his nose. You know what? Regarding you, there's a great gynecologist in town that's been stirring things up with some alternative treatments these last few years. He's been an all-star every year so far in his practice. He might be able to suggest something. Tell you what, I'll do what I can to squeeze you in with him. Our offices have been working closely these past few years, and he's a good guy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Believe me, if he wants me to make a smoothie out of the entrails of rats, I would jump on the chance. You have no idea how trying these hot flashes have been for me. Each time one hits, I want nothing more than to rip off my clothes and jump in the snow. He chuckles. I'd watch the public nudity if I were you. They've locked people up for less. Trust me, 
I'm building a pretty good insanity defense. We wrap it up and I hit the dentist, followed by the optometrist, and finally end up with what Dr. Goldman billed as an emergency appointment with the all-star gynecologist, all of which are in my old stomping grounds of Mulberry Lake. Dr. Goldman's nurse gave me directions, and as soon as I check into the new office, I see the doctor's name for the very first time. Dr. Greenlee? I mutter, mostly to myself, right after I sign in. That's right, the receptionist chirps. He's the best of the best. Are you having a baby? No, I flatline. Normally, I would have eaten up the inadvertent compliment. I mean, young women have babies, and I'm 45. Apparently a young 45, at least to this poor girl, who I'm guessing has a severe visual impairment brewing. Doesn't matter, she says. He's still the best of the best. She squints over at me. For whatever it is you need to see him, fill these out. She thrusts a mountain of getting-to-know-you forms my way, and I quickly find a seat among a flurry of pregnant women in the waiting room. I don't get past jotting my name down on the very first form, then a woman with enough sugary perfume to suffocate all of mankind plops down next to me. Billy Buttonwood? She coos. I glance her way and gasp. Ah! My entire body bucks at the sight of her. Harold's teen dream Charlene chortles herself into a conniption, and her boobs and her tiny belly bounce with the rhythm. Great. Just perfect. I get to enjoy an impromptu meet and greet with my blonde dits of a nemesis right before I get felt up by what I'm guessing is some relative of Elliot's. Most likely his father. So twisted. What are you doing here? Charlene tosses a hand my way as if we were old friends. Funny. I'm asking myself the very same thing. Her blonde curls are tight and heavily shellacked into place. Her false lashes are far too long, and the one on the left is crooked. Her lips are a shocking shade of pink, and she's donned a navy dress with a metallic sequin look to it. She screams insanity from head to foot. And honest to God, Harold should be arrested for assaulting a person with obvious behavioral issues. On second thought, I think they both suffer from the very same malady. Oh, you'll never guess what happened this morning. She touches her hand to mine, and I glare right at my old engagement ring until she pulls it away as if yanking it from a fire. Anyway... Harold called the realtor and pulled the house off the market. What? I squawk so loud, all of the women in the room, and most likely half the fetuses here, too, turn in my direction. What did he do that for? Well, he tried to buy it, but the realtor told him it would be easier for him to buy you out than go around the block trying to get a loan for a house he already owns. Buy me out? As in, he's keeping the house? We're keeping the house, she corrects. We'll have to add on. I don't know how you managed with that thimble of a master closet. And that kitchen? She wrinkles her nose with disgust. I need marble counters and a walk-in refrigerator if he expects much out of me in there. I don't think he expects much out of you in any room but one, I say as I sag in my seat. Hey, did you know that Harold saw Dr. Goldman about his big problem last week? My eyes bulge in anticipation of the big secret I might just wiggle out of her. Her hot pink lips fall open. What problem? Well, if Harold's not telling you, neither am I. I do a once-over, up and down her body. But if I were you, I'd have the doctor check you for STDs while you're here. What's the student transfer department have to do with this? Oh, never mind. It's evident Charlene here doesn't have enough brain cells for me to toy with. 
It's cruel on some level for me to even try. I'd better get these forms filled out. I'm about to get straight to plowing through them, but Charlene taps her hand over the page I'm working on in a blatant disregard for my sanity. Those tiny microscopic diamonds from my old engagement ring wink over at me, as if they're cheering her on. Speaking of paperwork, you won't believe where Harold and I are going for our honeymoon. My mouth falls open. I have zero idea how she connected those dots, but I'll bite. Middle Earth? No, silly, she slaps my arm. The Bahamas. He's got a great deal on a seven-day cruise next September. That's just the right time for me to leave the Rugrat after I have the baby next July. And guess what? We're gonna need a sitter. Good luck with that, I say, getting back to the paperweight on my lap. Word on the street is the vet has an entire row of kennels available, but I keep that tidbit to myself. Harold says that Harper will do it, but I think you're the woman for the job, Billy. What? I squawk once again. My God, I had no idea the blonde ditz was about to unleash a verbal shock and awe campaign on me. Had I known, I would have set my hair on fire, just to get the horror in my life over with quicker. That's right. She gives a definitive nod. You did such a great job with Harper. I have no doubt you'll do a number on my little sugar booger. I'm going to do a number on someone, all right, I mutter. The answer is no, a hard no, and I'm declining for Harper as well. Not only will she be just out the gate in her senior year, but you don't even know Harper. Please, at least meet the people you're about to hand off your spawn to. I don't know why I just doled out rational advice, other than the fact when I hear her baby was kidnapped by hippies, I won't feel as if I didn't do my part in an effort to stop it. She snorts. I know Harper plenty. I stalk her on all of her social media sites. And you can tell her I think her new boyfriend is looking mighty fine. Ooh-wee. She fans herself with her fingers. That Royce Greenley sure is a looker. He takes after his uncle, if you know what I mean. Royce Greenley? I gag on the kid's name. That's Elliot's son. And per Iona, he's off limits too. Perfect. Although this is most likely just a high school fly-by-night relationship. Harper hasn't been serious about a boy for longer than three hot minutes. And according to my watch, she's about to give Royce Greenley a kick to the mighty fine curb. The nurse steps out of the door that leads to those coveted stirrups and shouts, Billy Buttonwood? I've never been happier to be myself, I mutter as I speed her away. Wait, Charlene calls after me. We leave the first week of September. Be sure to mark it on your calendar so you won't forget. I shut the door behind me and force myself to forget all about Charlene, Harold, and their tropical honeymoon on the spot. I hope the whole ship gets swallowed alive by a hurricane. Okay, that was mean, and perhaps a tad too homicidal, but I can't help it. My hormones are off the chain, and so am I by proxy. It takes 20 minutes for me to complete the paperwork and change into a gown constructed from tissue paper. There's a nurse in the corner studying her phone and seems to be tuned out to the events occurring around her. Can't blame her. I'd have nightmares if I had to supervise these dicey appointments day in and day out. I lie back and open my legs wide, per Elliot Greenlee's command. Okay, fine. Per Warren Greenlee's instructions. But wow, he's a looker in his own right. Same dark hair and green eyes but oddly he looks less like a sibling to Elliot than Sheriff Archer does. And that's odd, considering they're not blood-related. So you know my brother? He gives a short yet jovial laugh. 
I couldn't help but ask the obvious, and so far, Dr. Greenlee is far friendlier than Detective Greenlee can ever hope to be. I've already filled him in on my night sweats and hot flash horrors, sans the details of the actual time-traveling horror, and he's surmised I'm fairly normal. I'd love to correct him and bring up that whole dancing my way around the calendar willy-nilly thing, but I don't have time to squeeze in a shrink this afternoon. A deranged grin flickers on his lips as he sits on a stool and his face pops up between my knees. Excuse me, my hand may be cold, he says as he begins to poke and prod. And in my mind's eye, I've just gone to places with Elliot that I've never planned on heading. My word, I squirm. I can't get rid of the visual of Elliot's body hovering over mine. And judging by that naked chest, he doesn't have much on. Yes, I do know your brother. Both of your brothers, actually. I met Rex, too. My voice squeaks as he stands and takes off his gloves. I mean, we're acquaintances, that's all. I just moved to Glimmerspell. I see. He smiles as he says it. So far, I've lost track of all the smiles Warren here has given. And yet, can count on one hand how many Elliot has doled out. And still have four fingers and a thumb left over. And how do you like it there? Meet any interesting people? He steps over to me, pulls the gown apart at my chest, and begins slowly massaging my boobs with his hands. My apologies again if my hands are cold. You're fine. An image of Elliot doing this exact same thing, albeit with a little more vigor, flits through my mind, and I take a quick, gulping breath. I'll go easier, he says. No worries. And yes, I've met plenty of interesting people. I'm pretty sure that's all they've got over there. He bounces out a laugh as he closes up my gown once again. You'd be correct. I've got my first date in just a couple of hours, and I'm actually pretty excited about it. Excited that Elliot will be grinding his teeth at the thought. Or at least that's the delusion I choose to believe. You don't say. Who's the lucky guy? Cash Archer, I say, sitting up. He's the sheriff down in Winchester County. Dr. Greenlee's features go rigid. Does Elliot know about this? Funny you should ask. And honestly, that is kind of funny. But not in the ha-ha way. He does. He chuckles at the thought. Well, then you kids have fun. A smile blinks over my face. I'm sure we will. And for the next few hours, I wonder what Dr. Greenlee found so funny. 11. Fay Gardens is located across the street, more or less, from Rex's steakhouse and a hop and a supernatural skip from Wolfgang's Bistro. The exterior stone walls are covered with large blue butterflies, and it looks ethereal. The windows shine an iridescent shade of blue, as if they were made of candy. The sign on the door boasts of dinner, dancing, live music, and magic, and already I'm looking forward to having a good time. Inside, it's warm, dimly lit, and the scent of grilled burgers and french fries holds the promise of a delicious meal. After my vaginal meet and greet with Elliot's brother, I ran home, showered, primped and primed myself, squeezed into a little black dress Sonny lent me, then promptly dashed right back out the door. Harper wasn't home, so I couldn't grill her on her feelings about Royce Greenlee just yet, but I'll cross that Iona-shaped bear trap when I get the chance. I have news for Iona Slade. We Buttonwood women don't take orders from anyone. Although I happen to agree with her on a couple of points, two of them being stay away from Elliot and Royce. I don't need an ornery jerk like Elliot in my life, and Harper sure as heck doesn't need to join the Fourth of July baby spectacular. She doesn't need boys right now. She needs books and maybe some cuddle time with Grizabella and Acorn. 
I hopped into my minivan and drove straight down to Main Street. Cash offered to pick me up, but that reeked of real date material. And as much as this might be a real date, I like the idea of having a quick bite with a new friend a little bit more. Even though Harold plowed right into his next relationship, in the sexual sense, don't think it's lost on me that Charlene's last name is Plowman, either. Well, I'm not so gung-ho to dive into the deep end of the dating pool just yet. And to be honest, if Elliot wasn't standing right there next to me when Cash threw out the offer, I might not have accepted it. But here we are. In fact, here he is indeed. Cash Archer is chatting with the hostess, a hot twenty-something with big eyes, long lashes, and bloated lips, who just so happens to be drooling over his sleeve as if she knew what item she wanted added to her private menu. Billy Buttonwood. Cash beams that megawatt smile my way, still dressed in his tan sheriff's garb, with his gun tucked into his holster for all to see. His dark hair is slicked back, his blue eyes shine with a smile all their own, and as friendly as he seems, there's still something about him that screams, I'm going to eat you. I'll admit, that has me a bit wary. He offers me a warm embrace, as if we were old friends. And that's the nice thing about this man. He has the capability to truly make me believe that's the case. Cash is what my mother used to call a charmer. My grandmother, who was a little more to the point, would have called him a playboy, or a jackass. To her, they were interchangeable. But right now, I appreciate the warmth he's exuding, so I go with it. Billy. He pulls back and examines me from head to toe. You look stunning this evening. Yeah, well, it's not every day I get to pair snow boots with a cute little dress. I slap my thigh as if to enunciate my point. The dress is on loan, and I'm not brave enough to trick through the snow in heels. Ah, oh, well, you're a wise woman. Please excuse my uniform. It's been a long day, and I didn't want to keep you waiting. Don't apologize. Women love a man in uniform. I make a face at the hostess. Besides, I feel safer with you around already. As a new resident of this fine town, I always want you to feel safe. He grimaces a moment and looks decidedly like Elliot, so much so that if I hadn't seen them together, I would have thought Elliot was pulling my leg. The hostess comes over with little wings splayed out behind her ears via a headband, a silver-blue dress with matching high heels, and little angel wings around her ankles as well. Her skin shimmers a strange shade of light blue, and there's a glow about her, as if she wasn't human at all. She reminds me a lot of Sunny. And now I'm wondering if that blue sparkly powder dusted over their faces is some new trend I'm not aware of. She waves us over and we follow along as she leads us into an expansive room comprised of dark rock walls with ferns and exotic greenery stemming from it every which way. A bona fide waterfall streams down the eastern wall and up front there's a stage that looks more like a cave with a live band crooning out country music. We're seated off to the side of the dance floor and there's a tiny basin of crystal blue water near the wall to our left, filled with lily pads and a sparkling fountain. The hostess takes off, and a redhead pops up in her place, with miniature wings next to her ears, a bigger pair over her back, along with the requisite iridescent blue dress on, and I gasp at the sight of her. It's the redhead I saw talking to Griffin Barker the day of the murder. It's the exact redhead Vera told me to speak with, the one with the secret, Sylvia Arden. Huh. It's a small homicidal world after all. Welcome to Fay Gardens, she winks over at Cash, and yet this blatant flirting doesn't bother me for some reason. My name is Sylvia, and I'll be your server. The special tonight is the bacon western cheeseburger with our house dressing and onion rings. 
You can add a soup or salad for just a dollar. Soup of the day is clam chowder. The burger sounds great, I tell her. I'll take it. And add the chowder, too. I've never been the girl who tries to impress her date by way of grass clippings. Not that this is a date, but still. I'll have the same, Cash says, and we order up a couple of drinks before my next suspect takes off for the kitchen. Sheriff Archer, I grin over at him. I have to say I'm glad you asked me to dinner. Cash, he corrects, and I'm happy to hear it. He squints my way. Why do I get the feeling this has little to do with me? It doesn't, but don't let it pop your ego. You're hot stuff, and you know it. I wink before leaning in. That waitress. I saw her having a tense conversation with Griffin Barker on the afternoon he was killed. She's next on my list of people to question. His brows hike a notch. You're investigating? Darn right I am. Griffin fell right on top of me before he bit the big one. Iona Slade outright accused me of doing the deadly deed. Don't think I'm going to wait until that bumbling detective solves this case. A sharp laugh comes from him, and instantly I feel major regret for referring to Elliot as a bumbling detective. I clear my throat. Okay, so I don't know Detective Greenlee well enough to accuse him of not being up to par as far as his career goes, I'm quick to add. But I'll be honest, between the corpse my marriage had become and the literal corpse that landed at my feet, I needed a distraction, and this case has provided just that. A smile curls into his cheeks. Don't worry, your secret is safe with me. Elliot and I exchange as few words as possible. I like your initiative. Most people wouldn't have been so eager to talk to others about the case, let alone the suspect. How are you liking Glimmerspell? I love it so far. My daughter loves it too. Maybe a little more than I want her to. She's in high school, a junior, and already has a good friend by her side. Sadie Kelly, Sonny's daughter. I just don't want Harper to get boy crazy on me and forget about her studies. She's on the college track, and I'd like to keep her that way. He shakes his head. Tell me about it. My son, Aiden, is a senior, and I have a daughter, too, Molly. She's a junior like your daughter. I'm sure she'll get to know Harper soon enough. Oh, that's great. I really wanted Harper to make new friends. You know it's not easy switching schools mid-year. All the cliques have already formed, and I was so afraid she'd hate it. But knock on wood, so far so good. So, do you have any leads on the case? Nothing significant, but it's in Elliot's hands. He frowns as he says it. Why do I get the feeling you and the good detective aren't slinging high fives back at the precinct? Because you're intuitive, and you're right. We're not friendly, but we don't have to be. We're simply colleagues who tolerate one another. You sure look alike. It means nothing. He growls out the words, and I get the feeling their rift is more than skin deep on many levels. But I'm not in a hurry to put him in a bad mood. Are you divorced? I wrinkle my nose at the odd question. Sorry, that's not exactly the icebreaker I should have gone with. But you mentioned the kids, and here we are, so I'm assuming you don't have a missus in the wings. Divorced thirteen years. Married six. Morella Landry. She reverted back to her old surname. She works at her father's farm, Landry Farm to Table. I can relate on that whole old surname thing. I was a boobé, and you can guess how many times that's been pronounced the fun way. He chuckles on my behalf, and I join him. It's easy with cash, and it feels as if a genuine friendship is forming. Cash, can I ask you something? Anything. No sooner does he get the word out than our burgers arrive, fresh off the grill, sitting in a halo of crispy golden onion rings large enough for me to wear as bracelets. Sylvia grins down at us, mostly at Cash, as those tiny wings clipped near her ears flap back and forth as if they were the real deal. If you need anything at all, and I mean 
anything. She postures herself with her chest out toward the gun toter among us. I'm your girl. I'll need something. I flatline her way, and she frowns because, let's face it, I'm not the one she's interested in entertaining with her heaving bosom. But not until later. And what I'll need is a brief conversation with her regarding that little angry powwow she had with Griffin on the day he was murdered. She all but flips me the finger as she takes off, and I lean toward Cash. I spoke with Vera Henley, and she let me know, little miss, I'm your girl. I hitch my head Sylvia's direction. Has a secret that concerns the deceased. His lips twitch my way, and I can tell you're determined to winnow it out of her. Remind me to put you on payroll. He reaches over and takes up my hand. Now, what were you going to ask? I won't lie. It's a bit strange having a man I hardly know take me by the hand, but since my hormones aren't exactly demanding I jump into bed with him, it doesn't feel wrong either. It feels safe and perfectly platonic. Here's hoping he's getting that same vibe. I'd hate to disappoint him if he thinks he's getting a bite of buttonwood pie for dessert. Glimmer spell. I whisper the town's name as if it were a deep, dark secret. And it just might be. There are rumors which I'm sure you've heard. Rumors that center around vampires, werewolves, and fairies. I lean in hard when I say that last word, in the event one of the blue-skinned fae roaming the premises hears me. His chest pumps with a silent laugh, but he's not smiling. Billy. He sighs as he looks me right in the eye. I could tell you many things, some of them completely untrue, just to steer us away from the subject. His lips twitch side to side as if he were considering his options. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you the truth. The real question here is, are you prepared to handle what I have to tell you? Oh, yes. I blurt the words out just as a flash of heat hits me all at once. Every muscle in my body freezes as I pause a moment to evaluate the situation. I've had a handful of these devilish heat waves over the last few days, and nary a tick of the clock did I skip. In fact, I soaked my nightgown twice last night to the point I had to get up and throw on something else. Here's hoping this is just one of those run-of-the-mill hot flashes whose end result is nothing more than a trickle of sweat running down my décolleté and making me wish I could run outside and stick my feet into the snow. But the floor beneath me begins to bounce, and the scenery in the room begins to blur. Oh no. I give Cash's hand a hard squeeze before pulling away. Whoa, Billy, are you okay? I'm fine, just fine. I glance to the bar and spot a familiar brunette who happens to share my lavender blue eyes. I think I see my niece, I pant. I'll be right back. I stagger in her direction, only to find it's not the living niece, but the not-so-dead one. Mabel. I go to grab a hold of her arm and push right through it. You chose a fine time to do your best impersonation of thin air. Sorry, I can't seem to control it at the moment. My spirit just seems to know what to do and when to do it, she says, laying a hand over my back. Wow, Billy, you're a mean shade of green. Are the burgers that bad tonight? No, I'm having a spell. I think I'm about to exit the building in a very untraditional manner. Oh my goodness, she trills as she does her best to navigate me to the side of the bar. And just as soon as I step behind a potted silk banana tree, everything around me goes black. The last thing I hear is Mabel saying she'd call Morgan for backup. Poor Cash, I say as the scenery comes into focus, and I find myself in a room full of steam. The sound of water running fills my ears, I'm looking at navy subway tiles along the wall, and a pool of water is at my feet.
I look up, and to my horror, there's a man running his head underneath a shower nozzle. A very naked man, with a pretty decent hind end, might I add. A howl escapes me, just as the naked man in question spins around and lets out a brief howl of his own. Jeez, he shouts, and then in an instant we both freeze solid. This isn't just any dripping wet naked man standing before me. Elliot? I gasp. Billy? He looks perfectly stunned. He looks pretty perfect, too, but that's neither here nor there, considering the fact he's about to arrest me for breaking and entering, and probably a few more offenses I'm not entirely aware of. How the hell did you get in here? He gives me the once-over with that wild, stymied look in his eyes. I... Oh, God. About a dozen options run through my mind, none of them viable. I don't know. I toss my hands up as he switches off the water and snaps a towel off the door before wrapping it around his waist. I was on a date with Cash. Poor Cash, I whimper. Elliot inches his head back a notch, as if he were suddenly interested in what I might have to say. It would figure. His hatred for Cash trumps the fact he's got a loon materializing from thin air in his shower. What am I saying? Elliot Greenlee is a hot commodity. I bet he's had his fair share of women popping into his shower unannounced. This was probably one of his few solo endeavors, as far as water closets go. So you were on a date? A sly smile curves his lips. But dear God, that water beating off his hair, off the scruff on his cheeks, down that chiseled, chiseled chest. Wow. He's got biceps and triceps and lats and a bona fide six-pack. Maybe eight. Heck, it might be twelve. It's safe to say Elliot Greenlee is put together in the exact manner God intended. Me, on the other hand, I'm a hot, sweaty mess, wishing I could join the birthday suit party and run a vat of ice-cold water over myself. With all this humidity, I can feel my hair suffering the Einstein effect as it rises to the ceiling. Did you say something? I blinked back. Never mind that. What day is it? Tuesday night. Why? Are you trying to kick off your weekend a little early? I don't see why not. It's not a bad start. He's back to frowning at me as he helps escort me out of his shower. An ample venue that could easily host a party of twelve, and I'm betting it has. All right, Billy. What's going on? he says as he leads me through his palatial stone-covered bathroom and straight into his royal chambers. The walls are covered with dark gray damask wallpaper. A king-size bed sits in the middle with a navy comforter, and a gray couch sits off to the side. The faint scent of his cologne warms the air, and a suit is lying over a recliner in the corner. There's a big screen on the wall in front of the bed, and a dresser to the left of that. The entire room is the size of a small city, and from the expansive windows just beyond the sofa, I can see a city light's view of what I'm guessing is lower glimmer spell. It's safe to say he doesn't live a stone's throw from Main Street, and I might run into a few transportation problems as I try to make my way back. He lands us on the sofa and we sit facing one another, with him air-drying with that towel cinched precariously around his waist, and me wondering how in the heck I'm going to get out of this pickle. Did I hear you say you were on a date with Cash? That amused smile is right back to flickering on his lips. Let me guess. You smelled the ridiculousness on him and decided you wanted to end your night with a real man. His grin grows wide before dissipating altogether. Nice try, buddy. Actually, we were having a nice time. We were sitting there having a conversation about our kids, about my investigation, which he is in complete support of. 
I pause a moment to give him a wry smile. And then I asked about Glimmerspell. He said he had the answers I was seeking, but that the real question was whether or not I was prepared to handle what he had to tell me. Bastard. He says it under his breath, and lower than a whisper, as if it wasn't meant for my ears at all. And did he tell you? No. I started in on one mean dizzy spell, and... My mouth hangs open as I look into his clear green eyes, and that electrical jolt jumps from him to me once again. I don't know that I want to out myself as the town lunatic so quickly to a handsome man such as this, but seeing that I ended up inviting myself to watch him as he bathed, I don't think I have a choice. Okay, here's the deal. I've already been checked out by an entire slew of doctors, and they've all come to the same conclusion. I'm more or less fine. It's just that I get these weird hot flashes. I wince. And I know they make me sound ancient, but I don't feel ancient. I mean, I'm not running out and stocking up on prunes and oatmeal just because I'm on the runway to my fifties. I leave out the fact that I've had oatmeal for breakfast for the last twenty years. With steel-cut oats, what's not to love? But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm basically as confused as to how I landed in your shower as you are. And that's the God's honest truth. His brows swoop in. Elliot sits back, relaxed, with his chest expanding as wide as a football field. That towel wrapped precariously around his waist is slowly working its way open, and I'm half expecting it to fully expose him at any minute. Not that I haven't already seen the goods. As far as dangling appendages go, Elliot is well equipped to frost any woman's cookies. And he may not be frosting my cookies, but he sure as heck melted my butter. Now, where was I? He nods as if he suddenly had the answers to both of our burning questions. Let me guess. He grunts. You walked right through the front door. Royce has a habit of leaving it unlocked. He likes to remind me that we're not all that valuable, but I keep telling him he's inviting trouble. And thanks to me, you'll be able to say I told you so. I'd laugh if it weren't so painfully true. Do you think I could borrow your phone? I'd like to call Morgan for a lift back to Main Street. I gasp at the thought. On second thought, I don't have anyone's phone number memorized. I give a hard blink. Jeez. It's kind of paralyzing when you think about it. I mean, I still remember my house number from when I was a kid, back in the Stone Ages, when people hung phones onto the wall like a piece of art. But a lot of good that will do me. That number hasn't been in use since, well, the Stone Ages. And now I'm about as lost as a child separated from its mother at the mall. I'd better get going. I'd really appreciate it if you didn't file charges— I've got a nasty divorce at hand, and these hot flashes have me stepping out of my mind, literally. Why would you need to call Morgan? His brows dip in the middle, and it's a vexingly good look on him. Did something happen to your car? Is that why you came up to the house for help? Poor, poor Elliot. Trying so hard to make sense of a senseless situation. I almost feel sorry for him. And I definitely feel sorry for me. A prison cell may not be waiting for me today, but incarceration of some type seems inevitable at this point. Today, Elliot's shower. Tomorrow, the president's. No, I'm pretty sure my minivan isn't anywhere near your home, wherever this may be. He inches back. Are you saying you walked from Main Street? That's six and a half miles away, in the snow. What can I say? I love me some fresh air and ice. Six and a half miles? Ugh, I'll freeze solid if I try to hoof my way back. How did you know where I lived? Did Cash tell you? Elliot scrutinizes me with a curious stare as he searches my features for a modicum of something that resembles logic. That's the thing. I have no idea where you live, and Cash didn't tell me anything. 
He cocks a brow my way. Let me get this straight. You don't have your phone on you. You don't have your car. You say you have no idea where I live, and yet you ended up in my shower? He glowers at me a good long while, and it too is a vexing look when juxtaposed against all that bare flesh staring out at me. I'm guessing it's not a good sign. You don't strike me as someone who's out of her mind. Why did you end up in my shower, Billy? Thank you for the vote of confidence, but let's not get hasty. I might need that insanity plea in court. You mentioned you saw a doctor. Is something wrong? Are you blacking out? There's something about the genuine concern in his voice that makes me swoon. Harold and I spent a lot of time together, and yet I never felt as though he truly cared for how I felt, either emotionally or physically. Nope, not blacking out, not in the traditional sense, and my doctor didn't seem too concerned about my predicament. In fact, he thought these were female issues, so he pawned me off on another doctor. And funny story, I met your brother. A depleted smile comes and goes. Warren. I give a quick nod. He's very thorough, I'm glad to report. He took getting to second base with me very seriously. A groan evicts from him, as if the visual pained him on some level. He takes a deep breath. And what did he have to say about these issues? He said it was perfectly normal. I cringe a moment. Only I didn't exactly tell him the whole truth. I couldn't. Why not? He looks shocked that I'd hold back anything. He's your doctor. He's a safe haven. A safe haven to some, a portal to the loony bin for others. Look, I've already said too much tonight. If you don't mind, could I hitch a ride back to Fay Gardens? Cash was just about to spill all the deep, dark secrets this town has to offer. And not only that, but Sylvia Arden is our waitress. And according to Vera, Sylvia has a deep, dark secret of her own and I'm betting it has a few deadly implications, if you know what I mean. I saw Sylvia and Griffin having a nasty exchange the afternoon he died. His left cheek cinches to the side. She's on my list, too. Well, what are we waiting for? Let me slip into something a little less comfortable. He shifts in his seat before leaning my way. But I'm not going to let Cash tell you a thing about Glimmerspell. A choking sound emits from me, but before I can contest, he holds a finger up between us. I'm going to fill in the blanks for you, Billy. It will be me, not him. Cash Archer is vying for you, and his intentions are less than chaste. I highly doubt he's the man you're looking for. An audible gulp comes from me as I offer up a circular nod. I'll just wait outside your bedroom, I say showing myself to the door. Apparently, I'm on the second level of what looks to be an amply spacious home. I meander my way down to the first floor while looking at the menagerie of pictures on the wall on the way down. They're mostly of a younger version of him, his son, I'm assuming. A few t-ball pictures are scattered about, along with a few school pictures as well but there is a smattering of old black and white photos that look as if they belong to another era entirely. I'd like to think they were old family portraits passed down from generation to generation, but more than likely there's a 50-50 chance they came with the frame. There's a chill in the air that only seems to grow as I hit the first floor that spills into a cavernous living room, dining room, and enormous kitchen off the back. There's a stone fireplace large enough to roast a deer in off the grand room, with a few dark couches that surround an oversized TV that's featuring a horror flick at the moment. The floors are stained dark, and there's a coat of arms over on the far wall, black, silver, and maroon, with what looks to be two swords crossed over it. Thick shag carpets are scattered around the living areas, and the faint scent of popcorn fills the air. The sound of a girl squealing comes from the sofa, and I sigh in that direction. Figures, 
I'm not his only intruder for the night. I'm about to make my way over when I spot not one but two dark heads sitting awfully close to one another as they take in that horror flick. I bet that's Royce, and I bet he's got a hot date. Like father, like son. Not that I'm Elliot's hot date, but still the night is young, and he was probably showering in anticipation of his own hot date. The young girl turns her head slightly, and a wailing sound rips from me just before I jump behind the wall that leads into the living room. Elliot comes down the stairs at a quickened clip, in a sweater and jeans, along with a pair of dark boots on, ready for the elements. His spiced cologne reaches me before he does, and with his dark hair still dewy from the shower, those clear green eyes, I do my best not to swoon. I hold a finger to my lips and motion for him to come in close. What's going on? He whispers with his brows furrowed, giving him that impossibly sexy look he's evidently unable to escape. It's them. That's what's going on. I pull him close in the event he wants to get wild and stroll right into his living room. It's Harper, I whisper. She's out there with a boy who I'm assuming is your son. Are you nuts for allowing this to happen? I give him a light swat on the arm and he frowns. I had no idea it was happening. He tips his head that way. Looks harmless enough. They're watching a zombie movie. Looks harmless enough if you're the father of the boy, I tell him. We're going to have to go in there and bust up the party. He pierces me with those crystalline eyes once again, and a spear of heat runs through me. Not the deadly heat that slingshots me through time, but the far more incendiary heat that blows my hormones up like a match in a fireworks factory. How are we going to explain what you're doing here, Billy? And the fact that we've been upstairs for seemingly hours? I make a face at him. We'll tell them I was teaching you how to knit. He flinches as I say it. What's the matter? Too manly to knit one pearl too? His lips part to answer, just as a rustling sound comes from next door, and both Harper and Royce step into the foyer. In one Herculean move, Elliot pulls me into a darkened corridor and holds me close as we watch Royce and Harper pull on their coats. You want to grab a bite to eat? The younger version of Elliot offers, and Harper shakes her head at him. I'd better get back. If my mother finds out I've been running around with a guy, the next time I leave the house, it'll be college move-in day. She's right, I whisper, and Elliot pulls back and lowers his lids my way. He smells nice. His cologne is mingling with his soap, along with that new clothes scent lingering to his sweater. Everything about Elliot Greenlee is nice, which would be nice in and of itself if he wasn't so off-putting in far more blatant ways. At least your mom isn't the town nut job, Royce says to her, and Harper scoffs. Just wait until you meet her, Harper snickers. She's been known to go off the rails a time or two. I shake my head because she doesn't know the half of it. They take off and seal the door shut behind them. Is Iona the town nut job? I ask, as Elliot and I remain frozen inside that dark corridor far longer than necessary. Wait, don't answer that. I have a feeling I'm about to dethrone her anyway. No need to bash your ex on my account. A dark chuckle bounces through his chest, and mine by proxy, since he's holding me so tightly. His grip on me loosens. Are you ready to get back to Main Street? Only if you promise to tell me everything you know about this haunted little town on the way over. No can do, he says. The things I have to tell you deserve far more attention than a quick drive into town. But if you want, you can take another stab at explaining how and why you ended up in my shower. That would be appreciated. I could, but with my luck I'd stab us both in the literal sense and land us in the morgue next to your poor friend. Elliot pauses at the door and bores those clear eyes to mine. I'm so sorry, I whisper. That was really insensitive of me. He shakes his head. You're fine. 
I wasn't thinking about Griffin. I suck in my lower lip as my gaze rides up and down his body, and suddenly I'm not thinking about Griffin either. Elliot's lips twitch. What's going through your mind? My shoulders ride up a notch. I was just thinking you look nice with that sweater on. I press my lips tightly in an effort to keep from saying the words that are begging to bubble out next. But you didn't look so bad without it either. I push past him into the icy night air as something warm and weighted falls over my shoulders from behind. I turn to find Elliot wrapping me with a coat. I was thinking you look nice in that dress. His lips purse as his eyes stay trained on mine. But I'd rather you not catch your death. Very funny, I say, and thank you. He slips the coat on himself and gives a sly wink. I don't think you'd look so bad without it either. We take off for Main Street, and the mood between us feels as if it's loosening. Elliot is going to spill those secrets this town is holding to the vest like a poker hand, and he thinks I'm about to do the same about my shower trick. That chance. I'm just as in the dark about my own secrets as he is. And how I wish I wasn't. 12. The crowd inside Fay Gardens has grown exponentially, and I find both Cash and Mabel at the bar, at opposing ends as it were. There's a live band playing now, and the scent of those grilled burgers has ticked up a notch. I'd better head over to Cash, I say with more than a touch of dread in my voice. The poor guy thinks I skipped out on him. You did. Elliot flexes a dry smile. Why don't you give me a head start with him? This will only take a few minutes. He takes off toward the bar, just as my slightly see-through niece spots me and begins to float in my direction. Billy, Mabel hisses, and her voice reverberates in a ghostly echo. Where were you? Morgan and Teddy are out scouring the town looking for you. Cash has your purse with him by the bar. He was pretty worried, too. Do you think he'd buy the fact I had a bathroom emergency? She winces. He did a pretty thorough search of both restrooms. He knows you left the building. I glance that way, and Elliot and Cash seem to be having it out. Cash glances back this way, and I give a timid wave before Elliot steps in and blocks his view of me, and the men seem to be going at it again. Well, there's that. I don't know what to do, Mabel. I ended up in Elliot Greenlee's shower while he was in there. She sucks in a quick breath, one she doesn't need, might I add. Oh, this is getting serious, Billy. We're going to have to find a way to fix this for you. I nod. And guess what? I didn't time travel. I just popped into Elliot's shower unannounced in another part of town for no good reason. She bites down on her lip as she looks to the bar. I don't know that you'd need a good reason to pop into that man's shower. Mabel, I hiss, just as a body bumps into me from behind, and I turn to find a familiar redhead, Sylvia Arden, struggling not to drop a tray of dirty dishes. Whoa, I say, as I help her out by grabbing a few stray glasses that are about to slide right onto the floor. Nice save, she laughs. Thank you. She's about to take off and glances back at me. Hey, where did you go? Sheriff Archer was turning this place upside down. You didn't ditch him, did you? Nope. I just ran into a kerfuffle and sort of got in way over my head with another man. She averts her eyes. Lord knows I've been there a time or two. Professor Barker? I tip my head as her jaw loosens. So you know? Her eyes narrow over mine. Don't tell me he came after you, too. Mabel floats back a notch. Came after you? What is that supposed to mean? I'd like to know myself. I nod to the redhead. Do you have a second? She blows out a breath and lands her tray down on the nearest table, and we both take a seat. 
Sylvia, what was it that Professor Barker was doing? She glances over her shoulder a moment. You mean with those donations? She says donations in air quotes. Mabel gives a ghostly moan. Something tells me you should play along, Billy. You might get more out of her that way. I give a slight nod. Exactly, the donations. Something Jenny said when I spoke to her comes to mind. She mentioned something about a donation herself. What kind of donation did he take from you? The same kind he took from everyone else, apparently. Tears come to her eyes, and she blinks them back. At first I thought I was really special to him. The Chatham House, his private foundation, was doing really great work. But he kept asking for more blood. Blood? Mabel and I ask in unison. Sylvia gives a quick nod. He works closely with Winchester General. The Chatham House is one of the venues they use to build their blood bank. Anyway, he seemed more interested in my blood than he did me toward the end. And then, of course, I found out he was two-timing me, three-timing me, and probably four-timing me. But I gave up on trying to uncover any more dirt on him. I had all I needed. Her eyes widened past me with a vacant stare. What was the dirt, Sylvia? Her shoulders tremble as a dry laugh strums through her. I guess there's no use in keeping it from the world now. He's gone. There's nothing more he can do to keep me quiet about it. Go on, I say, slipping to the edge of my seat. Literally. Griffin Barker died 40 years ago. Her dark eyes hook to mine. Professor Barker was using a stolen identity. I reported it, too. She shoots a scathing glance toward the bar. I told Detective Greenlee about it three weeks ago, and nothing happened. I thought for sure he'd arrest him, or in the least, Professor Barker would be let go from his position at the university, but it was as if it wasn't important. She glances back to the bar. It was almost as if Detective Greenlee was covering for him. She shudders a moment. Anyway, I decided to take matters into my own hands. That day at that bookstore, I let Professor Barker know that if he didn't come clean, I was going to expose him to everyone in that room right after the taping. That conversation I had with Vera comes back to me. Sylvia, did Vera know about any of this? Her features harden. She was one of his girls. I didn't tell her about the fake identity, but I told her that I knew about his little harem and that she was just another notch on his bedpost. I shake my head. Vera mentioned that Sylvia and Griffin had a secret. She seemed pretty glib about it, too. Something's not adding up. There's more, isn't there, I say, looking right at her. Her gaze drops to the floor, and her hand touches her belly for a moment. No, there's nothing more. It was nice talking to you, Billy, she shrugs. Sheriff Archer shouted your name out for so long, I feel as if we're old friends. Stop by any time you want. She takes off, and Mabel sighs in her wake. What do you think, Mabel? I look her way, and her face begins to glow a sickly shade. I'm sorry, Billy, but I think it's time you know a thing or two about Glimmerspell. She glances to the bar. And from what you've told me, you already have a volunteer to tell you everything you need to know. I'll see you at the haunted book barn, where I put the haunt in haunted. A ghostly laugh echoes from her as she dissipates right before my eyes. No sooner do I stand than both Cash and Elliot are upon me. Cash, I can explain. I wince. I mean, I... He hands me my purse. Don't worry about it, Billy. He glowers over at Elliot. He told me everything I needed to know. How about a do-over? I'll swing by the haunted book barn and we can share a bite there. And that way, if an emergency comes up with an inventory delivery, we can tackle it together. Ah, yes, the inventory emergency. I glance to Elliot for a microsecond 
and his lips twitch with delight my way. I would love a do-over, Cash. I'll see you soon. I offer him a spontaneous hug, and his gun butts up against my hip. He pulls away and shoots Elliot a lethal look. Don't believe everything you hear. He tips his chin up my way. We'll have that talk soon. He takes off, and I blow out a breath that feels as if I've been holding it for hours. So, detective, are you ready to tell me a thing or two about this one-horse town? Yes, but not tonight. I have class in the morning. I'm officially filling in Professor Barker's shoes over at Dexter. But it's not even nine o'clock. Surely you could give me the Spark Notes edition. I promise I'll make sure you get home before your truck turns into a pumpkin. We can take a seat at the bar. I'll buy the drinks. A growl of a laugh strums through him, and his lids hood dangerously low. That spear of heat he seems to sponsor shoots through my belly and into oblivion leaving me to gasp in its wake. The bar wouldn't be a good idea. He doubles down on his stubbornness. And we'll need more time than just a few hours. What I have planned might just take all night. He exhales as his gaze digs into mine. Good night, Billy. He takes off and leaves me with the fairies that run this place, with their wings flapping frenetically, their glowing blue skin and glittering eyes. The patrons are starting to get a little too rowdy, so I gather my coat and shoot Morgan and Teddy a quick text to let them know I'm still very much in the present with them. And oddly, my mind is very much in the past with Elliot in that shower. Now that's a sight I don't think I'll forget for a long time to come. Sylvia said that Elliot knew about Griffin's false identity and did nothing about it. Was he covering for him? But why? That heated exchange he had with Griffin the day of the murder comes back to me. Maybe Glimmerspell isn't the only one rife with secrets around here. My guess is Elliot has them too. It looks as if I'll have to winnow out more information from him than either of us bargained for. Elliot Greenlee may be as ornery as they come, but is he a killer? I'll get my answer sooner than later, and a part of me wonders how I'll feel when I do. I think I already know. Thirteen. The snow is falling, and the haunted book barn is bustling. All morning and well into the afternoon, Teddy and I are whipping up one latte after another and dishing out the danishes as fast as we can, too. And between customers, Teddy and I have been discussing the case, going over our suspects one by one under the watchful eye of Grizabella. It's not until 2.30 do we catch a breather. Is it always this busy? I ask, as we enjoy a couple of frappuccinos we flipped up for ourselves. Teddy is clad in green today, and I'm liking this verdant, ode-to-nature look on her. Not typically, but we're a hot commodity now that we've had the dead guy christen this place. Morgan laughs as she and Mabel come up behind her. That's right. Morgan comes around the counter and steals a cheese danish from the shelf. If I knew a corpse would up our value, I would have put out a hit on someone ages ago. Teddy glances to the ceiling. Well, if you're down and out in the future and looking to shake things up with a little homicide, my vote is for Iona. She's been shooting daggers at me all day. I'm pretty sure she's shooting daggers at me, I say, frowning in the general direction of the registers where Iona has been flipping me off with her eyes ever since I set foot in here. Oh, no. I suck in a quick breath. Do you think she knows about the fact I essentially took a shower with her ex? Mabel titters while Morgan picks up Teddy's hand so that she can hear what the perky poltergeist might have to offer the conversation. How I wish I could have seen it. Mabel shakes her head. That whole shower scenario happened to me once, too, but the guy never knew I was there. I lean in. Did you run screaming like I wanted to? 
Do I look insane to you? A devilish grin rides on her lips. I didn't want to scare the poor guy, so I stood there quietly until he finished up. If I'm anything, I'm polite. She gives a little wink. I'll go finish up with the audit. She looks to her sister. The numbers may have been lagging last year, but Teddy is right. This last week has been booming. Oh, and by the way, I'd beef up the true crime section. We're selling out of everything. She floats off to her desk, not bothering to go around a single material obstacle in her path. I watch, amazed, and with slight horror, as she passes right through tables, bookshelves, and customers alike. Morgan grunts as she swallows down a bite of her Danish. I'd better put in that order. We're filming our next episode of Murder, Mayhem, and Baking this Saturday, and I'm dedicating the episode to Professor Barker. Vera said the students were planning on coming down as sort of a vigil, so we're going to have a packed house. That's very nice of you, I tell her. What dessert are we making, and I'll be sure to have all the ingredients ready. Better than sex cake, Teddy offers, and both Morgan and I groan. What? That professor dipped his wick into anything that moved. His harem might even get a kick out of it. You're not wrong, I say, giving a wistful tick of the head. But I say we go for something a little more subtle, just in case his family turns up for the makeshift vigil. Teddy nods. Keeping it classy, huh? She shrugs as she lifts her drink my way. Showering with a hot guy shortcake? Seducing the share of stiff lemon meringue? Morgan snorts. I'll handle this one. I'm thinking bumbleberry pie. She shoots a curt look my way. After what you told me about Detective Greenlee last night, I'm starting to think he's bumbling this case on purpose. I make a face, because I'm half afraid she's right. Hey, you mentioned you knew his mother. The one that gave you the hourglass that knocked me into last week, literally? I think I'd like to meet her. You will, she nods. I spoke with her this morning when I was putting in an order from the dairy. She says she's heard many things about you already, and she can hardly wait to say hello in person. I told her to stop by any time. Do you think she will? A shiver runs through me at the thought. Teddy shakes her head. I'd be afraid if I were you. A laugh bounces through my chest. What's to fear? She runs a dairy for Pete's sake. Morgan and Teddy exchange a brief glance. If you're lucky, she'll love you to pieces, Morgan says, making her way to the other side of the counter once again. And if I'm not? I ask. Because, let's face it, I never am. Morgan chortles to herself. You just might regret your stay in Glimmerspell. A part of me is doing that already, I mutter, just as Teddy elbows me. Teen scene alert coming straight at us. I look up just as Harper and Sadie descend upon the cafe. I know what you kids like. Teddy shoots them with her finger. I'll go and whip something up for you right now. She takes off to do just that as I belly up to the counter. Hey, girls. I perk up. Nothing has the power to turn my day around like seeing my daughter's happy face. How was school? Harper scowls over at me while Sadie rubs her baby belly. Let's see. Harper glances to her counterpart in backpack-wearing arms. I got a D on my biology pop quiz. I found a freaking worm in my apple, teaches me to eat clean. And Molly Archer threatened to run me over with her car if I so much as looked at Roy... She stops cold from saying his name. Some dude who she's not even seeing anymore. Sorry, I say. But some exes are like hexes. Once they infiltrate your life, they're impossible to get rid of. And for some girls, the place their exes get stuck is in their heart. It sounds as if she's not over him. Is it bad? that I'm rooting for Molly in this equation. A thought comes to me. Hey, did you say Molly Archer? I think that's the sheriff's daughter. That's right, Sadie says as Teddy lands a grilled cheese sandwich in front of them both. 
a couple of bottles of Italian sparkling water, a couple of mocha lattes, and she rounds it all out with a plate full of fresh-from-the-oven-hot fudge brownies. Sadie looks over at Harper. Molly could run you over, string your body up in the nearest tree, and not get into a stitch of trouble. She's untouchable. Good to know, Harper says as she pulls up a picture of the girl on her phone. What are you doing? I ask as I look down at the picture of a girl who looks like Cash in female skin. I'm copying her face, she says, and popping it into a search engine that has a special facial recognition feature. This should populate all of the pictures with Molly's mug that are out there, and I'm going to scan them all in the event there's something I can use against her. Just a routine social media takedown. Harper, I say, and she's quick to scoff at me. Come on, Sadie, she says, grabbing her backpack. Let's head to the reading tables in the back. They scoop up their feast and migrate to the furthest table from the counter. I look to Teddy. You don't really think Molly is a threat to Harper, do you? With Royce Greenlee in the balance, that boy could make any girl lose her mind. He's got muscles for days. When he flexes, the bears run for the hills and the girls fall to his feet. But don't worry, if Harper lands him, there won't be any bad blood between her and Sadie. He's not in the running as the father of her child. In the running? I give a long blink. She nods. On the bright side, Aiden Archer is a strong contender, and if that's true, Sadie and Molly will essentially be family. Sadie could call off the dogs if she had to, but that wouldn't be until summer. I'd have Harper cool it in the Royce department until then. And longer, a female voice chirps, and we look over to see a dark presence standing before us, a.k.a. Iona Slade. Iced latte, very little milk, no sugar. Cold and bitter, just like her heart, Teddy whispers as she takes off to make the drink. I heard that. Iona scowls past me, before shooting me the stink eye. According to my son's Insta Pictures account, he spent some time alone with your daughter last night. Is stalking your kids' social media pages all the rage among the moms of Glimmerspell? I'm still trying to get caught up on Paranormal Activity 101. I haven't graduated to helicopter parenting just yet. She pulls a tight smile, and there's not a stitch of kindness behind it. Iona has her chestnut hair pulled into a ponytail, and it's been wagging back and forth all day, as if it, too, wanted a glimpse of the person she was trying to eviscerate. I'm not stalking my son. It's called being involved in his life. But if you'd much rather take advice from Sonny, be my guest. Just know that my son won't be in the running to be your daughter's baby daddy, either. He not only comes from good stock, he's a perfect gentleman, and I won't have him being corrupted by anyone. My chest pulsates as I give a huff her way. I'm willing to overlook that barb directed at my family because we haven't had the proper opportunity to get to know one another. I cinch a short-lived smile. High school was a long time ago for the both of us. I'd like to think that we're two women who can rise above the noise rise above our own preconceived notions, and form a friendship of some sort. Now that we'll be working together from here on out, I don't see why we'd want to make things weird between us. You made things weird once you showed up at my ex's house yesterday. I have access to the security cameras that surround the house, and before you accuse me of helicopter parenting again... I'll have you know it makes me sleep better at night, knowing that I'll be alerted in the event there's a house fire or a break-in. If your daughter chose to live with her father, you'd want that, too. Darn right I'd want that. A small, silly part of me burns with anger at the thought of Harper ever being forced to live with Harold and his tramp. And if that scenario was in the works, I might just be the one burning down the house. Not with anyone in it, of course not with Harper in it at least, or the new baby. 
Right now, all of my quasi-homicidal intentions are aimed at the original perpetrators. A laugh lives and dies in her throat as she bears those hard amber eyes over mine. I see you're not interested in following the rules I threw out the other day. Oh, sweetie, I've had a rebel heart since I was three. My mother could attest to that. But since you've got your panties in a wad over what may have transpired between your ex and me last night, let me put your mind at ease. It was perfectly chaste. A visual of Elliot Greenlee, naked and dripping wet, in the shower, bounces through my mind. And I clear my throat. If you must know, I was there discussing the case with him. Did we discuss the case at all? Honestly, all I remember is his finely chiseled chest, those pale green eyes, and that I'm-going-to-eat-you-for-dinner look in his eyes. Iona, do you think Elliot is an upstanding detective? Are you questioning his integrity? A dry laugh pulses through her. Maybe you do know him after all. Teddy lands the iced latte down, and Iona is quick to snatch it up without so much as a thank you. She takes off, and Teddy bumps her hip to mine. What did she say? Nothing I didn't already suspect for myself. Elliot Greenlee and I are due to have one interesting talk, and I'll move heaven and glimmer spell to make sure it happens tonight. Is Elliot's integrity really all that questionable? I might care more about the answer to that question than I do who killed Griffin Barker. And who knows, Elliot Greenlee's questionable integrity might just be the answer to both. He might not have wiped me off his suspect list just yet, but I haven't taken him off it either. In exactly three hours, I'm going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a man who just might be the killer. Fourteen. Where are you going, Mom? Harper gives my choice of accoutrements for the evening a scrutinizing, might I add, dirty look. Just out? I shrug as I watch both Harper and Sadie scurry around Teddy's living room, tossing on their winter coats and snapping up their purses. Where are you headed? Grisabella lets out a harrowing yell from the rim of the sofa as if she wanted an explanation herself. That's okay, Grizzy, Harper gives the fluffy kitty a quick kiss to the ear. I know my mother is nosy, but she believes it's her parental right to interfere in my life on the regular. She smears a smile my way. Study group, I have to ace my next biology quiz if I ever plan on having a life after high school. She runs up and lands a kiss to my cheek before frowning down at my sweater once again. Black sequins, Mom, really? And skinny jeans? What, I say, giving my sweater a pat. It's just a little sequins thrown in for some sparkle. Since when is your mom not allowed to sparkle? She leans in and squints while scouring my features. You have makeup on, like a serious amount. She gasps hard. The rumors are true, aren't they? You're like... Dating Sheriff Archer. Sadie yanks Harper toward the door. Who cares who your mother is dating? She winks my way. Have fun with them, though. I had fun with Aiden. She pats her belly. Like father, like son, right? Maybe use protection. Ew! Harper swats Sadie on the arm as they sail through the door, and an icy breeze blows through the living room in their wake. Teddy crops up next to me. That's the best part of having those power searches. You don't need protection, Toots. You're free to have a wild and carefree time. I make a face at her. Morgan and Mabel are still at the haunted book barn, and Sonny is at work. I'm not going to have a wild and carefree time. I've already filled Teddy in on the fact I'm heading to Elliot's place for our little glimmer spell-based tell-all. I'm going out with a man who's basically a stranger to me, and have I mentioned he could be the killer? For all I know, he could be a serial killer. If I don't come home by morning, call the FBI. 
It's obvious the Winchester County Sheriff's Department is corrupted. I'll give you until noon in the event you decide to have a sleepover. Elliot has been known to charm more than his fair share of women until the wee hours of the morning. Figures. And did any of these women live to tell about it? Because if Elliot isn't slaughtering them, Iona just might be. <sighs> Iona's bark is worse than her bite. She touches a finger to her nose. Try not to get bogged down by any of the details he might throw your way. You shouldn't worry about something you can't do anything about. Sound advice. I wish I had it years ago. I spent years worrying about sales numbers for the hardware store, our anemic marketing efforts, Harper's health, her state of mind. The funny thing is, I never worried about my marriage. She spikes her fists into her hips and comes shy of winking. But aren't you glad you didn't? You're right. He wouldn't have been worth it. Everything I've ever worried about was a wasted endeavor. I pull on my coat and grab my purse. What are you up to tonight, Teddy? Grizabella and I are reading a book by the fireplace while sipping hot cocoa. I aspire to be you, I say as I head for the door. Are you kidding? I wish I could be a fly on the wall once you and the hot homicide detective finally go at it. I've seen the way you've been ogling one another, the way you've been pretending you can't stand the sight of one another. There's enough tension between the two of you to blow up the entire state. Things are about to get out of hand in the very best way. She swats me on the arm. Which reminds me, at your age, you'll need lube. What? I balk as she takes off for the kitchen. I'm not going to need lube. I think on it a moment. Okay, fine. If push got to bend over, then I definitely need lube. But believe me, we're not going anywhere near that precarious position tonight. Or any position. I've got the perfect thing, she shouts. The rule is, if you can eat it, you can use it. You've got a very delicate ecosystem down there, you know and it needs to be treated as such. I was just about to whip up some homemade salad dressing. She trots back into the room, wagging a small mason jar my way. Oh, my stars, what the heck are you giving me? Grapeseed oil with a touch of soy sauce, she shrugs. Just be thankful I haven't added the vinegar yet. She shoves it into my purse without warning. If you need any tips on how to drive a man wild, I can... I'm fine, I say, moving toward the door. Okay, go on. We'll talk when you get home. That will give me a chance to jot down a few things for you. I've got a cheat sheet somewhere around here myself. Looking forward to it. Oh, hon, it's not light reading, but it's a game changer. You'll be kicking yourself you didn't have that info sooner. Night one really sets a precedence. Don't do any moves you don't plan on replicating in the future. But you sure as heck, Fire, make sure he performs like a circus poodle for you. Poodle? Really? Have it your way. He can be a dancing bear. She waves it off. But if that bear doesn't head downtown to get himself some honey, don't waste any time booting him back to the woods. I'm leaving now, I say, a touch too loudly. Don't have too much fun without me. I'll see you in a bit. Remember, don't get too wrapped up in things you can't do anything about. And take a bite out of that beefcake for me, would you? She shouts as I hop into my van. I give a hearty wave as I head down the street. I hereby declare an official end to my romantic life. That should take any pressure off me for the next 50 years or so. I'm not taking a bite out of Elliot Greenley, tonight or ever. I'm taking a hiatus from dating and from men in general. Tonight is all about glimmer spell and the truths it's hiding. Elliot texted this afternoon and asked if I wouldn't mind heading to his place, and I said yes. He offered to pick me up, but I declined the offer, so he gave me his address and I punched it into my GPS before I even left from the bookstore this afternoon. 
As nice as it would have been to have him pick me up from Teddy's place, it would have felt too much like a date. Besides, this way I've got my getaway vehicle at the ready. I follow the voice commands through the twisting, turning, evergreen-laden back roads until I come upon Rim of the World Drive and pull in front of the large two-story home with a gray stone facade and a couple of stone lions set out in front of the entry. The street looks to be a spacious cul-de-sac, with each of the homes spaced out much further than your traditional tract houses. The double-door entry looks homey, with a potted Italian cypress on either side of it. Elliot's house is lit up like a peach as I make my way up the porch and give a brisk knock. Less than a few seconds later, the door swings open, with Elliot in a dark suit with a shiny silver tie that brings out those clear green eyes of his. His hair is slicked back, and the stubble on his face looks neatly trimmed. His cologne engulfs my senses like an old spicy friend, and the scent of fresh bread and red sauce is layered just beneath that. Believe me, my appetite is going strong, but food is far from what I'm craving. Holy smokes, this man is intolerably good-looking. What was I thinking agreeing to come over to his place? Teddy says he's been known to have a good time with all the girls he can get his hands on. No wonder he's called me over. He's probably anxious to land me in the shower once again, this time with my clothes off. And let's call a sexual spade a spade. It might just be an offer I can't refuse. Welcome to my home. Elliot offers up a smile, but it doesn't last for long. Thank you, I say as I head inside, and he helps me land my coat and purse onto a bench in the entry. The fire is raging in the family room. The dining room table just to the left of that has a red hurricane lamp with a candle burning in it, and it gives off a homey yet romantic flare. Something smells delicious. Pizza he says without missing a beat. I just got home a few minutes before you got here. I thought I'd pick something up in case you were hungry. I've never been one to turn down carbs laden with cheese, but only if it comes with a side of glimmer spell. I don't think I can wait another minute to hear any and everything you have to say about this haunted town. And I mean haunted in the literal sense, thanks to Mabel. Elliot pauses a moment. His eyes ride down my body for the briefest of moments until his gaze meets with mine and freezes as if he were caught. It proves impossible for me to look away from him, and that familiar electrical impulse he seems to initiate in me sparks through my body like a firestorm. Here's hoping it doesn't cause a power surge and send me to some medieval dungeon I can never escape. Of all the supernatural abilities my body could have come up with, it chose the one that might get me eaten by dinosaurs. We can start with Glimmerspell if you like. His chest depresses as if it were the last thing he wanted to do. I'm in. Let's head to my office then. He leads us through the family room, to the right of the kitchen where a dimly lit corridor leads to a room in the back. Elliot's office is exactly how I would have pictured it. Dark leather chairs and an expansive black desk with a leather armchair on the other side of it. Massive shelves laden with books with gilded spines. The office holds a woodsy scent, and the air is ice cold. Cold enough to snow, in fact. He pulls up a chair for me before heading to the other side of the desk and producing a file. Do you have a strong stomach? He waves the file in the air before landing it on the desk with a thump. I slept in the same bed with my ex for 19 years. I'm pretty sure I could scrape roadkill off city streets for a living and still enjoy a hearty meal for dinner. Give it to me straight, Elliot. Tell me what you know about Glimmerspell. You don't need to go around the block with me. His lips curl a touch as he opens the file and slides an 8 by 10 picture my way. Ten women, eight men, mostly vagabonds, he says as I pull the picture my way and gasp at the body lying in a pile of leaves. It's a woman, blonde hair, 
her skin white as paper, eyes opened and bulging, and she has a scream locked on her face. Note the puncture marks at the neck, the sign of an amateur. He slides the rest of the file my way, and I go through the pictures, one by one, each of a body lying in the woods, about half of them in the snow, two completely undressed, and the rest with their clothes left in tatters, their necks gashed open, their chests raked and bloodied. One of them looks to have a hole right through its torso. They took his heart, Elliot says, a little above a whisper. It's a delicacy for them. Them? I meet his eyes with mine. So it's true? There's some sort of sick subculture that's obsessed with vampires, and that's where the lore comes from? One would think. One would be wrong, though. He leans back and holds his hands together as he studies me. I've researched these deaths, Billy. I've seen the bodies, been with the coroner when they've examined them. These victims were drained of their blood so efficiently, the coroner marveled at how it could have been done. I'm sorry. This will sound foreign to your ears, unbelievable even. But there are vampires, Billy, an entire underground network of them. They hold positions of power in their towns, in the city, in every level of government. And there are pockets of paradise, as they're called, where they can mostly be themselves. Glimmer spell just so happens to be one of them. A moment of silence bounces between us. So they're here in Glimmerspell? My heart riots against my chest, and my adrenaline hits hard. It's telling me to grab Harper and run all the way back to Mulberry Lake. The vampires aren't alone, Billy, he sighs. I've found evidence of werewolves and fey as well. Half man, half wolf? I balk. I can believe that people are stupid enough to guzzle human plasma, but you're asking me to suspend reality if you think I'm falling for shapeshifters. That scene from his shower flits through my mind, and it's evident that my own body, my own newly acquired odd abilities, have demanded that I suspend reality with or without a few hairy, scary men thrown in for good measure. He nods. They claim to be half-breeds, and although they are mythological menaces, they don't do much harm in the here and now. The vampires, their subculture, if that's what you'd like to call it, they utilize them for their own benefit. And what's the benefit to the so-called werewolves? Money, power, that's all. And that's more than enough. But not all of the wares are aligned with this. Most of them are peace-loving people just like you and me. And the Fae? I blink hard as I say it, partially because I can't believe I just said it. Gorgeous, shimmering creatures with a DNA structure similar to humans, enough so that they can hide in plain sight. They have a few abilities, the gift of luring people to do their bidding, especially those with weak wills. They're hypersexual by nature fun, loving, and flirtatious. Why do I get the feeling you've spent your fair share of time researching those sparkly little minxes? He frowns before the hint of a smile curls into his cheek. In my defense, they were hard to resist. Questions? I want to know more about the vampire subculture. They seem to be the ones in charge around here. Obviously they're humans, Elliot. They all are. Maybe they're just people who happen to be endowed with some sort of supernatural abilities? What did Busy and Georgie call my time travel tussles? Oh, transmundane. I hear that some sort of a subset of people who have certain otherworldly powers, and apparently there are all sorts of abilities that can be filed under that umbrella. His eyes widen a notch as he studies me. Where did you hear that word? You know it? A breath hitches in my throat, and I don't dare move an inch. You know it? He dips his chin as he shoots the question right back at me, those clear green eyes never leaving mine. 
Yes, transmundane is the banner in which a myriad of supernatural abilities are filed under. The Fey come from this subset. The werewolves and the vampires are completely different in nature. The were-people suffer a mutation of their genetics, which allows them to shift into wolves. Same with the vampires, but the mutation is more or less a disease that freezes the body's natural ability to age. First, it arrests the cellular structure, thus death occurs. Then almost instantly, all cells are rebooted, thus the victim becomes undead. All matter in the universe is on its path toward entropy. It is the natural course of existence. They're impervious to diseases. They just go on and on without any relief from this life on the near horizon. Relief? I balk. Are you kidding? Believe me, if the free world could get their hands on some of that magic, we'd all be vampires. If any of it were true, we'd all be vampires by now. No, we wouldn't. His cheeks flex. It doesn't work that way. Don't they just keep biting people to increase the vampire population? I've seen enough Halloween horror flicks to know that's how it works. It does work that way. But only if the vampire doing the biting desires it to be so. A run-of-the-mill bite by a vampire does nothing more than puncture the skin at best. Vampires have a specific venom they release when they're looking to transform someone into their kind. It takes about 20 seconds for the Vesper, the name for their venom, to be released into their victim's bloodstream. After that, it can take anywhere up to 72 hours for the victim's system to convert to the new genome pattern. That is, if their cells convert to achieve undead status. As it stands, there's a 50% mortality rate, leading to a pedestrian death, of course. 50%? In other words, that bite is as good as a death sentence. But I still don't see why they wouldn't want to transform the entire world into their kind regardless. Would you risk biting Harper if you knew it might kill her? I wince. There's no way. I guess I can see why the vamps aren't ruling the roost. I never said they weren't ruling the roost. A dark laugh rumbles in his chest. But yes, from what I understand, extreme caution is necessary. And once they're transformed, I cock my head his way. Immortality? As legend has it, yes. According to the vampires, no. The aging process is arrested, but not entirely. After thousands of years, it begins to tick up again. Eventually, from what I understand, even a vampire can succumb to death, in the final sense, as far as leaving the body. It makes sense. The Bible says to each man it is appointed once to die. And many of these vampires long for the day they can be reconnected with those they lost on the other side. It's a curse to those who have it. But as in any large group of people, there is the good, the bad, and the just plain ugly. As it stands, there are two covens who make Glimmer Spell their home. They belong to a larger network of covens that span worldwide. There are the Calders. They have control of the vampire world at the moment. They're the moral majority, if you will. The Calder Coven believes vampires should continue to live underground, functioning within society as contributing members. Since their lifespans are immeasurable, they have a committee that helps those in need of new identities and transfers, should neighbors or friends become suspicious. Then there are the Faulkners. He frowns as he says it. They believe in world dominance in allowing their kind to indulge in human blood and... Wait, don't they all crave human blood? I mean, I've seen the movies. It's like a foray into ecstasy with just one taste. Another far darker laugh rumbles from him, but Elliot doesn't give a smile to go along with it. It's true. From the reports I've heard, it can be a heightened experience. Blood cravings are real, but they're given a serum to help stave it off. Almost all of the blood the vampires need to fuel their bodies comes from animals these days. The Faulkners still partake in human blood, but it's not only heavily frowned upon, 
If they're caught, they can be brought to a privy council called the Elites. They decide whether or not to prosecute the perpetrator. On some occasions, teenagers or such can lose a hold of their restraints, and those are almost always excused events. But if someone is hunting the human population, he nods to the pictures. Actions can be taken to prevent them from doing it again. What kind of actions? He shakes his head. Let's just say they're swift and final. And what about the werewolves? Are they organized? Are they prevalent in Glimmerspell as well? Very. The wares fall under two groups as well. They call them dens. There's the Brahmin den, the good guys, and the Dagen den, the lesser of the good guys. Compared to the Faulkners, there's no bad guy comparison. And the Fae? They're the loosely transmundane. They're the least of the disruptive of the three paranormal elements in Glimmerspell. They try to act as peacekeepers, but they're not taken seriously. What about the transmundane? They have serious powers. I've heard they can see the dead, read minds, have visions of future events, and some can even time travel. I felt a bit smug listing off that last attribute, but then a part of me didn't like Elliot riding off my kind so easily to begin with. In fact, I continue, if all a vampire can do is live for a very long time in their current state, then they're not so supernaturally inclined after all. His brows hike, as if this amused him. They have abilities. They have strength, speed, and they can read people better than most humans, but that comes simply from living on this planet for so long. They're nimble. They can climb better than most primates, and seeing that they've been around, they can grow quite gifted in their inclined field of choice. Some of the greatest musicians, artists, and writers have all been vampires. I'd buy that, although I'm still not sure I'm buying any of it. What about sunshine? They're allergic or something, right? Please tell me they sparkle. And what about driving a stake through the heart and garlic? Garlic is often used in cooking, and yes, vampires enjoy a good meal like anyone else. It has no bearing on them. The wooden stake to the heart, the wood needs to be from a winter bone tree, specifically harvested from Israel. There is a unique chemical makeup that has the ability to cause rapid aging in vampires, and yes, almost always results in death. Almost. As for sunshine, it's not as grim as lore would lead you to believe. No, vampires don't sparkle in the sun, but they sweat profusely and it also quickly leads to severe flu-like symptoms. Most vampires migrate to places that have few sunny days. Glimmerspell is ideal. The sun rarely breaks the cloud cover. Summers are short and rife with rainfall. It can snow well into July and start as early as September. What about mirrors? I shake my head, trying to rack my brain for all of the vampirisms I've gleaned over the years, which apparently aren't many. He nods. It's true. The reflection of a vampire can be almost invisible to the naked eye. It's called the Narcissus Complex. It seems the first few vampires were distraught over their eternal youth in the beginning and asked that God himself hide their reflection from themselves. Over the years, this has become something the vampires can control. That mirror in the haunted book barn? The vampire checker? I nod. It merely propagates the misguided narrative. I sigh as I look down at the grisly photos. Unsolved cases, I say. Unsolved, he echoes. But I believe the Faulkners are responsible. I don't have any reason to doubt you. My gaze hooks to his once again, but the Faulkners may very well just be humans wishing they had this eternal or quasi-eternal standing, as it were. I'm not here to force you to believe anything. You wanted to know about Glimmerspell, and now you have the answers you seek. Come. He stands and leads us out of the office and down another hall to the right. 
I'd like to show you something out on the back patio before dinner. Would you like to grab your coat? It will just be a moment. I'm good for a few seconds out in the elements, especially the cold. Hot weather, not so much. Let's just say I've been having a few adverse effects as of late when I start to overheat. No danger of that out there tonight, he says, opening a glass door that leads to an expansive back porch. But the star of the show isn't the impressively large porch or the pristine snow. It's the shimmering lights from the rest of this cozy little town that glitter like fallen stars in a blanket of navy night below us. The air is frigid, and the wind is picking up, as a few stray snowflakes blow off the evergreens to the right and left of the patio, as if ensconcing Elliot's home in a fortress. A full moon hangs low, and it's the chef's kiss to this romantic scene. Oh, wow, I say as he leads me to the edge of the balcony. Too bad you don't have a view. A laugh bounces through him. I'm not trying to flex, as Royce would say. I merely want to point out the lay of the land to finish off your accelerated education in all things paranormal. Geez, I say through chattering teeth. I can't get over how stunning this is. As far as the eye can see to the left and right, that's glimmer spell, isn't it? That's right, he says, brushing his chest over my back, and instinctively I draw closer to him, hungry for whatever warmth he can give me. Sorry, I wince up at him. I guess I'm not as tough as I thought. You've got some real arctic breezes going out here. Allow me. He wraps his arms around my body from behind, and my heart gives a few wild wallops. Blood courses through my veins like a fire, like a warning, and a brief spear of ecstasy rockets through me. Is this okay? He asks. We'll make it quick. I'll warm you for medicinal purposes. Well, if it's for medicinal purposes. I bite down on my lower lip as I meet his gaze. If I were a person who believed in fate, destiny, romance, and whatever else the greeting card industry would like for me to buy into, then I would most certainly believe that this was the most romantic moment of my life. Take that, Harold. We had 19 years, and Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding here has already edged out the top 10 romantic moments of my life, and most of those consisted of him scowling at me. A growl trembles through Elliot's chest, and his lips curve slightly as he takes in my features. I'm not an expert at reading faces, but I'd bet good money I'm seeing some serious malevolent intent in the good detective's eyes. Glimmer spell. He rumbles, and he's right back to glowering at me. He nods before us, and I turn around. There's the lake to the left, half a mile wide. Shoreline spans 22 miles. The depth can reach up to 72 feet. That's about the equivalent of a six-story building. Nothing too remarkable. To the north of the lake is a narrow valley called Garden Glen. That's where the Fae like to hang out. To the right of Glimmerspell, there's the nomadic woods. It stretches all the way to Canada. The werewolves have claimed that. The dens still battle for control, but it's nothing too dramatic. And the vampire covens? Each word is broken into far too many syllables as I shudder and shake in his arms. I'm greedy for the heat his body wants to give me as I press up against him with all my strength. But it's his heady cologne, the natural musk of his skin, that has me slightly intoxicated. The Calders have a space in the pasture lands. There's an underground lair there beneath one of their homes, and the Faulkners have an underground lair as well, directly beneath the community center, and it runs almost the entire length of the town. It's a miracle this place doesn't collapse. Glimmerspell is strong as iron. This frozen earth isn't going anywhere. I spin in his arms until we're face to face. And now, Billy. He bows his head a notch, his eyes glowing as brilliant as the moon up above. You have been given the true knowledge of who and what live and reside among you. Others know this truth, 
but not all, not everyone who lives here. They come by the knowledge as those who have it deem it right to tell them. Morgan knows. He nods, as do Teddy and Sonny. I don't know what Sadie knows. Royce suspected as much, and I broke it to him a little over a year ago. I blink up at him. And do they believe it? I mean, it's one thing to know the lore. It's another to consider it a reality. That's not for me to answer. A moment thumps by as my heart pounds relentlessly against his chest, as if it were trying to escape the prison of my body and enter his. Do you believe it, Elliot? I can hardly catch my breath. I'm so taken by his comely features, those glowing eyes. The musky scent of his cologne can't get into my lungs fast enough. My mouth is watering for just one kiss. My muscles are crying out to rake open his shirt and feel his bare flesh against mine. I've never hungered for another human being the way I am now. It's not natural, not logical, purely animalistic. He gives a slight nod. I know this to be true as gospel. All of it, Billy. I believe it all. He bows his head down another notch, his eyes lingering over mine as his lips curve. And I can't resist another moment. In one violent yank, I pull him down by the back of his neck and land my mouth over his. An explosion of euphoria erupts in every cell in my body all at once. It's as if I've waited for this very kiss my entire life. And now that I have it, I never want it to end. Elliot goes for the gold and penetrates my mouth with his tongue, and it's an all-out war breaking out between the two of us. A hard moan comes from me as I do my best to pull him closer to swallow him whole. Holy heck! A young girl screams at the top of her lungs, and we pull away to find Harper and Royce standing there aghast. Behind them I spot Sadie and a boy who shares Cash's features. Aiden, I'm guessing. Oh my freaking gosh, Harper shrills. You have got to be kidding me, Mom. Harper belts out a genuine scream, and everything in me recoils at the thought of her seeing me like this. Are you freaking insane? I'm dating Royce. You cannot be thirsting for his dad. That's just freaking gross. Ah, I wail as I shelter my eyes with my fingers from having to see the agony on Harper's face, and I trot off around the side of the porch with Elliot hot on my heels. This way, he says, taking my hand and pulling us into an alcove that's loaded with firewood. His lips curl slightly. Unfortunately, the closest entry back into the house is just past the very people we inadvertently terrorized. I'd walk a mile to avoid them. Mom? Harper howls as a set of footfalls speed in this direction. Get back here. I'm not done with you yet. Funny. Elliot purses his lips as he looks to me. I was thinking the same thing. I shrug up at him. Maybe we should really give them something to see. I lean up just as he bows down, and just before our lips can meet, a surge of heat fills my upper torso and races to my face. The ground beneath my feet begins to wobble, and the scenery around me begins to spin. Oh no, I pant as sheer panic begins to fill me. I have to go. I try my best to bolt, but his grip on me only increases. Elliot, please, I have to get out of here. I... Before I can finish... The scenery around me changes completely, and I find myself standing in the haunted book barn once again. Shoot, I say, as I give a glance around at the boisterous crowd with their Dexter University sweatshirts on full display. I glance toward the cafe and spot the cameras and the rest of the setup for Morgan's taping of murder, mayhem, and baking. Just to the right of that, I spot Griffin Barker and Elliot having a rather heated conversation, and I know exactly what day it is. Billy? A deep voice strums from behind, and I turn to find Elliot Greenlee standing there, 
looking wildly concerned and just a touch angry. What the hell just happened? 15. Son of a biscuit, I howl. I've dragged you with me. Elliot does a wild-eyed survey of the crowd, and I can practically see his brain ticking away far too fast for him to fathom. How did you do this? He takes a bold step into the crowd, and I yank him back by his arm. That's the one billion dollar question, I mutter. But never mind how I did this. You can't go charging out there. You might see... Is that me? He growls the words out while staring intently at his slightly younger self. Yes, that's you. I grab him by the hand and trot us over to the bookshelves a few feet over, nearly having a run-in with my former self in the process. Gah! I wail, and I pull Elliot close. We need to lay low. You're a traveler. His lips curve as his eyes scour my features. That's how you ended up in my shower, isn't it? My mouth opens and closes. You know about this? My finger spins in the air at the bookstore in general, unsure of where to point. What does it mean? I know nothing about this. Heck, I can't even control it. Wait, can I control it? It's a transmundane offshoot. Extremely rare. He frowns a moment. What do you mean you can't control it? I just can't. I get these hot flashes, and before I know it, I'm here or there or anywhere. Anyway, it doesn't happen with every hot flash, and I don't know why that is. A hot flash? He shakes his head. That's a temporary state. That might mean when the hot flash dissipates, your abilities may as well. That makes sense. Not that much makes sense anymore. Anyway, it's only been happening since I've been in Glimmer Spell, and I've already taken a jaunt back in time a handful of times. Not forward? I shake my head. Morgan and Teddy took me to see a couple of women out in Cider Cove, out on the coast, who they thought might be able to help. The conclusion of that meeting was that I was a time traveler, but that I wasn't any good at it. Elliot, I have no idea how to get us back to the present. He sighs as he glances back at the crowd. How long do these episodes typically last? Minutes. With the exception of the one where I ended up in your shower, I guess that wasn't really time traveling. I just ended up in your shower in the present tense, and that's where I remained. His lips purse a moment. You may have been traveling off by a minute or so. Oh, Lord. I guess the worst thing that can come of it is that I gain a minute on the back end of my life. But we are clearly in the past, Billy. He pulls me in close as a couple of co-eds pass us by. Hey, detective. A cute blonde winks over at him as she and the rest of her friends sail on past us. He blows out a breath. This could get ugly. I know just about everyone in this room, and I'm in this room in duplicate. He glances over to the cafe, where he stands glowering at the slightly younger version of me as I head to the kitchen as the show prepares to kick off. Thinking good thoughts about me? I tease. Never mind what I was thinking. Oddly enough, he's glaring at himself at the moment. There's Griffin. He nods to where Griffin is talking to Vera the woman who is set to mic me up in just a few minutes. Since the killer doesn't strike for at least another hour, maybe I should head over and have a word with him. Good idea, I say, as he starts to stalk off, and I reel him right back. On second thought, bad idea, I hiss. I need to go with you. I was holding on to you when I yanked you back here with me, and I don't want to find out the hard way that I should have been holding on to you to get you where we truly belong. You're right, he says, taking up my hand. You're coming with me. But... Before I can protest, Elliot has navigated us right into Griffin Barker's path. Here he is, the deceased, examining us, glancing down at our conjoined hands and lifting his brows over at his old friend. 
You work fast. He shakes his head. No wonder you told me she was off limits. You've already pulled that fish ashore. You said that? A laugh gets caught in my throat as I look up at Elliot, and he averts his eyes. I may have said that. I can see why. Griffin runs his gaze freely over my body. Watch out for this one. He's here to help you. Elliot cuts him off. You're in danger, Griffin, and I don't know if I can stop it. Tell me right now who in this room poses a threat to you. A threat? He blinks back, amused, before his chest bounces with a quiet laugh. Is this your way of impressing the new woman in your life? He looks my way with a wry smile tucked in his cheek. The only person in danger around here is you. I don't think he's looking to take a bite out of crime as much as he's looking to take a bite out of you. Griffin, Elliot growls, what the hell is going on with you right now? You're in trouble. Is it Jenny? I can't help but interject myself into the conversation. She's awfully ticked. And what about Vera? She's been shooting daggers at you all afternoon. And Sylvia, she's in on your little secret, isn't she? The one regarding the Chatham House? Griffin's face irons out. You know about that? His eyes enlarge as he looks to the two of us, and Elliot grabs a hold of his shirt and pulls him in. What in the hell are you doing? Elliot growls at his old friend, just as the ground bounces beneath my feet and the room begins to spin. I give Elliot's hand a hard squeeze as the scenery changes around us, and we're right back on that dark, snowy porch where the Arctic breeze shocks us back to reality. Griffin looks to Elliot and me, and I let out a short-lived scream. You brought him with us! I swat him on the chest, just as Griffin takes a staggering step back. What's going on? The poor man looks morbidly confused as his body begins to dissipate right before our eyes. Who killed you, Griffin? Elliot bellows as Griffin begins to float toward the sky. The baby, he says in a ghostly whisper. And just like that, Griffin Barker is once again no more. He said, the baby, I whisper as I take a few steps out. The sound of footfalls speeds this way, and we see Sadie shaking her head at us. I found them, she shouts, and soon Harper, Royce, and Cash's son, Aiden, are upon us once again. What are you doing? Harper pins me with that worried look on her face. You had me worried sick. Look, I'm going to have fun with my friends tonight. Studying biology? Yes, she counters. I'm sorry I freaked out on you. Just don't, like, run off on me and break a hip or something on my account. You kids have fun, Elliot says as he leads us past them. There's pizza in the kitchen. Where are you going? His son shouts after us. I'm taking Billy to grab a bite to eat. We sail through the house. I grab my coat and purse, and Elliot speeds us into his SUV and out onto the road in no time. All right, Billy. He pulls into an alcove that overlooks Glimmerspell. The view isn't as magnificent as it was from his back patio, but it's equally majestic. Start talking. I've already told you everything I know. Besides, I think you're the one who needs to start talking. Evidently, you know about travelers. Give me the answers I need, Elliot. I beg of you. He looks out at the lights twinkling from the cozy town below. I know someone you can talk to. They might be able to help, but not tonight. Okay. I nod as a sense of relief swells in me. I'm not alone in this. Elliot knows something, knows someone, and he's going to help me. Then let's focus on Griffin, I guess. He gave us a clue. He said... The baby. A thought comes to me, and I gasp. Oh, wow. I think she was pregnant. Who? Sylvia. 
I distinctly remember her touching her stomach the other day in a way that expectant mothers are prone to do. Maybe she's having his baby. I bet she wasn't all that thrilled with the idea, and that's why they exchanged such nasty words the other day. I wince. And by other day, I mean when I traveled back and did a little eavesdropping. I heard him tell her, I'm not doing this with you here. And then he asked her not to utter a word regarding the things she learned about his life, that it was for him to handle. He said he didn't want their past to complicate his future. And then she said that he didn't have a future. She told him that life as he knew it ended that day. Elliot, that was the day of his murder. I spoke to her again at Fay Gardens the other night, the night we inadvertently showered together. She told me that Griffin Barker was collecting blood from her, that he was donating it to the Chatham House, an organization that works closely with Winchester General Hospital to replenish their blood bank. Elliot's jaw hardens. I can guarantee you that's not true. A thousand nefarious thoughts sail through my mind at once. Oh no, I pant. You think he was giving it to the Faulkner Coven, don't you? Selling it. Griffin was too greedy to give anything away. Wow. I give a hard blink. I guess if times ever get tough, I know what business to jump into next. He shoots me a look. Okay, never mind. I press my lips tightly. There's one more thing Sylvia told me. I look to Elliot Greenley and wonder how he has this intimate knowledge of the supernatural, how he may have stumbled upon it himself, and a part of me doesn't want the answers. She said Griffin Barker was operating under a false identity. She said that she told you about it three weeks ago, and that you did nothing, I hiss. His features harden as he looks my way. She said you were covering for him. Is it true? A thick silence crops up between us. I was looking into it, he says. Anything else? She told him that if he didn't come clean, she was going to expose him to everyone in that room after the taping. Elliot expires a deep breath. What other suspects are you looking at? Vera. I think she really loved him. According to Jenny, Vera was his first co-ed girlfriend of the bunch. Jenny said Vera wasn't all that thrilled to learn he was moving on with her. Anyway, Vera mentioned that the day of the murder, she and Griffin were discussing a secret he had, one that had the power to destroy him. She's the one that pointed me to Sylvia, and Sylvia exposed his blood bank dealings to me. Elliot, do you think Griffin was a vampire? Is that why he had a false identity? His eyes close a moment. No. Griffin wasn't a vampire. He was just another regular human in over his head. The identity he stole belonged to his brother. He's been using it for years. His real name was Dale Barker. He was a small-time swindler who ended up doing big time for corporate fraud that turned into a felony offense. His father had a great team of lawyers on the case, but he still got put away. A few palms were greased, and Griffin was released early. He thought he'd never work again, and he was probably right. So he arranged to have his brother's identity work as his own. The Faulkner saw him as someone who would easily play their games, and apparently they were right. Griffin got a cushy payday out of it. That's a lot to take in. Elliot... He was poisoned with an injection of ricin. That's a sophisticated act of violence, don't you think? Maybe none of those women did this to him. Maybe it was the Faulkners. No way. He shakes his head. They're even greedier than Griffin was. He was handing them a delicacy they could never refuse. The blood from beautiful women is the most coveted of them all, and the tastiest, so I hear. A smile curls in his cheek briefly. Okay, then we've got Jenny, Vera, and Sylvia. And one prospective pregnancy. 
Wait a minute. That day back at Rex's steakhouse, Jenny said something odd to me. I shake my head as I try my best to recall it. She said she really thought he loved her, that she gave him everything, and that she was ready and willing to give him the rest of her life, that all he had to do was go along the path destiny had already given them. When I asked her which path that was, she said it was a path that she'd obviously still be taking. I lean back in the seat of his truck. Maybe Jenny is in the family way, too. I search his face as if it held the answers. Is there a medical facility at the university? No, there's nothing more than a nurse on site. They send any serious cases to a network of doctors that work out of Winchester General. I pull out my phone and hit the search engine hard. What are you looking for? He asks, leaning over a notch. There's only one gynecologist the university directs their female students to. I look up at Elliot and shed a satisfied grin. And I think you'll be able to get us into his office with no trouble at all. His brows depress as he scowls. My brother. Dr. Warren Greenlee, gynecologist extraordinaire, wasn't up for letting us snoop on his patients. He shouted something about the Hippocratic Oath over the phone to Elliot, then let him know he would call the sheriff's department if he knew it would get him somewhere. But after a little finagling, Elliot managed to wrangle enough info from his brother to land us inside the exact same gynecologist's office that I sat in when I had my impromptu meet and greet with Charlene. Half the fluorescent lights are on up above. The air is icy, and the scent of industrial floor cleaner burns my nostrils. We must have just missed the cleaning crew, I whisper. Although I have no idea why I'm bothering to keep my voice down, there's not a soul here with us. Good, Elliot whispers back, giving my hand a squeeze. I don't need anyone pointing me out in a lineup. And for whatever reason, whispering feels right. My teeth graze my lips as I stare down at our conjoined hands. I'd like to think Elliot's decision to do so had some romantic implications. But in reality, he's probably afraid I'll drift off to the scene of the crime again without him. And knowing my time-traveling track record, he's probably right. We head into the reception area, where a row of computers sits to the left, and both Elliot and I plant ourselves behind one. I'll start with Jenny, I say. You look up Vera. Elliot pauses a moment, with his hands poised over a keyboard as he looks my way. You really think this is your investigation, don't you? I'm the one your ex publicly outed as the killer. It's up to me to clear my good name. I'm the lead homicide detective on this case, Billy. He sighs as he starts clicking away. I'll clear your good name. And I'll talk to Iona for you. No way, no how. A throaty laugh bumps from me. You leave Iona to me. I stopped looking to men to solve my problems the day I caught my ex knocking a co-ed senseless into my headboard. Besides, I have to work with Iona. It's best I iron this out. She seems like a smart woman. She's probably already figured out that I don't take orders from people. I glance his way. Is that why you're no longer together? Was she barking out orders your way? A soft chuckle strums through him. No, I don't take orders too well either, but she knew that going in. Iona and I were simply two different people. We have a good son, though, so for that reason alone, I won't disparage the mother of my child. Jenny McAllister, I say as her name pops up on the screen. I'm in her chart. I shake my head as I quickly scan the patient info and dart down to the last visit and read the doctor's notes. Fourteen weeks gestation. Pregnancy is moving along without incident. Pedestrian symptoms of nausea and loss of appetite. I look to Elliot, and he ticks his head to the side. Good work, Detective Buttonwood. Although we can't be sure the child belongs to Griffin. I'm sure. 
I say, as I get to typing once again. And now I'll look up Sylvia Arden. Anything on Vera yet? Vera Henley doesn't seem to have a file. Let me look her up on the school roster. She might have a formal name I'm not aware of. Elliot pulls out his phone and starts in on a different search altogether, while Sylvia's name pops up on my screen and I click into it. Elliot, I say as I tap my finger over the monitor. Look at this. The doctor's note. It reads, 11 weeks gestation. Spotting has ceased. Cervix is normal. I turn his way. Sylvia is pregnant, too. Griffin wasn't just an ex-con. He was an idiot running around spreading his seed. And honestly, I don't know what those girls were thinking, either. Elliot glares past my shoulder. I know what they're thinking. What? Elliot closes his eyes a moment. The chemical makeup from the blood of a pregnant woman is significantly different than that of anyone else. It not only tastes supreme, but it has the ability to heighten a vampire's powers. It goes against the code of ethics for a vampire to bite a pregnant woman. So this blood is not only highly coveted, but it's savored and stored for special occasions. It's difficult to procure and very expensive. Special occasions? Like birthday parties and graduations? Like rituals, he counters. Lovely. So the Faulkners were going to pay a premium for maternal blood? He nods. I'm guessing that's it. He holds up his phone. Vera doesn't have any other name that's registered with the university, so my guess is she's not with child. Then I guess we have what we came for. Let's get out of here before this night gets any more exciting than it already has. Elliot and I jump back into his truck. He offers to take me out for a bite, but it's getting close to midnight, and I have the taping of murder, mayhem, and baking tomorrow afternoon, so I let him know I'll take a rain check. Beauty sleep is a very real thing at my age, although I didn't tell him that. But it's true. And the last thing I need documented on YouTube for years to come is bags and dark circles under my eyes. He pulls up alongside the driveway to Teddy's home and walks me to the door as those celadon eyes bore hard into mine. Billy, who else knows about your ability to travel? Just Morgan, Mabel, Teddy, Sonny, two women from Cider Cove, and now you. He cocks a brow. Mabel? Mabel Buttonwood? My mouth opens, and I'm about to refute the idea, but think better of it. Elliot seems to be in the know with just about everything else. I don't see how me seeing a ghost would surprise him. I nod up at him. And don't worry, my secret ends with you. I'm not telling another soul, not even Harper. My breath plumes in a white fog. Are you coming to the haunted book barn tomorrow for the taping? It's doubling as a vigil for you-know-who. I wouldn't miss it. Elliot scans my features as if he were considering his options. For someone who declared an end to her romantic life just a few hours ago, I'm sure rooting for round two with his lips. A smile flickers on his lips as if he knew what I was thinking. I'll see you tomorrow, Billy get some rest. He takes off, and I scowl at him as he hops into his truck and takes off into the night. A righteous anger burns through me as I watch his taillights disappear. I'm glad he didn't kiss me. Elliot Greenlee is stubborn and ornery. Not exactly boyfriend material. I bet he thinks he's too good for me, that I'm too old for him. Of course he does. He has dozens of co-eds waiting to take a spin on his pole. Aegis jerk. All night I ruminate on the peculiar happenings of this crazy night, my beauty sleep evading me at every turn. I'm going to look like a zombie come morning. And there are so many people to blame for it. Harold for driving me to Glimmerspell to begin with. 
Elliot for thinking it was perfectly fine to kiss me at one point in the night and not the other, and whoever killed Griffin Barker. All three of them seemed to be building the perfect storm to take out my sanity. There's not much more I can do about Harold than I've already done by cutting him out of my life. There's nothing I ever want to do with Elliot again for offering up what amounted to a stinging rejection at the door. But that killer, now that's someone I can sink my teeth into. I'm going to have a talk with all three of my suspects come tomorrow afternoon. Here's hoping one of them will lead me straight to whoever thought it was a good idea to inject Griffin with a needle full of death. I finally fall asleep, but it's not the active homicide investigation I dream about. Instead, I play out that kiss between Elliot and me on a steamy loop. Why Elliot wouldn't want more of that delicious kiss, I will never understand. His loss... Little did he know I had brought a purse full of Teddy's infamous salad dressing along for the ride with me tonight. That second kiss might have led to far more interesting places than he could have ever imagined. His loss, indeed. Mine, too. 16. I'm a zombie. Maybe Elliot can add that to his running list of paranormal creatures. I slept for all of ten minutes, and every step I take this morning, it feels as if I'm walking underwater. By afternoon, the haunted book barn is bustling with bodies, mostly students from Dexter University who came out for the quasi-memorial, but according to the crowd Harper is congregating with, all of Glimmerspell High is here as well. The film crew is here setting up, and there are enough lights to illuminate a football field at midnight. Cheery music bleats through speakers, and the scent of fresh coffee permeates the entire barn as Teddy and I work non-stop to fill orders. Teddy shuffles my way, holding a rather obnoxious green smoothie. She's clad in pink once again, just like the day I met her and a part of me wonders if I've crawled back in time once again. Acorn bounces between us and takes one look at the concoction in Teddy's hand, and he begins to whimper. You and me both, buddy, I say, patting him between his curly ears. You and me both. Teddy waves us off. Spinach, pineapple juice, an apple, a dash of turmeric powder— a pinch of black pepper, and a splash of guava juice. She shoves it into my hand. Drink up, sister. After the acrobatics you and the detective underwent last night, you'll need it to revive your bones. That man took everything out of you. The eyes never lie. He took everything out of me, all right. I touch my lips to the smoothie and smack them together until I get the hint of a flavor. Hey, this isn't bad. Darn tootin' it isn't bad. It's good for you is what it is. So who, what, where, when, and why? Start from the beginning and don't leave out any steamy details. I can take them. It's been a few moons since I was taken into the woods and shown a thing or two. Speaking of which, what's the size of this thing we're talking about? I wouldn't know. I make a face. Nothing happened. Actually, everything happened. Just not that. We did share a kiss, although it was short-lived. Harper saw us making out, and her head exploded all over the woods. Then I got hot under the collar with one of those special power surges, and I took off for tomorrow and ended up dragging Elliot with me. Technically, it wasn't tomorrow. It was yesterday. She sucks in a sharp breath, just as Morgan and Mabel pop up. Acorn gives a soft bark as if he were worried for me, and he probably should be. What's going on? Mabel asks, looking perfectly disgusted by the smoothie in my hand. Nothing, I say. It's actually delicious and healthy, I say, taking a few more swigs and suddenly feeling more alert. Lord knows I've guzzled my weight in coffee, and it didn't do a thing. Teddy just might be onto something with this. Everything's going on, 
Teddy corrects, just as Sunny joins our little circle with her blonde curls bouncing, her skin glowing as if she put a little too much of that blue iridescent shimmering powder on. All right, I'm here. She winks my way. The good part can begin. Did you use the salad dressing? All four women lean in with their eyes agog and an ear tipped my way. I take it they've all been handed a similar mason jar by Teddy at some point. No to the salad dressing, but it's still in my purse if any of you have the sudden urge to dress up a good time. Teddy shakes her head as she looks to the girls. They smooched, and she took him through time and back. Now that he's had a taste of true love and adventure, there's nothing that's going to hold these two back. The big bad detective and Billy the Kid are Glimmer Spell's official new power couple. Oh, really? A female growls from behind, and we turn to find Iona looking mildly amused, the look of revenge already brewing in her smoldering eyes. Good to know. I'll have to congratulate Elliot on the endeavor. And here I thought he'd never settle down. Her lips crimp into a devious smile, because, let's face it, she sees right through the malarkey. She zips off into the crowd before I can stop her. Wait, I call out, but it's too late. She's done a thorough disappearing act. Great, I sigh. Elliot is going to think I'm a nut, and he won't be too far off with the assessment either. I grunt as I look to the faces still surrounding me. Let's just say it didn't end well, and I'll be just fine if I never see his handsome yet smug mug ever again. The four of them moan as the smiles drip right off their faces. Mabel shrugs. If it makes you feel better, there's still a chance of meeting your soulmate even upon your death. I knew I looked forward to death for a reason. Morgan shoots me a look. Take a little break and perk yourself up. I'll get the ingredients together for the bumbleberry pie. I'll help, Teddy volunteers before leaning my way. I've got some laxatives we can work into a special piece for you-know-who. That'll teach him to dine on your lips and not come back for seconds. They take off, and I hoist up the green smoothie in my hands as if I was toasting Sunny. To being single in Glimmerspell, I say. Here's to living our best life without a man. She makes a face. Sorry, Billy. I'm living my best life with men, nightly. I can't help it. It's just the way I'm hardwired. I like men. They smell nice and they make me feel good. But I'm sure you'll find comfort in other things, like cookies and naps. She takes off. Hey, I like cookies and naps. And I like books, too. Book boyfriends are a very real thing. And I live my best life with them nightly, too. About six different people give me a wayward look, so I set the smoothie down and do a disappearing act out of the cafe myself. I'm just about to crest the book tables when Harper comes at me. She's all dolled up, has her long, dark hair perfectly coiled, and she's donned her holiest ripped jeans and tightest sweater. She looks all of 20, and suddenly I'm feeling as if Elliot would be much more interested in someone from Glimmerspell High than someone of my age and stature. Whoever said age was just a number must have been a woman, because clearly men have not gotten the memo. Mom! She rattles me by the shoulders just as Acorn runs up and barks, as if he were trying to warn me about something. I know, I know. You're still steaming about the fact you caught me making out under a full moon with the hottest man in town. For your information, someone gasps from behind her, and soon Harper has been replaced with Charlene Plowman as the blonde bumps her off to the side, and to my surprise, or more accurately, shock and horror, Harold crops up right next to her. Billy Boobay! Charlene screeches while rattling me by my arms. Did you say you made out under a full moon with the hottest man in town? Acorn barks, 
and I'm wishing he would morph into an attack dog right about now. It's Billy Buttonwood, I say, carefully plucking her off me. And that's none of your... I catch a glimpse of Harold, with his reddish-blonde hair slightly frizzing, the tip of his pointed ears burned with color, his nostrils flaring. It's safe to say he doesn't look amused by the news of where my mouth has been. Why, yes, my lips expand with a devious smile. I was, in fact, making out with the hottest guy in town. I shrug over at the two of them. What are you doing here? Are you trying to ruin my mojo? I give Harold a look for even thinking about it. Charlene bounces as if her feet were on springs, and her blonde mop bounces right along with her, as do her boobs and bulging belly, too. She's wearing an oversized sweater dress in warm peach, along with brown slouchy boots, and I slightly resent the fact she looks adorable, pulling off a look that makes her belly all that much more pronounced. Did you hear that? She bumps her hip to his, just as I spot Iona pulling a man in a dark coat her way. And once he turns slightly, I can see it's Elliot. Just great. Iona gets right to spilling the beans before Elliot frowns my way and stalks in this direction. Charlene clasps her hands together. Billy Boobe has landed herself the town hottie. Elliot's brows dip a notch, and a brief smile twitches on his lips. Perfect. Why am I suddenly moved to dig that salad dressing out of my purse and splash it in his face? Harold's lids slit to nothing. And you did this in front of our daughter? Mom, Harper shakes her head. I was trying to warn you. She hitches her head their way before sighing. What do you want? Are you, like, stalking us or something? Look, Dad, I'm hanging out with my friends today, and Mom is shooting a video in, like, ten seconds. Maybe shelf the drama for now. She takes off, and Elliot steps up. Billy? He nods my way, and those electric eyes of his latch to mine, and for a brief second, everyone in the bookstore, including Harold and his tramp, up and disappears. Elliot? I try my hardest to scowl at him, but don't seem capable. This is Harold, my soon-to-be ex, and his team queen, Charlene. I make a face at her, because she just so happens to be openly panting at Elliot. Not that I can blame her. Okay, we get it, he's hot, I say, plucking a book off the table next to me and fanning her with it. Heads up, there's a two-for-one sale in the steamy romance section. You'd better get while the getting is good. I spin her around, and she sails off in that direction without hesitation. Now to get rid of him. Harold glares over at Elliot, and I pause a moment at the impromptu juxtaposition before me. Harold is just a smidge shorter than Elliot, but standing next to a handsome steed like Detective Greenley, Harold looks like a troll with what looks to be a wart forming on his nose. Dear God, has that wart always been there, or is that something new? Who are you? Harold growls, and Acorn sits upright next to me, as if he was interested in this show, too. Elliot looks my way, no smile, that permanent look of displeasure hardening his features. Apparently, I'm Billy Buttonwood's new beau, Detective Greenley. He offers Harold his hand, and the troll is slow to shake it. New bow? Harold glowers at me. What the hell do you think you're doing running around this place like some low-life Jezebel, picking up the first dope you see? Elliot's brows hike with amusement. Low-life Jezebel? Dope? I step in close to the man I spent far too much of my life with. It takes a dope to no one. If you'll both excuse me, I have a show to prepare for. Acorn and I stalk past them and bump into a body. Vera Henley hops back and laughs. Her long stringy hair is pulled into a ponytail. 
enunciating that foundation with its orange undertone she chooses to slather all over her face. There's a hard line at the base of her jawline where her foundation touches off, and her neck glows pale as paper. You'd think the makeup artist they hire for this shindig would have stepped up by now and saved the Oompa Loompa day. Billy, are you okay? You look a bit dazed, she says, gently straightening me by the shoulders before giving Acorn a quick pat. I'm fine. I didn't get enough sleep last night, that's all. Hey, I saw you talking to Detective Greenley. She leans in a notch. Any break in the case? No. I glance back to see Elliot and Harold carrying on what looks to be a genuine conversation, and a hearty groan rips from my throat. What in the world could those two have to talk about? Probably their obsession for girls from Dexter University. But if Detective Greenley stumbles onto the killer, I'm sure news will spread quickly. Glimmerspell is a small town. That it is. She casts a glance past me. Would you look at this crowd? It seems everyone showed up today, I marvel. Professor Barker must have really been loved. She averts her eyes. That he was. I feel terrible bringing him up that way. Of course she loved him. She was my so-called counterpart in that whole dating a professor scenario. So I decide to change the subject. Would you look at all the lights, the cameras? The stage crew is really showing out today. Are you hoping to parlay your talents right into Hollywood someday? She laughs at the thought. Most of us are just killing off a few units. I'm a biosciences major. I think in a past life I owned an apothecary shop. I spot Jenny McAllister by the mystery section, with her creamy vanilla hair smoothed to a silky perfection as she chats with a couple of girls. She's donned a pink Dexter sweatshirt, and her hand keeps touching her belly as if it were a habit she's looking to stop. If you'll excuse me, I see someone I need to speak to before we get started. Sure thing. Just come over to the registers and I'll mic you up. We split apart and Acorn and I speed right over to the mystery section, just as Jenny and her friends part ways. Thanks for sticking by my side, buddy, I tell the sweet pooch. I think we're in for a bumpy ride. I clear my throat as we come upon her. Jenny? My voice hikes a notch as I do my best to sound as if I didn't toss and turn half the night, battling Elliot in my brain while battling a serious case of the night sweats. She turns my way. Oh, hey, Billy. Things look as if they're going great. I mean, half the school showed up. She sighs at the crowd as tears fill her eyes. How I wish he was still here. I'd never met a man like him before. When things were good between us, they were really good. And I always believed that we could get back there, despite how crazy everything around us was spoken like someone who didn't inject the father of her child with ricin, I'm assuming. I'm sorry, I tell her. Thank you. You know, a part of me wishes he could have seen how many people cared about him. For a professor, he sure didn't think too highly of himself. He thought he was a fraud. She rolls her eyes as her hand floats to her belly once again. You really believed in him, though. I say it just above a whisper, because a part of me feels sorry for her because of it. You believed in him so much, you let him talk you into having a baby. What? Her eyes spring wide open as she pulls me deeper into the aisle. Billy! Her mouth contorts until she gives a long blink. You can't tell anybody. And no, he certainly didn't talk me into it. Her shoulders sag. He was allergic to prophylactics, she shrugs. And, well, he promised me nothing would happen. But something did happen. Her hand settles over her stomach and stays there. Allergic to prophylactics? I back up a notch. And you fell for that? She sucks in a quick breath. It was true. 
A hard groan expels from her. Okay, so maybe I was taken for a ride, but at least I have something or someone that will always remind me of how much he meant to me. She glances down at her flat belly. And oddly, they're going to have a sibling. You know? You know? She counters. A hearty growl comes from her. Oh, I knew she couldn't keep a secret. She pins her anger on someone behind me, and I follow her gaze, only to find Sylvia Arden thumbing through the table laden with books on vampires. She is going to get an earful. Jenny takes a step forward, and I block her path. Maybe save it for after the taping. I think Griffin would have wanted there to be some modicum of peace today, especially between the two of you. Besides, I actually have to speak with her about something. I head in Sylvia's direction and pick up a book on how to date a vampire, and I can't help but chuckle to myself. How's this for light reading? I say, holding it up to the petite redhead by my side. If you plan on living in Glimmerspell, I believe they call that required reading, she teases. Not that I believe any of that crap. My eyes meet up with hers. You didn't believe any of the crap Griffin was pushing, did you? I try to say it softly, just the way I did with Jenny, but it comes out a touch more accusatory. I can't help it. Sylvia was angry enough to kill, and she just may have. Her eyes sharpen over mine. No, I didn't, Billy. In the beginning, yes, but I didn't fall off the turnip truck the way he was hoping I would have. I called him out on all of his lies, and he didn't like it one bit. I may be younger than you, but I know enough to realize that men don't like to be outed for their transgressions. I don't see why she needed to drag age into this. I might have a few more strands of tinsel in my hair, and maybe I've got a few laugh lines etched around my cheeks. But other than that, I feel just the way I did when I was back at Dexter. A little more seasoned when it comes to life, but believe me, I'm exactly where I want to be. Good for you, I tell her. But don't you think you took things too far? I shrug. So he had a few girlfriends too many. In the future, dump em. Don't pump em full of toxins. Homicides should be entertained, never executed. I glance to where Harold and Charlene sip lattes in the cafe. Although I can see the lure. What? She laughs as she steps back. Billy, I didn't kill him. I wanted him fired, not dead. And believe me, if the killer hadn't made their move first, he would have been in the unemployment line once the weekend was over. Maybe Detective Greenlee was okay looking the other way, but I certainly wasn't. The guy was a creeper. He had some twisted daddy complex where he wanted to knock up as many co-eds as possible. And that whole blood bank thing? I think he wanted people to believe he was a vampire. Some girls actually get off on the rumors. I'm not one of them. Besides, I work at Fay Gardens. I have access to rice, not ricin, and I have zero knowledge of the difference between the two. I'm a lit major, not biomed. She takes off, and her words swill in my mind. Biomed? Would the university have access to ricin? Wait a minute. Biosciences. Biological sciences. I bet a student majoring in that might have access to a chemical or two. I glance across the room where Vera is miking up Morgan as we inch our way closer to the chute. I whip out my phone and look up Ryson. And sure enough, it looks as if it could easily be cooked up in a lab. Ricin is found in castor beans. Castor beans are also used to make castor oil. Huh. Harold's mother tried to get me to gulp down a spoonful when I was due to have Harper, just to move things along. Figures. 
Here I thought she was trying to help me out, and the old hag was probably trying to off me. Vera snags my eye once again. Elliot said she wasn't a patient of Dr. Greenlee's, and that Vera was indeed her formal name. My fingers dance over my phone as I look her up, and her picture shows up along with every award under the sun for her biotech achievements at Dexter. I expand one of the pictures of her smiling face and wince at how garish her foundation looks compared to the skin on her neck. Honestly, I don't think I've ever been so affronted by anyone's inability to match their skin tone properly before. But then, I can't blame the girl for wanting to add some color to her cheeks. Her neck is bone white. If her entire face looked that way, she'd resemble a corpse. I stop, cold. A corpse? Or someone who abhors sunlight? Some people look just fine, even if they're avoiding the sun's rays. And others? Well, they look like the walking dead. That picture party trick Harper taught me comes to mind, and I rest my thumb over Vera's picture and copy it before depositing it into the facial recognition search engine she used the other day. Oh my. Wow. I breathe the words out as a few pictures pop up from the Hargrove Historical Society, a town not too far from Glimmerspell. A woman in one of the photos, by the name of Alicia Porter, is a dead ringer for Vera Henley. The year reads 1878, and she's standing outside of Porter's apothecary shop. Two other pictures sit beneath it, one from 1942, taken in Glacier Harbor. A woman by the name of Kathy McKinnon stands with a row of jars set out before her at what looks to be the fairgrounds, and planted in front of them is a sign that reads, Tinctures and Salves. The last picture is from 1972. Marjorie Woods is listed as a member of the women's science movement in Journey Bay. A small orange sign behind her catches my eye, and I enlarge the picture as far as it will allow. Chatham House Blood Drive Chatham House Acorn barks and angles for the phone as if he wants in on the action, so I hold the screen his way. Oh, Acorn, I whisper as I shake my head. Not only is the face of each woman identical in each shot, but in the last two, that orange hue is taking over her skin. Whoever Vera Henley truly is, she's been botching up her cosmetics longer than I've been alive. I look her way, and without giving it a thought, my feet carry me in her direction. My mind swirls with questions to ask her and not one of them has to do with anything she might have floating in her makeup bag. I'm more interested in discussing her zest for science, for life, and particularly for the death that seems to elude her, and seems to have found Professor Barker instead. Vera seems to have had her fair share of brushes with destiny, and I have a feeling I'm about to have a brush with a bona fide vampire. Let's see if Vera Henley can make a believer out of me yet. 17. The coffee grinder goes off in the cafe and only adds to the chaos already ensuing all around us in the haunted book barn. The film crew is setting up the last of the lights and dollies for the camera equipment they'll be using to record Morgan's latest episode of Murder, Mayhem, and Baking, while the crowd around us only seems to thicken. And the plot of Griffin Barker's homicide seems to be thickening, too. Acorn barks as we come upon the suspect in question, and I get the feeling he senses something nefarious is afoot, too. Vera... I say, just as a heavyset man wearing a black sweatshirt with the words Lights, Camera, Action Studios written over the front, steps in front of her. There's a black toolbox in the back of the van, he says, handing her a set of keys. Grab it for me, would you? 
I'm on it. She makes a face my way as she takes off. Sound equipment. She wrinkles her nose. The fun never ends. Actually, I'm going out that way, too, I say, following along as she moves at a quickened clip. As soon as we step outside the front door, I regret my decision not to wait until she came back inside. Acorn shudders as we speed through the icy air. The thermometer is hitting its lower register today, and this sweater I've got on isn't enough to stave off the bitter chill. The snow is piled up in a series of small hills away from the parking lot, and the sidewalks have been carefully scraped clean. Morgan is meticulous about getting a crew out here daily to maintain the grounds for her customers. Vera, I wanted to ask you a question, I say, as we make our way around the side of the building, and Acorn moans as if he were suddenly regretting his decision to join us. I can't blame him. He's not wearing his winter booties. Anything. She points the remote in her hands toward a white cargo van, and it chirps to life. Are you getting cold feet about the show? She asks as she opens up the double doors to the back of the van, and the doors manage to act as a windbreaker as we huddle close to them. No cold feet, I say. Well, literally, but not figuratively. Vera, how well did you know Griffin Barker? I mean, I know you knew him well, but other than that, how well did you really know him? Her lips part as she looks to me, and I inspect her face at this close proximity. She's pretty. Good bones. Her eyelids are thick and heavy, and she looks vibrant and healthy for the most part. But is she basically an immortal? I knew him more than I needed to. A plume of fog emits from her as she sheds a dry laugh. Anyway, I never should have gotten involved with him. I regret it. Her jaw tenses as if she meant it. You were in love with him. My heart breaks for her as I say the words. You wanted him for yourself. But he wasn't easy to hold down, was he? Her chest bucks, and she closes her eyes. No, he wasn't. But that's not the whole story, is it? Have you heard of the Chatham House? Her eyes widen a moment. Chatham House? She glances at me, up and down. Oh, right. That was Griffin's charity or something of that nature. What about it? It didn't belong to Griffin. It belonged to you, didn't it? For some reason, Griffin must have caught on. I shake my head at her. You let him think he could do it. Why? Her mouth falls open as she begins to pant. I don't know what you're talking about. She starts to take off, and I grab her by the wrist. You, you've been alive a very long time, haven't you, Vera? Or should I say Alicia? Kathy? Marjorie? How many more names am I leaving out? Her eyes sharpen over mine, and her pupils turn as red as cauldrons, just a pinhole of crimson in a sea of amber, and any of the clinging doubt I may have had is instantly erased. Acorn growls her way, but Vera doesn't take her eyes off of me. A handful, she says, but they didn't have cameras that far back, so I guess you and your nosy efforts will never find out. She yanks her arm free with a powerful tug, and I nearly fall to the ground as I stagger to regain my footing. Acorn barks and jumps between us while growling and snapping at the woman. You fell in love with him, I pant the words out. You told him about your world, about the Chatham House. A foolish endeavor, I'm sure. You've been selling blood to the Faulkners for decades. Centuries, she counters. But modern instruments have allowed for the aspiration of bodily fluids to be far more humane than they've ever been. People want to give blood now. Her lips curl. It's downright heroic. I shake my head at her. But not all blood is the same, is it? I'm betting Griffin asked you that exact same question not too long ago. 
Her features turn to stone as she glares at me with all her might. No, it's not all the same, she says. Some blood is far more precious to come by. That of an expectant mother. But your days of conception have long been over, haven't they? I bet the Faulkners were willing to pay a premium for that precious blood, too. I'm guessing you were in on his scheme to impregnate a few co-eds, and in turn, you made him realize he was about to become a very rich man. Her chest bounces. Griffin was born greedy, and he died the same way. He died because you killed him, I say, taking a bold step closer to her. Either you couldn't stand the fact he was moving on from you, or it pained you to see he beat you at your own blood-selling game. Which was it? It was both, she seethes as she gives me a hard shove to the chest and sends me sailing into the back of the van. My hand slaps down over a long, heavy-duty flashlight made of heavy steel, and I grip it as if my life depended on it. And it just might. Why kill him in a public setting, I ask, carefully stepping away from the van while holding the flashlight close to my thigh. Why not suck the life right out of him in the woods and tear his flesh apart? The authorities would have thought a bear got him. A bear? She laughs with amusement. And it's only then I note her canines are sharpened to a point. Oh, Billy. I don't think you know what you're up against here, do you? A dark chuckle stirs in her chest. Nobody in Glimmerspell would have thought it was a bear. Not many people in Maine altogether. Only you and your foolish naivete would have thought so, even with your anemic knowledge of who truly resides here. She sharpens her anger over at me as she steps in close, and before I know it, I'm stumbling backward toward the woods a few feet away. I couldn't devour Griffin in the woods. All fingers would point toward me. No, I needed to have him die in a public setting with all of his paramours under one roof. They were just as angry with him. They could have easily done it. And once both Jenny and Sylvia start to grow in size, and rumors fly of who the father of their children might be, or was. Suspicions will be cast in all the right places. You won't get that far, I say, stopping just shy of leaving the parking lot. I won't let you. You won't let me? She gives a few quick blinks. My darling sweet Billy, you won't be here to stop me. With one hand, she grabs me by the throat, and I'm hoisted at least three feet off the ground, with what looks to be very little effort on her part. And with the other hand, she yanks the flashlight from me and tosses it to the ground. Acorn gives a sharp bark before latching his mouth over her ankle, but Vera doesn't seem bothered by his bone-crushing efforts in the least. Bill, no, it was you. I choke the words out as I claw to get her hand to release me. Your bio-research knowledge points the finger right in your direction. Jenny knows you were scorned by Griffin. I gag each word out in staccato breaths and struggle to suck in a single ounce of air. My body squirms as I grow desperate for her to release me, and just as my lungs threaten to burst, I give her a solid kick in the chest, and she sails backward, dropping me like a stone. I land on all fours and do my best to scamper away, but she snatches me by the ankle and reels me in again. Acorn snaps and barks while jumping over her back, and Vera gives him a shove that sends the curly-haired cutie gliding across the parking lot as if he were a bowling ball. Yes, I killed him. She growls as she pulls me underneath her with one quick yank. And I made sure it was painful. A laugh gurgles from her. I wanted him to suffer. I let him into the deepest chamber of my heart, where I haven't let a man in for over 200 years, and he tore me to shreds. I was nothing but some eager-to-please co-ed to him. He didn't care about my verbal proclamations. 
Nothing mattered to him but satisfying his flesh. So I thought if I let him in deeper, if I showed him who I truly was, who he could one day be, I thought we'd spend eternity together in a heaven of our own making. I cared for him, but not as much as you might think. I needed the money. I'm just about financially depleted, and the scholarship I've managed to procure can only take me so far. As soon as I graduate, I'll be able to hold my head above water. I always do. But just a few pregnant co-eds could make my life comfortable until then. I needed Griffin to perform a task, and he did. And once he was out of the way, I was going to continue the Chatham House efforts on his behalf. She winks my way. I know for a fact both Jenny and Sylvia would have gladly given blood a few more times at least. That's all I needed. She barks out a quick laugh. And he conned them into donating, using my own charity against me. He sold their blood to the Faulkners and amassed a small fortune in doing so. That's when he realized he was sitting on a gold mine. That's when he did a little research spoke to the right people in the Faulkner coven. He was plotting to do away with me, Billy. Me, the very person who let him in on the realm that existed around him. I happened to be at his home the afternoon a package was delivered to him from Israel. He doesn't know that I saw it, but that was the day I knew he needed to die. You see, it was him or me. What was in that package could have ended my time on Earth, and I couldn't allow for that to happen. I didn't come this far, work this hard, just to have him ruin things for me. He wasn't interested in choosing to create a heaven on Earth with me. He chose hell. He had to go. She pulls me in by the shoulders and bounces my head off the frozen ground until my eyes are rolling back into my head. You've chosen hell too, Billy. And today you'll be going there. When you see Griffin, tell him I said hello. Her mouth opens wide as her head lunges down, and I tuck and roll to the left as she misses me by a mile. The long handle of the flashlight catches my eye, and I clasp onto it and come back with Herculean strength of my own and wallop her over the temple with it leaving a nasty mark in its wake. A hard groan comes from her, and her hand rises to meet the pain. I pull back my arm and wallop her again, this time initiating a satisfying thud as the metal meets her skull. Acorn gives an approving bark as he dances around us in the snow. I land Vera onto her stomach and dig my knee between her shoulder blades raising the flashlight once again in a cheap attempt to finish her off. I'm pretty sure a vampire isn't going to meet its demise by way of a flashlight, but that won't stop me from trying to make it happen. Billy! A deep voice thunders, and I look up to see Elliot running this way with his gun drawn. Freeze! He shouts, and I raise my hands, inadvertently dropping the flashlight right over Vera's head with a thud. She grunts hard as she struggles to look my way. Oh, for Pete's sake, she groans while sinking her face into the snow, and Acorn barks over her as if he were reprimanding her. She did it, I shout as Elliot speeds over. She killed Griffin, I pant. She confessed. She's a vampire, Elliot. She's the one that ran the Chatham house, not Griffin. He caught on and he was selling blood to the vampires himself. Elliot pulls me off her, and soon he's on her back, yanking a pair of silver bracelets from his pocket as he cuffs her. His eyes meet with mine. Good work. Don't ever do that again. He growls before his affect softens just a notch. You could have gotten yourself killed. He calls it in, and soon the grounds are crawling with sheriff's deputies. Sheriff Cash Archer comes up to me amidst the melee and shakes his head as he inspects me. Elliot says you put it all together yourself. Billy, what were you thinking confronting that woman out here on your own? You don't know the things she was capable of. I do, I tell him. But you're right. 
I shouldn't have confronted her on my own. Thankfully, I won't ever have to do that again, because I've cleared my good name. Get inside, Billy. Cash shakes his head as he examines me. Your teeth are chattering, and I'd hate for you to catch your death. Morgan has a show to shoot. She's looking everywhere for you. He takes a moment to glare at someone over my shoulder before stalking off for the bookstore once again. Before I can turn around, Mr. Tall, Dark, and Brooding appears in front of me. His lips curve as he washes those clear green eyes over mine. That was quite the introduction to Glimmerspell, he says. I do hope you'll stay. Do you? I ask, amused. Yes. His chest depresses as he lets out a breath. It's time for the show to begin. And after that, there's someone here I'd love to introduce you to. Let me guess. You have a sibling who's a shrink? No, but I have a mother who runs a dairy farm, he counters. A breath hitches in my throat. Marceline? The one who gifted Morgan that hourglass that bonked me straight into yesterday? He gives a slight bow. That's the one. I can't wait to meet your mother. His eyes latch over mine, and it jolts me just the way it did that first day. His features harden once again, and he's right back to scowling. And then I'd like to have a word with you myself. Elliot would like to have a word with me. Why does it feel as if I'm about to be sent to the principal's office? Elliot's lips curve just a notch, as if maybe I am. 18. Murder, mayhem, and baking goes off without a hitch. Morgan regales us with the story of the Nelson family from Crystal Lake. The kids were grown. Mrs. Nancy Nelson was once the principal of a private school, K-12. through Mr. Duff Nelson worked as a foreman at an oil rig. Both were brutally slaughtered in their home one dark October night. Nancy was nearly decapitated, her head found in the toilet. Mr. Nelson was splattered over the walls of three different rooms. Rumors ran rampant, from a wild bear breaking in through the shattered living room window to a psychotic hopped up on drugs, wielding a knife. Nobody knew for certain. The case was cold for ten years, unsolved. Until a year ago, when detectives discovered that they had overlooked something simple right from the beginning. The window was broken from the inside, with the glass shards shooting out onto the patio. A few strands of short dark hair were found at the scene, and the Nelsons were both gray. Genetic testing pointed to their son as the owner of these stray tresses right from the beginning, but that wasn't odd at first because he lived there. He claimed he was at his girlfriend's the night of the attack, and she attested to the fact. It turned out the son was an addict. The Nelsons cut off his funds in an effort to help him, thus cutting off his ability to get more of what his body craved. He went rogue, got a hold of some mind-altering cheap stuff, and a temporary psychosis was induced. The day after the murder, he slept it off at his girlfriend's house, which aided in his alibi. In the beginning, he played the role of the concerned son and continued to do so right up until he was caught. The murders were brutal. It makes it clear that monsters can be fully human, too, and that a chemically induced psychosis could sometimes bring those monsters out. The bumbleberry pie is delicious. Teddy holds it up to Sonny and me while Acorn barks and jumps, struggling to get a bite for himself. So I accidentally on purpose drop a piece of crust for him. Sonny moans. We need to get some bumbleberry trees stat, Teddy. You won't find any. Morgan shakes her head. It's a trio of raspberries, blueberries, and cherries. And even though the fruit was frozen, it's still pretty good. 
She looks out at the crowd as they each enjoy a slice of the bumbleberry pie. Morgan whipped up enough this morning to feed the entire state of Maine. We made it in Elliot's honor since he was bumbling his way through the case. She tweaks her brows his way. But as it turns out, Elliot wasn't needed. She raises the slice of pie in her hand. To my Aunt Billy, may everyone in Glimmerspell take note. Nobody messes with Billy Buttonwood. Hear, hear, Sonny and Teddy shout in unison. The film crew is still clearing out. The students from Dexter are still here in number and growing more boisterous by the minute. From the corner of my eye, I see Harold and Charlene pinning Harper between a couple of the book tables, and I suddenly lose my appetite because I have no choice but to intervene. I take a step in that direction, and Sonny appears in front of me. So we never got a chance to talk about the things Elliot went over with you. She looks intently into my eyes, as if she were trying to pry into my mind. What do you think? I glance back at Harper, and she seems to be holding her own for the moment. I think the things Elliot told me were terrifying. I look to Morgan, Teddy, and Sonny. He let me know that the three of you are very well aware of the things he was saying. I nod. And today, outside with Vera, I discovered they were true. I believe in them. Do you? Teddy leans in. Oh, hun, I've seen it all and believe it all. And I'm neither transmundane, vampire, where, or fay, but I'm no bore. She winks my way. I've been known to bite, howl at the moon, and flirt with the best of them. Don't worry, kid. I'll help you navigate the waters. Thanks, Teddy. I appreciate that. Sonny nods. And now that you know about us, I'll make sure to give you a proper introduction to Glimmerspell. For the briefest of moments, her skin shimmers in the light and takes on a blue cast that I can't deny, and I gasp at the sight. Sonny! Are you a fae? Darn right I am. And don't you worry about Elliot Greenley giving you the cold shoulder. I'll make sure you're plenty entertained in Glimmer Spell. The second half of your life is going to be far more interesting than the first. It's going to be one big party from here on out. Spoken like a true fairy. Morgan makes a face as she pulls me to the side. Billy, are you okay? You've had one heck of a time since you've been in town. First with the corpse giving you a hug on day one, that knock to the head that sent you flopping through time like a fish out of water, and your ghostly niece. Elliot Greenlee's lips, not to mention the words that came out of them. How are you holding up? I'm okay, I say slowly, but I mean it. Mabel floats over, glowing from the inside out like a jack-o'-lantern. Marceline is speaking with Iona she says, glancing back toward the registers. I think you're next on her hit list. Hit list? I look to my nieces. Why do I get the feeling there's something else you're not telling me? A pan crashes to the floor, and we look over to see Acorn quickly gobbling down a pie that just splattered over a three-foot radius. We'll talk, Morgan says as she zips that way. Mabel sheds a wry smile. Don't worry, Billy. I have a feeling there's a very good reason the universe sent you in our direction. We all have a purpose in this life. She shrugs. And we've got a purpose in the afterlife, too. She begins to dissipate before my eyes. There's a cute ghost pushing through town, and I told him I'd meet him at Wolfgang's. I've got a date. And believe me, I'm well aware it gives ghosting a whole other meaning. Just like that, she's gone, and I don't waste any time making a beeline for poor Harper. I step past Harold and Charlene and stand staunch by my daughter's side. What's going on? I ask as I look to the two of them. Harper sighs. I guess we're being civil, she rolls her eyes, but it's a hard no to the babysitting gig coming next September. I'll be trying out for cheer, not teen mom. Her body rocks back and forth as she looks to Harold. 
the way she's prone to do when fighting back her emotions. And yes, I'll talk to you at least once a week on the phone. Good, he says as he holds out his arms. How about a hug for your old man? Harper offers him a firm embrace, and her back shudders as she sheds a few silent tears. She misses him. I know she does. He's her dad. She probably should. She wipes down her face. I guess it was nice seeing you. She shrugs to Charlene. Not so much you, but I'm just being honest. Bye. She waves to them both before taking off toward the back, where her friends are currently congregating. Harold hitches his head toward the kitchen. It was kind of nice seeing you do your thing. I'm proud of you, Billy. It was great. Charlene gushes while petting her curls. Oh, I want to do it, too. Do you think I could maybe help out with the dessert in an upcoming episode? I just know I'm destined for fame. I can feel it in my bones. Probably not. To both helping out and her delusions of fame. But that doesn't mean you can't do your own show. I take a moment to glare at Harold. And don't let anyone tell you that you don't have the skills to make it in this world. You might just surprise yourself yet. Harold averts his eyes as if he had never said those words to me. About the house, I'm taking out a loan to buy you out for half the sales price we were asking. I'll pick up any fees. I don't want to see the old place go. We had a lot of memories there. Harper's growth chart is still on the door to her room. That place is like family to me. I shrug over at him. Well, at least you're loyal to something. Let me know when you're ready to deposit the funds into my account. Will do. Harold looks me in the eyes for a moment too long, and I can see a smidge of sadness in them, and more than a dash of regret. Goodbye, Billy. Bye! Charlene gives a chipper wave before attempting to embrace me, and I hold up a hand. I'm good. She touches her hand to her mouth and giggles before stopping abruptly. Oh, I almost forgot. One of my favorite authors had a new release this week, and that's one steamy read I'm not leaving without. I'll be just a second, she says as she makes a mad dash for the romance section. So, Harold, I stretch a tight smile his way. I spoke to Dr. Goldman a week ago. He told you? His eyes bug out as he channels his newfound rage at me. He glances over my shoulder before pulling me in a notch. Listen, Billy, this is humiliating. I'm sure you're getting a good laugh over it, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't say anything to Charlene. His shoulders sag a moment. If she knew my motility was so slow, she might figure out I'm probably not the father and take off. Now that you're gone, she's all I got. Your motility? As in your little swimmers? I glance down at his crotch without meaning to. Hey, you're probably the reason we never had any more kids. I mean, we tried for years, and I thought it was all my fault. I inch back, stunned at this revelation. All those years, I was angry at my body for not pulling its weight, while well, ironically putting on weight and here it was most likely Harold all along. Figures. I've always been quick to blame myself, even when the misgiving was Harold's. So you're essentially sterile. Essentially, he sighs. But I'm expecting a baby in a few months, and I won't lie, I was just getting used to the idea. I'll let you know how the paternity test turns out when it's time. I'll be holding my breath. Charlene reappears, and they take off toward the registers momentarily before sailing out the door. And just like that, my worst nightmare is over. Billy? Elliot's voice strums my way from behind, and I turn to see him with a petite woman, caramel-colored hair that coils just past her shoulders. Her skin is glowing and ruddy. Her eyes shine the color of a pale sky. 
There's a sharpness to her beauty that I find intimidating. High cheekbones and ample lips set in an affable smile. She's dressed in a flowing purple cardigan and a navy jumpsuit underneath. There's something breathtaking about her, ethereal even, as if we were in the presence of a celestial being. It's safe to say Elliot's mother is a stunning woman. This is my mother, Marceline Greenlee. Mom, meet Billy. Charmed. She holds out her hand, her icy eyes never leaving mine. So very nice to meet you, I say. We enjoy all of your products from the dairy right here at the cafe. I take up her hand, and a jolt strums through me. Not the hormonal jolt that Elliot gives off, but a horrible shaking, a lethal charge that threatens to stop my beating heart. The room goes white, my ears clawed up, and a scene emerges in my mind's eye. A barren room, concrete floors with a couple of steer butchered and bleeding, strung up by their hind legs as the floor pools crimson. Another scene appears. A large stone set in a clearing in the woods. A girl writhing over the granite expanse with her arms and legs splayed out. Another scene emerges. A dark room. I'm sensing it's underground. Torches are lit up within it as a group of men and women clad in black stand at a round table. A golden chalice is passed between them. One of the men looks my way, and I recognize those pressing blue eyes. It's Cash. One more scene bounces through my mind. It's me, running through the woods. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Something terrifying is about to happen, and it's happening to me. She lets go, and the room blinks back to life, with bodies swirling all around me. The volume of the people in the room and the 80s music blaring from the speakers are both a touch too loud. What was that? I pant as I look her away. An amused laugh bounces through her chest. I hear you had an accident with that old hourglass I gifted to the bookstore. My apologies. Her lips expand, as if she wasn't the least bit sorry. I promise I will find a way to make it up to you. Buried deep in my mind, I could have sworn I heard her say a different set of words. You will find a way to make it up to me. I swallow hard as I examine this woman before me and nod. I look forward to getting to know you better. I hear myself say the words, but I'm not sure I believe them, nor does she. Elliot's mother knows things, is capable of things, and I have a feeling we'll be spending lots of time together, and not one part of me is convinced I'm going to like it. Please excuse me, Billy. I must say hello to Morgan. She searches my features one last time. Yes, you will do indeed. She gives a quick blink. I can't wait to show you around the dairy farm. She glides off as if her feet weren't even touching the ground. Elliot rocks back on his heels as he presses out a short-lived smile. You did great today, Billy. The pie looked delicious. It was, I snip without meaning to. A part of me wants to dive into the deep end of what just happened when I shook his mother's hand and another part of me wants to take a much-needed breather for a moment. Besides, Elliot isn't exactly someone I want to confide in, not anymore at least. I still feel the stinging rejection of that second kiss that never was. You're angry with me. He says it like a fact, one that happens to be true. No. I shake my head and blow out a breath. I have no reason to be angry with you. Not a good one, anyway. I'm being very immature. Please forgive me. You've been nothing but kind to me, mostly. And shockingly, I mean everything I say. 
Okay, tell me why you have no good reason to be angry with me. My mouth opens and closes. The old me would never in a million years tell a man that I was fuming at the rejection he doled out in lieu of a kiss. But I think I'm past worrying about what people think of me. Besides, the best way for Elliot and me to move beyond the weirdness of it all, and maybe even hammer out a genuine friendship, is to start with the truth. I guess I was having a tantrum because you didn't give me a kiss last night at the door. It's stupid and immature, and I hope you can forgive me for even entertaining a bad mood over the fact. I'm sleep-deprived, and my head has been all over the place ever since I set foot in this town. And, well, a little before that. His chest expands a moment. The muscles in his jaw redefine themselves, and darn it all to heck if he doesn't look ten times more comely. So not fair. That's funny, he says. I'm angry with myself over the exact same thing. You are? A spear of hope rockets through me, and I hate how desperate I've become for him to think of me in a romantic way. It's the exact sort of thing I swore off once I arrived in this haunted town, and here I am wishing on a silly star like a thirteen-year-old girl. He nods. Come here. Elliot navigates us through the endless crowds of coeds, every one of them giving him a lingering look licking their lips as they lust after him openly. He leads us right to the alcove in the entry and pauses to examine me as we stand facing one another. He's going to do it, isn't he? He's going to make up for lost time and plant one on me right here in the bookstore. His brows pinch in the middle. The truth is, I wanted that kiss last night more than you'll ever know. His Adam's apple rides up and down as his eyes bore into mine. But I didn't think it was fair until I told you everything. He gives me a gentle spin until I'm facing the wall. My reflection stares back at me in the mirror before us as the words above it read, Vampire checker, take a peek. Do you see your reflection? Or are you a vampire? What is it? I ask, laughing. Am I waiting for you to whisper it into my ear? I look a notch above my reflection, and he's not there. Elliot? I glance back, and my heart lurches, because he's still very much standing right behind me. I turn back to the mirror, and suddenly realize what Elliot is trying to tell me. Why he had so much intimate knowledge regarding just about every dark secret this town is holding. I spin back around and look him in the eyes. A breath expires from me, and I feel lightheaded. Elliot Greenlee is a vampire. I nod up at him, any hint of a smile gone from me. Sonny was right. The second half of my life is certainly going to be far more interesting than the first. This has been Midlife in Glimmerspell, Hot Flash Homicides, written by Addison Moore, narrated by Karen Krauss, copyright 2021 by Addison Moore, production copyright 2021 by Addison Moore.